Hello everybody and welcome to day number two of the Hearthstone Masters Tour Fall Championship. My name is TJ and helping me kick off the show is Edelweiss. Edelweiss, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right. This was the closest I could find to a costume, sort of like <laughs> vampire style uh, for, for, you know, Halloween weekend. But uh, yeah, in general, I'm, I'm hyped, I'm ready to go. Get to see our, our top eight cut. I'm dressed up like a... Hearthstone caster. A nearing <laughs> middle-aged Hearthstone caster. There you go. That's my getup this week. I don't think I've I've worn a different shirt on a Sunday cast in six years. This is my Sunday <laughs> cast shirt. Six years of time. And and uh, starring TJ as himself, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. The, actually, you know what? I'm dressed up as me from one year ago. There you go. Dressed up as past TJ today. That's my Halloween theme. I, I looked around. And I asked my wife, I was like, I need a something, like a mask, a hat, anything. I got nothing. We got kids' costumes, and they don't fit. And my youngest son, we'll get into the Hearthstone stuff in a second. This is important. Uh, my youngest son is being Sid from Toy Story in, for Halloween, which is literally just he wears a black shirt with a skull on it. That's that's the costume. Like, that's the whole thing. He even looks like him. He's got a big old head that's bulbous and a short haircut. Like, he, it's, that's it. So, no costumes, no nothing. Um, but we do have some Hearthstone today. I don't have a costume, but we, I still do have uh, some, some Hearthstone to cast. So this is day two of the Fall Championship. Um, and uh, taking a look at what happened in yesterday's matches, we ended up getting to a pretty sick top eight. A lot of the streamers in the top eight. But yesterday had uh, some ups and downs in terms of gameplay. But I think it was still an exciting day. We got to see some the strengths and weaknesses of some of the decks in this, uh, in this pretty new metagame. Yeah, and we did have to say goodbye to some uh, favorite players, you know, Tansoku and uh, Gabby, Casey. So, you know, of course, when it's a top cut like this, we, we always kind of know just about everyone. But, um, you know, someone's someone's not going to make it today, too. So. Yeah. And... I, I think uh, the strength of some of the decks that we saw really came through. I feel like Demon Hunter uh, definitely struggled. The few players that brought it, we saw a little bit from Tansoku, some from Casey, and it seemed like Demon Hunter was tough to get wins. Shaman as well has been incredibly hit or miss, um, and in where we see some matchups where a player's up 2-0, and it's like, oh geez, this is going to be close. <laughs> they have Shaman left. So yeah. I'm curious to see how things are going to shape out today, but taking a look at the overall program overview, the goal for all these players really is to compete at the World Championship, which is um, in a little bit less than two months uh, with a big prize pool of $350,000. Uh, each of these seasonal championships, we're currently in the last one, fall, has a, a respectable prize pool of $50,000. And then uh, the rest is just players that are going to be competing, right? We For the uh, seasonal championships, we started with 16, uh, split between the regions. And then the uh, World Championship consists of each of the winners of these seasonal championships, uh, plus some, the highest point earners uh, throughout the year. So still waiting for those spots um, as we uh, get closer to the World Championship. Of course, it is the Conquest format. Uh, each player brings four decks, four unique classes, ban one of their opponents, which this tournament has mostly been Warrior, and they cannot win with the same deck twice. So that means... It a lot of times comes down to the, the fourth deck, which is the big differentiator for most of these players. Uh, that is those demon hunters, hunters, uh, there was one warlock. <laughs> so uh, people are, are really trying to figure out what's the best way to go for that fourth deck. Yeah, and we'll see who's going to come out on top today. There's your top eight bracket. We're going to start things off with Hemlock versus Levick. And we have Pocket Train versus Rekbum. Uh, that's a big highlight. Looking forward to that one. McBannerface versus Weak U, and then Coach versus Balance. Um, and I, I mean, in, in terms of like past performances, this is one of the best top eights we've seen. Right? We have Levick, who's already qualified. Uh, we have Pocket Train, who <laughs> basically already qualified, but not through a seasonal championship. So looking to take the easy, easy row. And then um, I think McBannerface is definitely a highlight as one of the best and top performing players from the Americas region. Uh, America's last hope, which has been a, <laughs> a, a baton that has been passed down from generation to generation. 
Uh, it was Monsanto in the past, and now it's uh, down to McBannerface. Yeah, and you mentioned how you know Pocket is all, all but in, in terms of he hasn't uh, won one of these yet, but is very high in the points. Hemlock uh, is another player who has made it to, I believe, the top eight in each one of these events this year. So has been a very consistent performer uh, here on the Control Warrior, Rainbow Mage, Secret Rogue, and the Arcane Hunter. Yeah, the Arcane Hunter kind of being the odd deck out, um, a deck that actually hasn't been performing that well. I mean, it really, it's a deck that hasn't changed much in quite a long time. Its game plan is pretty simple and straightforward. There's not a lot of wiggle room that you have in terms of what you can do. But that's the deck that uh, Hemlock has opted to go with. Interesting enough, favorite class is Druid, <laughs> but not many players brave enough to uh, bring Druid after... Uh, got hit with the, the nerfs pretty hard after a long streak of dominance uh, in Constructed. So, um, well, uh, Hemlock still having success despite not being able to play that favorite class. Yeah, and he has opted for the Control Warrior, which, you know, we say Control, a lot of people, I think, call it Odin Warrior just because <laughs> that is the primary win condition. You know, of course, you can get there just by enjoying the game, but a lot of times it is all about getting down Odin as quickly as possible, and then your defense becomes your offense with all that armor gain converting to attack against the enemy hero. Uh, really only two options for warriors between this version and the enraged warriors. Yeah, and not much wiggle room in terms of card choices as well. I feel like all the Odin slash control warriors are nearly identical. The Rage Ward does have a couple spots that you can move around with, but this one's pretty set in stone. Um, and definitely one of the po most powerful decks uh, in the metagame. Uh, and it does have a couple weaknesses, notably actually drawing Odin in matchups where you absolutely have to have uh, uh, pressure for a win condition, uh, like in some of the uh, OTK, like in Shaman or Rainbow Mage. Um, but it's got so many tools to help it get there. And surprising amount of tempo, especially with the uh, the rifts. And there's Levick. Yeah. Just jamming some Hearthstone. Yeah, I mean, Levick just sitting pretty, already having won the Spring Championship. Just sort of accidentally made his way into this event. Uh, you know, it's it's crazy. He, he, didn't, he could have taken a break. He didn't have to be jamming ladders so much, but uh, you know, he's here again and maybe prepared to take so home some extra uh, prize money. <laughs> yeah, uh, he just loves Hearthstone. <laughs> like, it, it's quite obvious when he plays um, that he's having a lot of fun. Even when I interviewed him before the World Championship last year, uh, he was talking about how like all of his practice just comes from basically jamming ladder and that he wasn't playing with people and that he just loves playing constructed ladder just ranked matches just jamming it um which is cool to see and at this point in you know hearthstone i, I feel like that's necessary to be successful is to really have that uh that love for the game and taking a look at levick's seeker rogue love to see the break dance in there <laughs> the, the um, break dance and the mixtape this i feel like is a little bit of a off-color <laughs> rogue list. It's, it's missing the MC Blinktron for the yeah. full, uh, the full uh, dance party uh, secret rogue uh, package there, but uh, couldn't fit it in with all the other tech cards that were in there. The Prison of Yogs are on uh, in there as well, uh, sort of as like a pseudo replacement for the old Yogg uh, that was changed. Um, doesn't really fit in rogue. The benefit of having in a rogue before was that it was. By the time you drew it, it was free, <laughs> effectively. And you could bounce it back with Shadow Steps and Break Dances. Uh, but now the prison is kind of the uh, the get out of the get out of jail free card uh, for the deck that you need in some of those matchups. Yeah, it's a lot more of a gamble. The you know, Yogg Strong Unleashed was pr pretty consistent, use it as a board clear, mind control, just very strong utility card. Now with it being nerfed that set nine mana cost and plays two random spells is a lot less guaranteed and, and you can't really cheese it as much in these spell heavy decks so the location uh, is just kind of a way of giving you uh, a little bit of a gamble you know if if you desperately need a clear or you desperately need a lethal you can just press that button and you know 
y you pay the cost on the first one, and the next two are free. <laughs> yeah, that's that's right. And sometimes you can even use it for like card draw, <laughs> or in desperate situations, just target y yourself. And sometimes you get a heal, um, like if you're dead on the board. Not recommended if you're just like <laughs> I could use a heal, um, but maybe recommended if you're like if I don't heal, I die. Uh, so <laughs> very flexible card. In that regard, I recommend putting it in all your decks <laughs> uh, because of just how flexible it is. Uh, but it looks like we're kicking things off. Warrior versus Rogue. And this is a bit of a unusual matchup we get to see in the sense that Warrior was not banned. It's been banned, <sighs> I, I think, something like 60% of games. Let's see here. Uh, warrior, sorry, ban rate seventy one percent. Yep, it's been pretty brutal. And in the matchups that it hasn't been banned, we have been seeing it win, but not like handedly, right? It's it's been struggling at some points. So notably, like the Wreckman matchup yesterday against the Rainbow Mage, where the Rainbow Mage just couldn't draw Sith. And he was able to get out of range of an absurd amount of damage, but like that's a lost game most of the time <laughs> when you look at it. And that was like a game, a serious side of game. Uh, so we'll see if it's gonna, how it's going to be able to do here uh, against the Secret Rogue, which does have tempo, has a, a, a good amount of value. You just have to piece together a way to win the game before Odin comes online, and you really don't have a way to protect yourself uh, from from that much damage. You don't have that many turns to work with after Odin, if you let it come down safely. Yeah, and there is also the factor that, you know, the stats we have are just for warrior as as a class. So some of these are enraged warriors, uh, which of course has very different matchups from the Odin warrior. Blade Storm coming down, clean up mostly the 3-2. Uh, you know, the 1-2 the is collateral. There's always a tricky sort of game you have to play against Secret Rogue in terms of how much do you value keeping them from, say, getting two cards off a secret like Double Cross versus having a secret available for them to be able to activate a card like Ghastly Gravedigger, uh, which, of course, can be you know, very annoying if you have a key card in hand that you, you really don't want to lose. And having that shuffled away into your deck one of the few effects that can do that could be uh, pretty devastating at times. Yeah. Okay, wow. Actually, he's going to play uh, the Shadow of Demise with Sticky Situation just to keep up the pressure on the board and also to try and have a secret uh, next turn for Ghastly Gravedigger. Well, actually, next turn might just be Mixtape plus Private Eye, and this was just the best way to spend the mana. Um but does have options going the next turn. Hemlock was just all removal, <laughs> effectively. There's the bridge riff as well uh, to try and get there, but it's just a matter of trying to find the best way to sequence these turns to uh, get the most ma uh, value out of these cards. Because um, one thing that we're missing here is going to be uh, card draw. Yeah. And, you know, despite all that removal... This secret of the spider is, you know, one of the, the better ones to, to keep playing here just because the removal has to be spent before it spawns since it procs on spell trigger. And so that makes Hemlock have to decide if he wants to spend another spell to remove the stealth spider. Uh, most of the time it's not going to be worth it, so Levitt can kind of guarantee that three damage coming in. Drift, of course, the most powerful play, I think, available in the uh, Warrior deck on turn 5. Uh, particularly replaying that first riff, going to be able to very cleanly deal with these 3-4s, one from the rush and the other from the attack buff to this weapon. Yeah, 
thinking it through, but I, I, even bellowing flame is not a clean, uh, clear, and would have the sticky situation left over as well afterwards, but I don't really see anything. I guess you could attack and then blade storm, but then you're kind of in the same exact situation. Um, and your floating mana just doesn't feel so particularly So Hemlock great. also doesn't know whether it's necessarily the second situation or the second copy of Double Cross. So I think this is a bit of a, a decision in terms of does he want to finale the bridge riff and, and you know make the highest tempo play or potentially leave some mana up to not trigger double cross because the rogue is a, a bit low on cards and can actually run out if they aren't able to activate those double crosses. So taking away that bellowing flames, which is definitely the strongest removal tool in the hand there. Yep, and also we're still continuing to see this problem of no card draw for Hemlock. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, it's not... Did you see what? the card that just got burgled there? No. I was, what was it? Front lines. So, uh, for those not familiar with this card, which I would not uh, hold that against anyone, this is a Paladin card, normally costs 9 mana that pulls minions out of both players' decks until one person's side of the board is full. Now, against something like this warrior, which has very few minions for the purpose of targeting draw on Odin, uh, there's a very real possibility that this front lines would be able to just pull out that Odin and put Levick in a position where he could potentially just run the warrior out of win conditions. Yeah, you do have like a couple of random ones in there, uh, like Ignis and the uh, armorers. Finley's in the hand, but <clears throat> when I looked at that card for, for a second, I was like, wait, what? I thought it was a, a blood in the water. Oh, no. <laughs> but it's, yeah, you're right. It was burgled and it's discounted, so. On a, again, going back to that limited number of minions, but this objection comes into play uh, very nicely here. You know, the only minion in hand being Finley, Hemlock might be wanting to, you know, sort of ditch this hand to, to look for that Odin, but uh, next minion's going to get countered, and there's really no good minion that you want to let that happen to. Nope, they all are very high value. This Hemlock's just struggling to do much of anything. Ah, this is a little bit of an awkward situation. You don't really want to play the front lines because you, you could just die. <laughs> no, no real way to deal with it. Krabatoa, you'd override your uh, your other weapon here. Uh, Putricide. I think he's maybe uh, planning on going putricide, make the attack, and then serrated bone spike. Yeah. It's a shame that the Krabatoa isn't in the deck. Oh no, just gonna run this out for the whole concoction. You know, if Krabatoa yeah, were in the deck, then Levick would have the chance of front lines pulling it out, which then means, you know, fewer minions pulled from his own deck because it takes up those extra board slots, so that's like better going into fatigue, and would just be able to clear up some of the potentially threatening minions coming out of Hemlock's side. Although, I think there's really just two minions that you're concerned with. There's the Odin, of course, which is an 8-8, and then there is the Warrior Titan, which is not in all of these Odin lists, but it is in Hemlock's, and I suspect that's one of the reasons maybe that Levick has 
not been super interested in pulling the trigger on this front lines without having a, a little bit better board position first. Yeah, and I also th think maybe with the objection in play, he doesn't feel as pressured to do it. Mm -hmm. um, just because he knows that like Odin couldn't come down anyway uh, if it was there. So I think he's just kind of taking it in stride. With how this game state is, though, this the concoction that Levick did get from the future side is <laughs> probably the worst available. <laughs> um, just because provides no value whatsoever. And Hemlock, even with <laughs> this hand that just, you know, can't play Finley, can't play Minion, even if you draw off the top, no card draw, no, like no value generation whatsoever, is still applying some pressure. And that's a big draw off the top, because it'll at least pull... Uh, the secrets out of the deck, or the 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 secret, uh, <laughs> just the perjury because everything else everything else has been played. Yeah, and both. it's just gonna play the tempo game right back. Both deck thinning in terms of getting the the perjury out, and I believe uh, under the objection there, there is also a um... wait. Have both double crosses already happened? Maybe not. Uh, well, it's just two secrets, and we know that okay. there's an objection. So gotcha, gotcha. It, it would show yep. on the, the right side as well. So it is objection and perjury. Yeah. And the options are... That was a snap barrier, I think, because Levick knows his only option left here is to just play front lines. So if he can have that little extra barrier... No! Really? I'm I'm somewhat surprised at this. I mean it's it's not great for either of them, but I do feel like it is better for Levick, particularly with the breakdance pickup. Just because I mean the warrior has I think more crucial things that they want to actually have the opportunity to play uh, versus, you know, getting pulled out of their deck. There's a lot of battle cries going on. Levick's gonna die anyway. <laughs> and the Titan picked up, able to just throw down the uh, the Finley into the objection. And protect this Titan. On... And al also gets to proc the Stone Skin Armor to draw a couple more cards with the uh, Titan activation. Oh, there it is! Well, <laughs> didn't want to take the gamble on the front line, so gonna take it on the, the prison. Uh, let's see what we get. Burst Riff, okay. Mm. Oh, okay. oh! Actually, it cleared it! it. Clear, sure. I've, and I've, drew a card! I've seen better, but it still, definitely could have been worse. Got some healing as well, so... Yeah, that's... I'd say that's above average. Still oh, needs but there comes the Odin. Oh, no! Would have missed the opportunity to, to pull it out of the deck. And with the heavy plate in hand, and I don't believe any real way to clear these four fours. Can um, clear the Odin. Yeah. Shadow step break dance. And also can play the uh, one of the five mana Asalors to gain some armor. So uh, I mean this is uh you're technically alive, but are you really? You know, I guess it buys you time to then praise Yogg once again. Yeah, there's a heavy plate in hand, so we're already at 16 points of damage. A shield block off the top would just end the game, or any armor gain, really. Yeah, there it is, bash. Yep, that's effectively six damage. Plus the hero power, so good enough. Uh, a very weird game where both players had pretty much nothing for a long time. <laughs> like two, uh, three, two cards in hand. Uh, no card draw being found. Uh, not really any generation being found from Lubbock as well. And uh, the Odin picked up just in time. If the Odin hadn't been picked up, it, it would have taken Hemlock at least a little bit of time to close out that game. That could have allowed Lubbock to use those Astralors to maybe claw his way back. But yeah, came absolutely. out just in time and Hemlock... One zero up. 
yeah, the rogue, you know, it's this weird sort of attrition, the ghastly gravediggers, because while you are taking away a card from your opponent, you're spending your own cards to do so. So each time you play gravedigger, shadow step, you're effectively hoping that what you're stealing from them is more worth it than the cards that you're spending to take away. And in the games where you don't get the the draw cards concoctions, <laughs> that means you're you're in this strange sort of top deck mode where you're just hoping yours are better than the opponents. Yeah, the future side double damage potion <laughs> that was used to kill a three four that was not the best outcome. Pretty much anything else would have been decent in that situation. Even like double green wouldn't have been terrible. Um, but was obviously looking for uh, hazy uh, or some card draw but unfortunately didn't get it but the warriors out of the way i mean i would say the most powerful deck in hemlock's lineup uh, that's why the control warrior itself has been drawn banned so much so uh we'll see if levick can capitalize on some of the other decks that hemlock has Yeah, sort of uh, par for the course. You know, I think we've been expecting warriors to get through, we've been expecting mages to get through. Uh, so it, it often ends up coming down to these last picks in terms of the shaman for Levick and the arcane hunter for Hemlock. And that is honestly, I think, a, a matchup that has been, you know, d debated since both decks were, were formed, you know, pre pre nerfs. Uh, in terms of you know who has the edge in the hunter versus shaman matchup. Yeah, I after seeing some of the hunter games uh, throughout the day yesterday, I kind of lost faith <laughs> in the arcane hunter. It just wasn't winning. It just was not winning games. And to be fair, there's a lot of tough matchups for it. Um, that's kind of the decision you have to make when you're. It's a relatively fresh meta game because of the uh, balance patch that was on Thursday. And you don't know what the best fourth deck is. Arcane Hunter is kind of this consistent beast um, that will always do the same thing and capitalize on poor draws, bad starts. It's always going to be able to deal damage. So, Ooh, this is an interesting start from Hemlock uh, with the coin and Shadow of Demise. You can get a private eye out incredibly quickly. Yeah, I mean, I think you're not even terribly worried about comboing the second one when you've already got the first one comboed on the coin. Sort of the ideal hand for the secret rogue, just to make sure you can uh, thin the deck of those secrets early on. In terms of Levick's hand, though, uh, no keyboard, which I feel like is the first, maybe the second time I've seen this weekend mage not have keyboard onto into uh, a cold case, but a uh, Fiendish Circle is not a bad just turn three play to get a foul spell and uh, a few little minions on board. Yeah, start making a little bit oh. of a push, at least to fight back uh, oh in the early God. game. But yep, there it is. Double coin into Private Eye with the Shadow of Demise, getting those secrets out. Yep. And that's going to be a pretty fast start for Hemlock. Uh, it is the perjury. Oh, no, it is Ooh. a sticky situation. Sorry, so that's the best like board scenario yeah, and oh that hand pretty optimal secrets to pull there uh with with what levick had to do you know the earlier that double cross comes down the much harder it is for the opponent to to play around because there's just less mana to spare to try and deny uh, the rogue those cards and then of course just getting a free three four <laughs> to to start ramping up the pressure is uh, always welcome Okay, just gonna get the second one out. I mean, this is pretty much like all the secrets either pulled or drawn, so this is yep. very good. Very good for Hemlock. Mm, frozen Touch. Gonna be immediately able to infuse. And, uh, yeah, once again, it's, it's a double cross for Hemlock. So this Frozen Touch is going to draw him a couple more cards. And Perjury oh, activates. Perjury is, is such a great tool for Secret Rogue just because it, it 
lets you kind of guaranteed have a secret going into your turn so you can activate things like Ghastly Gravedigger. Yeah. And get get access to powerful mage secrets. <laughs> well, there is also that, yeah. Counterspell and Objection being sort of the two highest power ones most of the time. Yep. Oh. This is where that attrition is brutal, right? Taking away uh, you know, potentially Levick's card draw here, or first we took the power of creation in terms of a, a clear, and uh, you know, really just leaving Levick much more starved for cards, whereas Hemlock has you know, all these potion belts and another perjury, putricide, just kind of sitting on a, a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. Almost too much value. <laughs> Goes for the Wisdom of Norganon. Oh, cold Case, pretty strong pickup, though. <laughs> Levix has no more of that. Looks like just playing into turn 7 Elemental Inspiration, just trying to get all the spell schools out there. Yep. Um, Reverberation can be sometimes a hard card to use, so three mana left, might as well throw it out there and make this easier to... Uh... Uh, to take care of, but he's going to make it to turn 7 with uh, enough health to really do anything uh, is the question. Yeah, there is the potential to hit lifesteal on those elementals, but I think currently the spells played have been Frost, Shadow, and Fell. And I'm not sure if there's been a chance to play Arcane yet. Because the Wisdom of Norganon would have been the Arcane. Yeah. So only four elementals uh, will be summoned at present. Oof. So Hemlock just kind of able to relax in knowing that these have been some pretty weak turns from, from Levick's side. You know, he might expect something like Elemental Inspiration to come down next turn, and, and so might be uh, willing to prepare for that. But can also just choose to, you know, make a big board here. Go for, for double summon three drops or something. Uh, just has a, a lot of flexibility and those elementals do come out can make some trades with with putricide in play for a whole bunch of more value yeah i think he saw the elemental inspiration uh with the grave digger too right wasn't that one of the options so should know that that's uh, yep. on the horizon um so i'm just trying to set up for it here and i just like pushing max damage yep Trying to get there. Hopefully, there's no rushes from the elemental inspiration to clear off more of this board and put Levick all the way down to six. Yeah, six, which of is course. In range of double potion. Exactly. Just taking advantage of the Blinktron debuff weapon while it's there. And uh, Levick, I think, knows that elemental inspiration, not the gamble that he wants to take. A little bit surprised to see this come down without having played the Arcane Artificer first. Maybe was hoping for an additional like five mana option that could have bailed him out, so it'd be played right away, and he could get double value potentially. Yeah, the only one I can think of is Wisdom of Norganon, which would show up as five in the Discover, and so getting to draw that two cards immediately. Uh, oh, and the objection too. Yeah, uh, there is also the objection. But, so I now mean, we just need single damage potion, so high likelihood to uh, just oh, hit yeah. it here. Oh yeah, there it is. There <laughs> it is. Yep. All right, nice quick little 2-0 lead uh, for Hemlock. It's two different decks from Levick, both tried the mage and the rogue, so now it's going to have to 
make a comeback in this series, but it's not looking good. Hemlock's firing all cylinders right now, it feels. Yeah, it is always possible to, you know, sweep these fourth decks that people have. I don't know if Hunter is quite the one that I would want to have to sweep, particularly when I still have a rogue left on my side. Uh, yeah. <laughs> rogues not known for their healing capabilities. Not particularly, but they do have a bunch of random generation, so, you know, maybe that could uh, find some healing. But it's about finding the time to do that, because sometimes it can be uh, pretty expensive. But if you get, like, those private eye starts, you can, you know, get some perjuries and get some disruption or really kind of stifle the pressure. But there's only one deck, so I also win with uh, uh, both the other decks, too, um, against the Hunter. So... I mentioned earlier, Hunter, it's got a, it, while it doesn't do anything crazy, it does just deal damage very consistently. Its game plan is not a, a secret. <laughs> it doesn't have any ways to deviate from that game plan, usually. Uh, but it does have some that consistency of being able to kill the opponent. So, we'll see. Love it. Tough road ahead. Yeah, every, every once in a while, you know, you use the immune weapon from uh, from the titan to buy time so that you can deal more damage right it's always a matter yeah. of if you're in a race the only reason to not go face is if more time will get you more damage all right it's gonna be uh shaman first or levick these are the two uh i guess we could say weak links of the lineups. Yeah, but of course, you know, both, I think, pretty solidly tier two decks by comparison to some of the others we see. And yeah. uh, Holder on Brightwing, definitely something that Hemlock wants to see in that opening hand, as well as the Costume Singer, which uh, prior to it being nerfed was one of the highest win rate cards in the deck and probably is still pretty up there, even as a 1 1. Great to be able to have the board. Yeah. In the early game. And it's not going to stop either. Yeah, I mean, at this point, you just run out the feral spirits, I would expect. Yeah. I, with hidden meaning, I don't know if you're really too worried about it since you have the taunt to block. Yep. And it's just spending the mana, and it will proc, but you're not too worried about it. And that's not a great one. Doesn't even ma line up well against the Feral Spirits with the two attacks, so I think Levick should be feeling fantastic about the start. It's not stopping. Got schooling to be able to continue fighting, and then the Titan to be able to come down, and if you have the board, you can feel comfortable just going with card draw on the first activation, which is going to be great uh, now, for Levick in the coming turns. Now, there is, of course, the possibility of, you know, star power just going ahead and, and doing a reset for Hemlock um, and going to be able to swing things around. I expect if that happens, it's going to be a coin. And so it's it's a matter for me of like, do you coin Brightwing this turn or do you coin Star Power next turn? And with being this far behind, I feel like you have to coin the Star Power. Probably hoping for uh, Ricochet there. Yep. Um, but at least it's not Worms, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Turn the tides, I not like bad, that. yeah. And overloading on this turn, I think, is much better than overlay on next turn. So next turn you can probably just play schooling and then roll that right into tight without having to overload. Exactly. And I like the damage push as well. I don't think Hemlock really has much to do in this game. Uh, Star Power is going to be able to clear things up, but already at 16, it's going to make things pretty easy for Levick. And Hemlock really hasn't progressed anything. Um, hasn't been able to get Brightwing down. No spell power buffs in hand. Uh, but we'll see. 
still still some time left before Levick is able to piece together uh, lethal damage. Yeah, and even though you know the board is now clear and a bunch of these tools were used in terms of the, the zapper and spirits and everything, you're totally happy with this outcome as the shaman. You've you've gotten your opponent down through half their life. It just makes your you know, combo turn that much easier to make happen. Uh, only having taken you know, two damage so far himself, now four, and uh, totally free to just play your titan and draw three cards here. I think when you when you see the shaman play Golgoneth for cards, you you know you're in a, a little bit of trouble. <laughs> yeah. You often want to be pressuring them so that they have to use it for heal, and then maybe you can kind of starve them of cards. Second star power gonna reset, and the race is on. <laughs> Oof. Bioluminescence might not even be the pick here, yeah, just because it's too expensive and there's no weapon to reduce it. Yeah, I mean, we're very, very close uh, to lethal. In fact, with this three damage, I think it might actually be 13 damage next turn. Um... Because it's eight from the lightning bolts uh, with the Nava Zapper. And then the overdraft would be one, two, three, four, plus the one spell damage. So that's five. So that's 13 with just those four cards. Yep. Not even really, you know, your traditional combo turn that you look for. And with Astalor being its, its current iteration, still a turn away from being able to gain any armor for Hemlock. You know, one of the ways you often hope to kind of edge things out as a hunter in this matchup is maybe you, you know, have a forged titan traps where you, say, get that uh, deal six when they play three spells or, or three cards. And uh, maybe you can, you know, pressure the shaman into being low enough health that they aren't actually able to combo you because they'll end up dying on the combo turn. But that is just not how things have played out this time around for Hemlock. That's just a bunch of extra damage. <laughs> yep. Left a 2-1 on the board. Jazz base picked up. And I'm just going to put a point on the board. 2-1 now. Two more to go against the Hunter. Let's see if he can uh, make it happen. Definitely happy to have the Shaman out of the way there. Yep, yep, not, not a care in the world. Remember, he's got the least pressure on him in this event. Yeah. I feel like Levick's been in just every tournament in like the past two years. <laughs> it's just really uh, milk and competitive Hearthstone for all it's worth in 2022-2023. Love to see it. Love to see it. He was relatively unknown before that, uh, which is even one of the cooler parts. Uh, obviously, people knew him, especially from Ladder. But beginning of last year was, uh, I guess the end of 2021 as well, was when Levick uh, started to just rack up result after result. But still in a tough spot here. <clears throat> still down 2-1. Not over the hump yet. Once you get to, if you win another one, get to game five, and it's just one match, just a best of one, then you can forget about what happened for the rest of the series. And yeah. Just focus on that one. But for now, still an uphill climb. Ironically, though, I think having that, you know, lack of pressure in the sense that uh, he's already qualified for Worlds, you know, puts you in a better mental state for when you are down. Uh, you know, 2-0 like he yeah, was just earlier. And, uh, so, you know, maybe gives you all the more possibility of, you know, overcoming a deficit like this.
once again Halderon in Hemlock's opening hand. Maybe it'll pay off a little more this time, although it's tricky. While Halderon is, I think, always a keep just because it buffs your entire everything that you want to do, right? Your hand and deck, all your arcane spells. It's still, it's a little slow now at that four mana cost. And so, particularly on the play where you have fewer cards you're working with, you're going to end up with hands like these where you... Okay, well, the anomaly fixed it. But I was going to say, you're going to end up with hands like these where you don't have uh, as much of your early game cards. Yeah, this is... Uh, what, the fifth, sixth anomaly we've seen? Maybe seventh, but I don't even know if we want to include the... the Yogg. <laughs> Because the Yogs were never played. Uh huh. So. That anomaly didn't count. Because nobody got to make any use of it. It's just <laughs> dead cards sitting in both players' hands. Oh, just wow. creature side. With Bone Spike in hand. Yeah. Knowing that uh, the worms are there. Well, and it's awkward, too. You know, turn one, one, four. That does not line up well into any kind of damage-based removal that Hunter can present this early on. Uh, obviously, you don't get a potion if it trades into one of the four ones because they die at the same time. But even just presenting the threat of like, okay, next turn I can hero power, get a potion while killing one of the four ones, and then take out the other one. You know, that's definitely damage that the rogue doesn't want to have to deal with. And Hemlock yeah. not even going to bother... <laughs> Running them out. It becomes a little bit difficult, though, because if you're not forcing Levick to do anything, he's able to just do whatever he wants. And tempo is a real thing. <laughs> Like, these worms are, what, are they just going to be useless for the rest of the game? It's a little bit awkward. Well, rogues don't run Fan of Knives in Standard these days, so even though you know, you'd like to get them down early, it, it's no small thing if you just play all three of the four ones in the same turn uh, after you know swinging the board around. Yeah, well, the hard part is swinging the board around if you if the rogue's just consistently playing minions, right? Uh, and you're not answering them, uh, but that does make sense, and we'll see if that's actually going to be able to happen. <laughs> Brightwing can come down next turn; it's going to be a pretty big deal. Yeah. And let... Oh, the double greed! Oof. Ooh. The question here is whether or not to break dance the putricide. I think. What about the Murloc Holmes? <laughs> no. No, I don't it's think it's ever that. It's like a game inside of a game. Yeah. Well, the the dance is over. Putricide is dead. But he certainly did his job in terms of preventing those four ones from coming down in the early game there. Now the possibility of an another double green. Also, just throw out the uh, Ghoulish Alchemist too, just for another 3 2 on the board. You got a rush? Nice. Great. Oh, rush and a 5 5. Oh, that is nice. fantastic results. Yep. And yeah, if, if the trades aren't good, we don't take them. A uh, little bit risky going into the Star Power turn, but. You do know that three of the cards are four ones. <laughs> yep. Ah, okay. Yep. This makes sense to me. That uh, Knight of the Dead, should it come down, Mana Thirsted is healing, uh, in addition to being 
very high stats for the cost. So I think Levick is happy to be able to take advantage of the breakdance rush to trade in there, uh, sort of hedge against a star power, and then also have this tool in his back pocket for later on in the game of you know, healing for, I believe it's five. Yeah. Double ricochets and end up being pretty good here. Double ricochet and just throw out all three worms. Leave a 3 2, which is awkward, but hey. Can't win them all. I'm not seeing the second ricochet unless it's guaranteed off the trinket tracker. Uh, he played it. Oh, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. He played the first one and then thought right, for right, a very right. long time about the second yep, one. Yep, which, yep. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but coming down at this later stage does make for uh, easy pickings on these you know, smaller damage effects from Levick. I'm going to get that purge read down. Uh, looks like a pretty good Agrimar turn, though. Yeah, easy slam, especially before a potential... Uh... Mage secret. Yeah. Seems good. Do you have to think about what you want from it, however? Because um, I can see uh, merit to all three choices. Yeah, I mean, it's it's always like which which do you want three instances of? Do you want you know three taunts? Do you want three cards? Do you want six more damage? And yeah think basically if you are going face with the weapon then you maybe take the immune uh, if you're gonna clear i would probably lean towards the three three yeah i think clearing here oh no okay clearing here and then like protecting titan for next turn could be good we are coming into the kravatoa turn so this is going to get cleared off pretty easily, but that's just netting some some damage here. Um, Hemlock could just swing into the Kravatoa, which uh, is quite good. Yeah, the, this weapon does sacrifice damage, but you kind of need to remove it at this point. But the rare instance of, you know, okay, we, we have to send five damage, not face, so that we can protect ourselves. Although, could be a double conjured arrow instead on the Kravatoa. Hmm. After checking for uh, secret, of course. That's a lot of card potential. With Halderon, you know, each of those is drawing three. Yeah. A check just with an arcane shot here. <laughs> but nope, it's going to rip the contra arrow. It's and at that point, I mean, maybe figuring, hey, I don't need multiples of these. I would rather get the hidden meaning down. Because in, in a sense, hidden meaning goes face. More secrets will also make that star-strung bow cheaper, uh, should they be activated. And snap mixtape coming out with the Titan Forge traps. Now, the way this works is you do end up discovering rogue secrets because uh, any class that you know gets something from another class that says discover secrets, you'll always discover from your own pool unless it specifies. Yeah. You could cheat death and play the Night of the Dead. Because <laughs> <laughs> it is yeah, mana that's true. now. Yeah, yeah. And it cost one mana. Um, it, after it was cheat death back. That's a, I mean, that's a yeah, that seems respectable pretty good. amount of health. That, uh, the concoctor, okay, I guess the hidden meaning was not played last turn. And second concoctor being cheat death is actually not terrible either, so. Right, right. It also then, you know, kind of 
makes it a little less obvious, right? Yeah. And the and... order is such that if they die from the same effect, like a star power, uh, it will be the, the knight that returns. Yeah, there's not a clean way for Hemlock to really just remove this one, too. You don't want to sink four damage into it. So the Knight of the Dead's the minion that would very likely die. I think this Arcane Shot is the last um, one-cost spell in the deck. Like both Ricochets, both Arcane Shots in hand, and both Tremors. Mm -hmm. It is a lot of damage uh, with the global spell damage effect. We have Celestial Arrow. Or Arcane Shot then would be 6, 10. The second Arcane Shot would be 13, 18, 20. 20 yeah, damage. I mean, it, it's it's really adding up for sure. And I, I think you're kind of happy with just maybe, you know, clear these with the star power, develop a little bit more, uh, keep pushing face. Because uh, nice as that healing is, it uh, doesn't address the fact that there's a couple of four ones in play. And I think a lot of us were surprised just to see how these four ones end up playing out in terms of their ability to just accrue damage over the course of a game. Astalor might have to come down early, the Astalor 8, just to, to ping these off the board. Yeah. Um, I'd even be tempted to play double cross here, because if you're daggering, you're not really doing much. You could Shadow Step the Knight of the Dead, just for an extra 5, knowing that Astalor's there to clean the board up. Yeah, it's a tough call for me between the extra five healing and the double cross. Double cross, you don't know if you're going to get it. Uh, this I can see as well, because you know you're taking that four damage either way, so you may as well clear the minion. He's dead. And it makes it harder for both of these to get cleared, at least by any minion damage. Yeah. <clears throat> So there is lethal, I believe. Um, but Hemlock does not know what the secret is. And it's an explosive rune, so we can see that it doesn't matter to what Hemlock's trying to do. He knows that it's not ice barrier. Right. So he needs to decide or think if he has lethal through a potential counter spell. Uh, which I still think he does. Um, yeah, I mean... Just throw the arcane shot out there first, the first one, because that's just the three damage. Even if it's counter spell, celestial arrow, celestial arrow... That's 8 plus 2 plus 2, so 12. Uh, if you place a hidden meaning, he doesn't have it. I think I just throw an arcane shot to test. What? Gotta move fast. Okay. Oh, with the hero power. There. Yep. Yeah, he still got there. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I realized that maybe he would not have had lethal if he arcane shot at it and it was counter spell. Mm -hmm. It might have been one mana off. Um. Right. Because so he test used up all those cards, it wouldn't have had enough mana for the bow if he had done it, but. Uh, regardless, takes the victory. Yep, testing with a secret, you know, uh, a spell that you don't care about losing, and then, uh, yeah, just enough mana with having access to both of the arcane shots and still the, the hero power to fill in for the extra two that would come off of the Celestial. So, well played, Hemlock. Uh, you know, remember, this is the uh, second player besides Pocket Train, I believe, who has been in all of the top eights this year, and it really shows. Yeah, now can add uh, another top four to that resume. So, well done. And 
Um, you know, the, like we had talked about, the one thing about the Arcane Hunter is just, you can you can beat it, you can beat it twice in a row, but beating it three times in a row is just very difficult. Eventually they're going to find a way to piece things together. And I like the way Levick played that. He played super aggressive, went for like the double green potion, or got the double green potion, and just tried to play super for tempo, and it did put a lot of pressure. But the double ricochet shot into the star power is able to keep things clean and buy time with the titan, which he foreshadowed. Uh, <laughs> I need to sacrifice damage to buy time so that I can deal more damage. And that's exactly <laughs> what happened, because more damage did come. Yeah, I mean, the deck just has so much available, particularly when you do have Halderon that early, so everything has that that one bit of extra damage. We didn't even see any of the uh, two drops that buff, you know, extra spell damage to all the cards in your hand. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's so much available that oftentimes using that immune weapon is just a, a flexible tool of either you get it as an Arcanite axe going face or can just use it to buy more time. Yeah, that's right. But Hemlock's going to be moving on uh, to the semifinals. Going to face off against the winner of Pocket Train versus Rectum, uh, which I believe is our next one. So that should be a fantastic match. But we're just getting started for the That's just match one, which means we have six more to go before we crown a winner uh, and crown our fall champion. But before we get into our next quarterfinal, we are going to have to go to a quick break. But don't go anywhere. More action to come here from the Hearthstone Master Tour Fall Championship. Don't go anywhere.
Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Hearthstone Master Tour Fall Championship. My name is TJ, and I'm joined by the one, the only. It's Neil Lorinda Bond, a.k.a. You can just call me Lorinda, please. How you doing, bud? I am doing great, especially with what we've got coming up next, TJ. And I don't know how it's going for you, but this is going flying by this tournament. It's like everyone's brought all these aggro decks, even the control decks just kill you now. It's been a weird tournament for me. I, I'm so used to grindy, slow tournaments, but we're, we're whizzing through. Whizzing on through. Yeah. Um, I was expecting a little bit more in terms of like slower control decks. Mm. You know, I thought there'd be a little bit more control priest. I thought control warrior would come out and not be banned as often, but we're not. We're just not seeing it. Uh, we're seeing combo and pseudo aggro and rogue, which does not have an archetype outside of just being called rogue. But uh, this is the second match of the day. Let's go ahead and take a look at the bracket. Uh, see how things have shaped up if you're just now tuning in. We just got to watch Hemlock take a 3-1 victory over Levick to make it to the semifinals. Now, we got Pocket Train versus Wreckham coming up. Oh, and uh, this is a big one. This is a real big one. Tell us why it's a big one. It's a big yeah. one because it's big, TJ. Really big. Um, both these players have sort of helped, along with Banterface and Meaty, sort of put this program on their back this year and chose to stream large chunks of their action throughout the year. So we've seen how the points have been gathered that have got them here firsthand. And and that takes some doing, right? You, you're streaming the game, you're trying to finish rank one legend and regularly doing so, especially if you're pocket trained. Um, and still also you know, talking to viewers and generally showing everything. It's, it's just incredible to me how they've gone with it. And these have been two of the biggest proponents of that. So fair play to them. Um, in terms of qualification for Worlds, it's slightly less big than some of the other matches because pocket train Barring disaster, will make it through on points, and Rekvan probably will as well. So they're both in a good spot. But there's a lot of money at stake as well. There's 10,000 first prize in this tournament. We, we don't talk about that that often, but it's still a huge chunk of change. And, you know, Pocket's taking it seriously. So he's brought Rainbow Mage. TJ, Rainbow Mage. Rainbow Mage. Looking at sort of the quote-unquote tech inclusions. Not much of it. Um... Well, yeah. uh, you're playing uh, all the expensive stuff and no solid alibi. Uh, some we see some players playing the solid yeah. alibi, but they got to cut an elemental inspiration. They got to cut the Norganon, uh, something along those lines. Um, but this is the uh, version I prefer. If you really need a solid alibi? Just discover one, right? You know. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's how I. That's my outlook on life. Just do what I want, and if I really need something, just find it. If you really need an alibi, just ask all your friends until you get one. Yeah. Exactly. You get it. Um, okay, but so... his opponent is going to be Rekvam. They're There's both Rekvam. looking really up for this, aren't they, so early in the morning. And by early in the morning, I don't know what time it is here, like 5 p.m. or something. <laughs> I was about to say, it's not even... Not not even close to morning. Even Game for me. Morning. In the old US of A, at, it's not the morning. You get up at like 3 a.m. or something to get fed by the dogs or something. No, I slept in today. I didn't wake up until like 6.20. 6.20? I don't even have a 6 or a 20 on my clock. I just get up and it's a time. Yeah, it's weird. It's still dark out here at 6.20. At least until next week when the, the clocks go back. Wait, does that make it worse? No, that makes you it You get better. an hour extra gets... in bed, is what they say. But actually, you get the same amount of time in bed, and the arbitrary number on your clock is different. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, like, Here's the... we have alarms, but kids and dogs do not. So they're going to be up when they their bodies think that it's six, which will be, now be five. Yeah. So. Um, Good for them. Ch changes nothing. Hey, this look, it's a mech rogue. Got through. Yeah, he got through on this yesterday. Um, looked like he wasn't going to win and got the Wind Fury to get through on the, the final card of the final game of the day of the final tournament of the year. Final Masters Tour tournament of the year. And looks like he's going to have to do it again. Obviously, Pocket Train has the same deck. The only difference in their lineup is that Rekram has that Shadow Priest, whereas Pocket has the Shaman. Um, both of which are... I, I saw Sotl and Raven talking about Shaman as if it was 
like winning everything really easily. But I don't think we've had that experience all we've cast, have we? We've, we've seen Shaman struggle somewhat. Uh, not well in the last series. Uh, Levick just kind of tempo to win with Shaman, uh, which can happen. Uh, it's not as common, uh, but it can happen. So yeah. there was that. Um, in terms of like like straight up combo, no, we haven't seen it. It's been a struggle bus, a little bit. Yeah, you say it's not as common to see it win on tempo. I think I've seen one bioluminescence cast like all tournament for lethal. Well, yeah, it's it, like out of uh, ten games, like two you win with combo, two you win with tempo, and then six you lose. <laughs> <laughs> like that's been our experience with the uh, the mage throughout throughout the weekend. I feel that's a pretty good description of uh, Shaman's history in the Master of Ball Championship. Uh, but we got Mage versus Rogue coming up right now, so. Uh, let's sh sh uh, let's uh, shift gears, Neil. <laughs> that was close, TJ. You, that was close. Um, the mage is interesting because I think it's the most powerful deck there is. But in the tournament, if you do all the matchups, mage in theory is the weakest because everyone's brought their decks knowing they've got to face the mage. That being said, the stats yesterday show that mage was still running at fifty-six percent um, towards the end of yesterday. So it's getting it done despite. And being soft targeted, you can't hard target this deck. It's just, just got too many moving parts to target. But it, it's doing really well, which isn't particularly surprising. Oh no. What do you do without a weapon? Pocket Twain's going to have to teach us. I mean, that's still a good hand. <laughs> Reverberations versus Mechro. Yep. Want one of those, thanks. Yeah, just having something to kill the first mech without spending the coin, also good. This is I'm on board I'm on board with this. This is this is tough to deal with. I mean he's gonna have to play the Oh, he was gonna have to play the worm to get the bolt, so he's got reverberations coin ping next turn with the bolt. But this is now giving him a decision. Does he want to try and kill the mechs or does he want to just make a million skeletons and four fours and kill his opponent before they kill him? So now he's got to visualize the whole game. Uh, against Mechroad, it's kind of tough to kill your opponent before they kill you if you're not addressing their board. <laughs> um, so I don't really like that game plan. But if you can do both simultaneously, then yeah, amen. Um, so you can go... You could go keyboard into reverberation, but it's just going to want to have something on the board. Multiple attacks, right? Yeah. Has reverberation to deal with one big thing, and now has attacks on board to deal with one big thing plus a small thing. And it gives him the bolt as well, right? Which means he can reverb bolt if he needs to on something terrifying. Yeah. Talk about a lot of moving parts. If I'm picking up lots of... I know they're not spare parts, but they're spare parts. Come on. Give me that one. Yeah. yeah. Come on. Be be honest with yourself, you know? He's got to be. It kind of requires answering as well, otherwise the, the card advantage will get out of hand. Well, the card the card renewal is never going to be an advantage because Mage always has a million cards, but yeah. yeah. All right. Choosing not to panic. Four mana crap, TJ. How do you like that? <sighs> yeah, this one's this one's done, though. The only question really is, do you want to trade first so that your crab people don't get killed, or do you want to trade with the crab people? The claws, if you will. I, I think you can uh, trade first. Throw the 2-2 two -two Divine Shield into one of the skellies. Then Krabatoa and throw the uh, crab thing. So, to elaborate this on that point even further, next turn you've got Inny and you want to make sure one of your mechs is alive. Okay, oh, this turn you've gonna... got Inny, go for it. We don't need okay. Krabatoa. It's going wide. It's going real wide. We're kind of in need of an inquisitive creation right now, I would say. Yeah, you're going to get stomped next turn as well. So, you're doubly in need of it. Yeah. 
and it's not, it's not even like that good. <laughs> it's only had three damage, right? Because it's only been Frost and Fire that yes. have been played. Um, reverb is not terrible here because you can reverb on the uh, Inid. Um, sure. And and even uh, you can't clear off. This JB can't because it's reverbed. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. But you can like reverb, trade, and then play a flame elemental. Great, cool. Uh, or you can artificer reverb. That's probably better. Just try and gain yeah. a little bit of health while you can. Oh, it's, it's horrible. Yeah, it's all bad. It's all bad. Reality. Yeah, I mean he's doing it, but this is begrudging. Not, you know, he's not excited about this. Wow. The only thing I guess that is happening here is Rekvam's not piling on the damage. I mean, he's won the board. He's going to get a Stomper down. Or a Spooder. Oh my, so many options. So Pocket does have a little bit of time. So normally it's instant spider, right? But I think the reason Vecvan's paying attention there is, you know, he's seen a reverb go, so the stealth's slightly less useful than usual. Yeah. In some worlds, and a coin was very tempting. But yeah, look at this with the Titan next turn. Oh my goodness. Yeah. No alibis right in this deck. Nope. If you really need one, though, you can find one. Got a lot of reverbs. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, another spider. 12 on board, spider. It's so expensive to play the spider because of the way the mana works out, but... Put your opponent to 15 and just have a lot of stuff with Titan backup. Basically, keep making bigger boards. Okay. Yeah, I think with Stomper, <sighs> you don't really need the stealth. Like, it's a 7 9. I, reverb's the only way, but <sighs> reverb. Uh, I guess reverb ping. Oh, no, you yeah. can't reverb ping. Only going into 6 mana. So it shuts off reverb ping, which was pretty much the only thing that could answer it. Yeah, no bolt. No. Yeah, because of all the. Exp yeah, sure. That works. Yeah, closes it. Now this uh, sick jazz flute is just perfectly apt for the situation at hand. Just explain jamming. further to so those of us who aren't into <laughs> jazz <laughs> flutes. I wouldn't say that I'm an individual who's into jazz flutes, but I mean, you seem to be. Yeah, that's going to do it. <sighs> Pocket train. I mean, it wasn't a terrible start. It's just sometimes if Mech Rogue has a good start, you need a perfect start <laughs> in order to answer it. And yeah. That just didn't happen uh, for Pocket Train. So Requiem gets a quick victory. Still quite a few choices in that Rogue. game, right? Pocket Train had the choice to play Weapon into Coin Cold Case, try and fight for board that way. Um Obviously, you don't know exactly what the rogue is going to do, whether they're going to stealth, whether they're just going to make a big thing, whether they're going to go wide, but he thought long and hard about that decision. And Rekvam had the choice when to play the Stomper. Really good decision to play the Innie when he did. I think you and I just saw Crab play Crab. Of course, it was the right mana cost. It cleared the board and it looked great. Uh, so even though it was a short game, there were still decisions being made there, which I think people overlook sometimes in those aggro games that take five turns. Yeah, I think Krabatoa probably would have been also good <laughs> in that situation, right? Yeah, that's like, why I missed the play, right? I saw the Krabatoa. I think I win if I play this Krabatoa, so my brain then stops looking for better options. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. But what's better than winning? Winning better. Yeah. 
finding a, a, a use for any in a situation where any may not have been able to come down, whereas Krabatoa is always an option. Um, ended yes. up just ditching it anyway <coughs> with the gear shift, but it is what it is. Um, but now, <sighs> Rekfam's still with the, the Priest. Oh, we're going to get to see the Priest. See if that can take some wins. The Shadow Priest. It's the Shadow Priest. Yeah, which is fine. Which is fine. <laughs> As opposed to Control Priest, which is absolutely not fine. Uh, Control Priest is fine. It doesn't... It didn't get through. We saw... There's just one in the tournament, right? They didn't get through. Oh, it's Balance. He's through. So... Yeah. <clears throat> we'll see Balance in our fourth and final quarterfinal. Which is so the exact be... correct number of Control Priests for a tournament. One, and I don't cast it. It's fine. I do cast it. So actually, it should be pretty fun. Yeah. Hey, I, 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 I practiced Shadow Priest for quite a long time this week. Control, Control Priest? Priest. Yeah. yeah. Shadow Priest doesn't seem like a Neil kind of deck, you know? Shadow Priest? I played Shadow Priest for weeks um, during one of the GM seasons. Weeks? Yeah. Well, yeah, because it was like the only deck. <laughs> It's like, what do I practice that like, I haven't already practiced? Nah, nothing. I just play Shadow Piece again because it's the best deck. Now and Rekram thinks I it is as well. Certainly but not. Yeah, it's going to be a bit awkward, this deck. It can be. I mean, it can have starts that are just impossible to beat. But, like, everything outside of that is just quite mediocre. So, <laughs> you're just hoping... You know, your other decks get a get a, like a sweep going on. You're up 2-0. You got three chances for the Shadow Priest. You got three chances to just draw the absolute nuts. So. And I think Shadow Priest in a nutshell. Wow. I think this is very much a fourth deck tournament as well. Like the Shaman has been a lot of fourth decks. I think, again, Sotland and Raven were talking about this in different light yesterday. Um, the Control Priest, we've seen Treant Druid in that slot. We've seen... All kinds of stuff. The thing that hasn't been the fourth deck has been the Control Warrior, which is running as like an 85% ban rate in this tournament. Yeah. It's just good against the field that is here. It's not necessarily the best deck in Hearthstone right now. I think that might go to Enrage Warrior. But the Control Warrior beats these things as a fair clip. There you go. That's how you play Mage. Keyboard, Coin, Cold Case. Vectram knows. He just knows. Yeah, and just pick a card <laughs> on turn one. Yeah, it's just literally, literally just <laughs> get oh. a get a spell when you play Discovery of Magic on turn one. That's what it is. And this cold case does everything. I mean, it does everything anyway. But against Shaman in particular, like two skeletons to control the board. Four armor because, you know, you get low on health against Shaman. And a 4-4 four four because why wouldn't you want a 4-4? Four four? Yep. Just lovely. Go. Yeah, pocket train with the very British sarcastic nod. <laughs> Give the thumbs up last turn, too. Yeah, he's <sighs> applauding his friend, Rekvam. Nice to see such sportsmanship. Yeah, wants to play in the next turn, so does not want to overload with the Feral Spirits. <laughs> now Rekvam's going to just make two different spells happen. <laughs> I'm going to watch Pocket Train for the entirety of this turn. I don't care what he takes. Oh! Demonic Dynamics. It's a fell. You get two demons, and they're buffed. Yeah, we take that. Probably. He's trying to work out his next turn. Right? He probably wants to artifice him and do some stuff next turn. But I want the Dynamics. He's probably trying to recall, like, are there any actual useful demons that heal me and stuff like that? Or are they all nine drops? There's some pretty good ones. He's just gonna, he's just winning on tempo right now, so yeah, that kind of helps with tempo, right? Like, it summons a two-two also, so it's not like you're just oh, sacrificing he... your. He's thinking about order in the court, right? Has he, has he got three turns lined up and he can just order now? Let's have a look at his list what, quickly. What are you looking for for order? You want elemental just inspiration? Just your good stuff, right? 
just gonna check his exact list because they're all slightly different lists. I guess. So he's got two elemental inspirations, Sif's already in his hand, then he gets Norganon, two wisdoms, which will be pretty cheap, and Lady Nazja, basically in that order. Yeah, so you cut out all the, <laughs> the little things like your 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 burn, basically. But let's say this board gets dealt with, like you have two turns before you're really doing much. Like you're not finding your your damage. But he has another prismatic. I think that's what he spent so long thinking about, right? He's got the voice scripture as well, so he's going to have two turns worth of stuff. I think was his his thinking, or rather one and a half, and take your chance with the prismatic if it gets tough. Like, I like it. Yeah, I just wanted demons, and I'm really set upset right now. But maybe this that's is okay. better. People who are raised by dogs probably want demons more often than average. To be fair. Yeah. This is just infinite stuff. It kind of is. Like, this is... This is damage. Black Fam's up to 40 already. And Flash of Lightning is also... I mean, you're, you're dumping the second crash for sure. Just yeah. clear the board. Um, because you also get to discover another nature spell. And not really sacrificing much damage on top of it. Yep. Oh, and the Titan picked up too? That's This is a big swing. It really is. Because now we're and going this, into turn six. Which is the turn that you were saying was Rekvam's awkward turn if he did go for the... The Order. He will pick yeah. up uh, Norgan on next turn. And then he's got double inspiration the two turns after that. Which one do you fancy? Ah, uh, I mean, probably Norganon just so Titan can't be played. But you're then you're leaving up the Radiance, but you don't really have a way to deal with the Radiance anyway unless you use Norganon for damage. But uh, that could be worth though. <laughs> Or you've got Prismatic you into Cold Case, or whatever you pick up from the Prismatic, so you then got better Elemental Inspiration yeah, but next turn. Yeah, you still, but you still leave up the Radiance. I think Norganon into damage might just be the best. Just get, yeah. get the Radiance out of the way. I don't disagree. It's not often it's just used for straight-up removal like that, but this is a very high-value minion. That's a permanent... There, it's double reduction next turn, if the Radiance lives, because there was a Flash of Lightning played as well. Yep. It's a tough call. <clears throat> and this was always going to be the tough turn if things went wrong for oh. him. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Went with disruption. So with there's uh, one overload, so the Titan can't be played. But wait! Wait! I'm waiting. I'm waiting. It's not lethal. Wait! I'm waiting again. It's f no, it's lethal not. now? It's f no, it's not even close. There's only two damage spells in hand. Uh-huh. Well, you know, sometimes that's enough. It just depends what the spells are. But for Shaman, I sort of agree. <clears throat> I mean, you you might just... Alright, just one crash. Odin plus one crash. And then clear it off. Pretty lackluster turn, but what are you going to do, you know? Okay, so there's two Norganons and a Nazja. If he plays this, he gets the the other Wisdom and the Lady Nazja. Are the, are the two next cards in his deck? And then we're into Volume Ups and Inquisitive Creations after that. I if you get to those Creations, still on a decent health total, that might be nice. This is really tricky navigation here for Rekvam. Yeah, 
Hear the call of what? Say what? What are you on about, Gilganesh? I, I, voice lines I struggle to pick out. I play with sound off. Actually, I used to play with sound off a lot. I play with it on these days because, you know, I play with sound off. Alright. Oh, double. So yeah, many flashes. Dead. It's dead. Dead, 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 dead. So much damage. Dead, dead. This is double flash last turn, too. Inza was played. Yeah, Inza's down. Flash, at least single flash. Possibly double. What's this? I thought it might be double, but we'll see. So, is it down to just play your, uh, yeah, your prismatic and hope? What are you hoping for? Um. Bug. Something that gains me 27 armor. Yeah, that was about the best that he can do, but he knows. Like, he just drew his, like, his entire deck over the past couple turns. Use one crash. I mean, we're actually lacking damage. It might not matter. That overdraft is like a million. Because <sighs> it's only the crash. And turn the tides. But it's... He can play everything. So it's plus 7 spell damage. Yeah. Plus 8 spell damage. Twice. twice. That's plus 16 spell damage. So it doesn't even matter what you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. He's good. It's, it's literally two direct damage spells. Yeah, this is, this is TJ who two seconds ago said, It's only two direct damage spells. Yeah, turns yeah. Out. They could do a lot of damage. Take 21, yeah. noob. Take 19 more. But it's one all, just like that. And Rekrab had a really good start. And the decision in this game was that order in the court, which I, I quite liked. Uh, but you, you didn't I did, I did not. You, you, you wanted demons. You wanted the tempo on the board. You didn't think you I mean... get to turn seven comfortably. And you, you read it all right. Yeah. It, yeah, it's just tough, right? Um... He was hoping that, like, Norganon would buy time to get to turn 7 comfortably, like the one uncomfortable turn. He could block with Norganon, making the, the cards cost more. But it didn't really stop Pocket Train much, because he popped off the turn prior to that. Um, and Pocket Train also knew it was coming. He knew it was in the hand, so he knew when to pressure. Like, it gives your opponent information. It makes it so you can't get creative with your plays, because you know exactly what's going to be drawn. Like, I, at that point, I wouldn't even really care about the demons. I would just... Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, elemental inspiration, though, is not. incredibly important in, in that matchup, I feel. Because a lot of times, they'll kill you before you can, like, get Sif uh, yes. and kill them. Like, their combo happens much faster than yours. So you need the minion pressure. And the way to do that is elemental inspiration. But, um, like, in order to get there... Maybe you just try and get there naturally instead of doing it the other way. And then go with the demons to try and buy some tempo along the way. Well, Pocket Train was one who got there naturally in the end with the with the nature shaman. So <laughs> we're, we're down to mages, rogues, and priests. Pocket Train, slight advantage in my eyes here because he's got the... What we've been calling the fourth deck out of the way. I don't know how other people are seeing shaman. It's definitely up for debate, but... The Shaman or the Priest here, I think, are the fourth decks in this lineup. That's my opinion. And he's got his three. Yep. I'm and still worried about the Priest. I think, yeah. I mean, there's only one of them in the tournament. Quite often, that's a sign you're either going to win the tournament or you've brought the wrong deck. But it hasn't looked too bad. It's okay. Why are you worried about it? What worries you about Shadow Priest? It's just about everything, to be quite honest <laughs> with you. I mean, what we'll doesn't worry you about it so we can eliminate something? Uh, the, like the... Oh. I don't know, the crazy starts? Yeah, they, they can be good. They can pull off a lot of times. 
notably with like undying allies into like banshees and armor stealers and yeah. eggs and then they live and it's impossible to remove because if you remove the reborn banshee it just buffs everything else it comes back and you can't do anything about it yeah yeah those are the starts that can just kill you it's basically a bad version of mech rogue isn't it it just does the same thing but not as well uh they have more dire d direct direct we've at is we've at us oh well, okay production was telling him to wave at, at us he was like... requested to wave. He's done everything else this season. He's streamed his <laughs> tournaments. He's, you know, tweeted out various events and times. He's talked to casters about, you know, situations and who's going to get to Worlds and stuff. And now we're making him jump and wave at us. He's done everything. Yeah. He's, he's done it all now. He's, he's leader on the point equal with Weak U. Yeah, the, the, the Prush team was probably like, you're on camera. And then he literally didn't move or change his facial expression at all. Yeah, this is Rekvan being asked to wave. <laughs> <laughs> and then they yelled and said, wave or something. And then he gave his awkward little wave and his sly smirk. He's like, I'm not here to wave. I'm here to play Hearthstone. Ah, uh, Pocket Train likes to wave. I mean, w waving can be pretty fun. If yeah. you do it correctly. Can you can you do it wrongly? How do you, how do you wave wrongly? You'll, you'd know it if you saw it. You'd know it if you saw it, okay. Reality. It's a major. <sighs> yep. If only they could combine their hands into one super hand. They ah! Wow. What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> They've always met them to wave. <laughs> he was freaking out. <laughs> See, that's waving wrongly. <laughs> yeah. Right there. That's exactly. I it. told you, you. I told you. You knew it if you saw it. I saw it, and I knew it. Interesting here that um, in this mirror, where the keyboard is a big deal because you end up getting so much tempo because of his hand. Pocket Train has chosen not to play the keyboard and just kept the pressure on board. Um, yeah. It's not the end of the game if you go two into four, and he hasn't got the four um, as mage versus mage in the mirror because the other mage can still generate massive tempo. But it's a surprisingly big tempo matchup, the mirror. You don't have time to mess around and wait for Sif. You've just got to hit him with the stuff. Oh, blessing of kings. See, that's how tempo he pocket sees it. Oh, my goodness. That's one of those uh, double whammies. Now he's established the keyboard, the blessing. Oh, TJ. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's the juice. Look at all this stuff. Oh, it's so good. Gets out of um, creation range. This needs to be good. Ooh, Visage. Is... Visage, I think you'll find. <sighs> Visage. Excuse me. You okay? Yeah, that's better. Ha ha. What, what do you think Raven calls it? Vi's age. I don't know. Yeah, something like that. He's just jamming his turns. Holy moly. Yeah. So here's my stuff. I mean, I'm going to hit you with it because I've got the bird to finish it off. This is how yeah. the mirror goes. Again, Sif. What's a Sif? You just, just, just make things. They are going to get unmade, though, for the large part. Ooh, I'm mana away from being able to do cool stuff. Oh, uh, too late. Holy? I think you take equality. Puts everything in ping range. But getting into burn I mean, range, there is no armor gain for Rekram in hand at the moment. Well, cold case. Apart from the cold case. This is what I was looking for and just didn't see as it was hidden there behind all the other cards, obviously. <laughs> it's my excuse. And it's a good one. I don't think Stick it is. Stick to it. I'm sticking to it anyway, but I don't think it is. So what have we got here? Weapon, equality, 
cold case and just work out do you want to one one from the equality or do you not want to one one from the equality that's what comes to mind I don't think you do because you're getting um, inquisited or or creation I mean or because it's just a one one and it's rubbish because it's a one one and it's rubbish okay it's not so unnatural I say rubbish don't like it. It's icky. <laughs> you still have your 7-7 seven, seven next turn. I, no, so I said next turn as if there's going to be one. That was clever, wasn't it? I was. It's got to move, though. Yeah, he really has. Yep, he agrees with you. One ones are rubbish. They're not good. Yep. They're not they're not what you desire to have. Yep, but a decent swing, but Pocket Train's got uh answers lined up. The zone inqui inquisitive creation. Or Actually just rip just an elemental this. inspiration off the top. That sounds good too. Yeah. Chip another one. Oh, uh. I think he just got to, He's got to just do his own. Uh, so, trade. Go I like so. double. Go four four trade, then a scaly trade. Uh, what was it? How many? Is it four, three? Uh, th ah, no, it's gonna go reverb. Yeah, so <laughs> what do you even do? I think it's three. Good shot. Another good shot. Look at them go. Yeah, that was uh, quite good, actually. Sharp shooting from the skeletons. I think they kind of worked out that was his best chance to win as well. I, don't, I think while he got the roles he was looking for, I think he looked at the line you were talking about and was like, okay, but do I ever win? Yeah, because you, then you just get blown out by uh, Inquisitive Creation. It tests Counterspell first with a spell that doesn't really matter that much. Pew, pew. Yeah. It's the little boo afterwards. After you take it, it comes back. Always gets me. Ooh. Bow. Uh, that one. Yeah, that is the best. It's the best one for sure. All right, now All it's right. got to be Elemental Inspiration. Hope for Rush. Five. Okay, there's one Rush. No Taunt. No Life Steal. Eight. No. So oh. much. That's just. That's it, isn't it? Yeah. You could do. You could do it either way. You could use things first, and then deal 10, or you can just copy it immediately, deal 5 twice. Which do you prefer? 10's more impactful looking, isn't it? You really blow your opponent out of the water. Yeah. Alright, pocket trade, one game away. And from a semi-final against Hemlock. Yeah, that was, uh, <sighs> looked like Reckman was, like, on the verge, potentially, mm -hmm. of a comeback. Just need to stabilize once, but Elemental Inspiration coming off the top, and the Norganon and the Reverb was enough to finish it out. Could have been a number of burn spells, right? And even being that low, like, it's it can be tough, right? Um, so, was able to get the job done in the mirror at a... Slight advantage with the opening hand, but Requiem's hand kind of caught up. Uh, it got better. It did, yeah. Get, getting the weapon as well. So. <sighs> yeah. Catching right up, but yeah, this this ended it. Who needs order of the court where you can just get the cards you need in the right order anyway? That's that's the best way to do it. Yep. So now only deck remaining for Pocket Train is going to be the Rogue. 
Which we'll see is fine, but it is fire. mechs, right? So... Has a decent chance, obviously. Two shots of this. And no in the hands of a good player, it, which is hard for him. Mechrogue is probably the scariest deck for me in like a match against a good player. Like in the hands of a good player, Mechrogue is tough. Uh, there's so many. It may seem like this super super. Oh, both players have plus one attack on their turns. What? That's actually really good for wreck them. Yep, I'd I'd say um, because he can clean up like divine shields. Uh, and, you know, like two ones, you can keep control of the board a little bit better. So, and Requiem's minions are a little bit more durable in the sense that the plus one attack may not matter that much, or as much. I'd say that uh, this sl slightly favors Requiem in terms of um, the power of this anomaly. Yeah, getting rid of Divine Shields is a big deal. I ran some Paladin the other day, and whenever this came up, I was like, okay, well, that beats me. Obviously, Mech Rogue's a bit different to Paladin because it cost, takes you like eight health to take a shield off, but even so. Rest of Vekram's hand, though, hasn't turned out as he would have hoped. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> not, not particularly good. Okay, not going to use the coin, just going to go for a foul egg in a, in a hit here. Fine with that. I was thinking maybe you could just like mine steer and foul egg just to keep the board clean, but I think this is fine. You can always mine steer next turn. If there's only the one magnetic, the mine steer still clean the answers. Or if two mechs are played, you could always hear a power coin mine steer to preserve your position on the board. Vekram needs something here. I mean, obviously he has got some sort of play, but with a coin, but it really isn't going... Oh my goodness. And if he doesn't top deck something good next turn, he's in a lot of trouble, I feel. Yeah. Well, Grave Digging could do some work, but I don't know if there's going to be any trading going on with, uh, uh, with Pocket Train on the other end. Stealth first and ask questions later, or ask questions now and then stealth up? It's hard to know. The ongoing debate with this card. They go up to six and just gets answered by a hero power. So if you really want to keep the mech, it'd be... Oh, I guess you could trade and then just play the spooter afterwards. Yep. Seems reasonable. Spooter. Right, what's he going to be for Ekvam? He needs something to happen here. Oh. Yeah, that's an. Oh. Okay. But now huh. you're you kind of want those cards to be played. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if this had all happened in a different order, it'd be so different for him. But. I guess next turn you can only play one of them, and then the turn after. You'd rather have cheap stuff than play another four mana thing. It's tough. I must consider. The mines here is the big one, right? Like the only oh, real quickly. removal options. Yeah. Would he remember to swing? Yeah. yeah, of course he does. Okay, Shadow Word on Death oh. is pretty useful sometimes. Yeah, I think this did improve the hand <laughs> a good amount. Seventeen, though.
taking a million next turn for where he's at. We can see it's not actually at this exact second that bad, although hit stop will change yeah. things. Yeah, just decided I can't, just can't get rid of it. Not going to mess around, just going to get more damage I can in. Right. Trying to race him, but... Not working out too well. I mean, he has more on board than Pocket Train in terms of attack, but this pit stop will change things up. <laughs> he took that so quick. Oh my goodness. Four, five damage. Yeah. On board, plus an extra nine. It's not enough to clear it. Has to rely on the mind eater? Okay, well. Bold spike! That's helpful. Is it? It's not. No. It actually Can't isn't. kill it. No. You bone spike your mind eater? Um, I think you have to, don't you? No, oh, I'm just gonna effectively concede. And that'll be the end for Rekvim as Pocket Train takes the series three to one. And uh, that seems to be my experience <laughs> with these Shadow Priests. It's yeah. just, it's, you have all these expensive cards that have no effect on the board. And it's like in the matchups where you just need reactive tools, you're only finding proactive tools like that game. They're a game where you only need proactive tools, you're only finding the reactive tools. So, <laughs> um,. A, a risky bring from Rekbim. Got him to the quarterfinal, so obviously not that risky. But wasn't able to go any further as the mech broke. He's going to take him down in that final game. Still a good series, though. Uh, I like that one. Very yes. fast-paced with some quite aggressive decks. Like, you know, above average in terms of how aggressive uh, they actually were. Yeah, and Pocket Train goes on to meet Hemlock. And it was Pocket Train this morning who was sort of, I was asking around a little bit, you know, things I might have missed. And Pocket Train's major point to me was do not undersell Hemlock. Hemlock is in his third yeah. consecutive top eight. He's a monster on ladder to play against. You know, the, 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 the players are saying they don't like playing against Hemlock because he's just pretty tasty at the game. So Pocket Train gets to play Hemlock in that semi final. A player that he himself was making sure the cast is hype up. So here I am hyping up Hemlock. Way Hemlock. He's he's good. Pocket Train says so. Pocket Train's good as well. Yeah, maybe it's just uh, you know galaxy brain thinking from Pocket Train. He's like, well, I know I'm going to beat Rekvim, and I know Hemlock's going to win the other quarterfinal, but I don't actually think Hemlock's that good. But I'm going to talk him up just so it's that much more impressive when I beat him in that semifinal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like the old pro wrestling thing, right? You never put your opponent. Just yeah. He's so good that if I beat him, I'm just the best. I'm the sickest if I beat him because he's the sickest. Yeah. No, I really do think that it's a lot of respect for Hemlock. With the results like that, it's got to be. Um, but yeah, that match is going to be coming up in two matches from now, three matches from now for the first semifinal. So that's good, definitely going to be one uh, that you want to stick around for. But another one you want to stick around for is going to be McBannerface versus Wii which is going to be our very next quarterfinal. Uh, that's going to be coming up. So we're going to have to go to a break before we jump into that one. But don't go anywhere. More Hearthstone Master Tour Fall Championship action.
Hello everyone and welcome back to Masters Tour Fall Championship. I'm Raven and joining me for this next match is Sotl. A little bit weird as well, I feel like I've just joined in halfway through the day as I've sat just been watching the first few matches. But uh, what have you made of it so far as we are, you know, pretty swiftly moving through the single elimination bracket? Yeah, I was tweeting about this to the effect that I think the, the top half of the bracket was incredibly stacked with the players who have had the most success at the top, top, top level. Like, obviously, we've talked a lot already about all the players who are being here. Like, these, this is the actual undeniable cream of the most committed, most talented Hearthstone players that we have available to us this year. But I really think that top four, if you look like Levick already going to Worlds, uh, Hemlock consistently making it to top eight, Pocket yep. Train consistently making it to top eight, uh, Rekvam uh, as well in that mix. So those first two, I kind of tweeted about them both to the same effect of like, you're going to watch two incredibly high level Hearthstone series here, like the highest level of play that we kind of have available to us at the moment. And uh, no great surprise, really, if we're going to sort of talk about who we're expecting to edge that, to see Hemlock and Pocket Train just getting the edge. Yeah, it's, uh, it's it's pretty impressive here. We've got my banner phase versus Riku coming up, uh, so we can just check out who we are or, or what we're going to see come up in this one. To no one's surprise, so we're having a Warriors band out. I'm sensing a theme continuing on through to day two. As we saw, I think I was looking at some of the stats uh, from day one, and when Warrior got to play, it was incredibly high win rate. So I think everyone's you know got the gist of it now. Uh, but check out McBanner face, a player um, you've been a fan of for quite a while. Also. <laughs> yeah, um, a player who I have always acknowledged the greatness of. I've been on the McBanterface hype train uh, since the very beginning. Uh, no, a little being facetious. You know, I had my doubts about Banter as a player. He kind of came in in that new wave of America's players that um, tried to take over and eventually did so successfully from the likes of Firebat, Muzzy, Just saying, right? Like that level right. of, uh, of OG America's Hearthstone player. And then we were like, okay, who's the next era? And then Banterface kind of got to mix it with some of those in Grandmasters. And I think I was a little dismissive of his level for uh, quite some time. But now, absolutely, I think he is perhaps the best player in the Americas overall in, in Hearthstone. So uh, is here absolutely on merit. Yeah, and we'll be checking out his Rogue that's going to be coming up. We've seen Mech Rogue have, and Rogue in general, honestly, have a good amount of success over the weekend so far. Uh, at this point, so all after seeing, you know, everything that's happened, all the lineups the players have brought, would you have gone for Mech Rogue or would you have gone for, you know, let's say Secret, Concoction, however you want to name that list? Yeah, Mechrogue was uh, in my lineup. In, in fact, I right. think Banterface has my lineup. Yeah, this. Well, actually, both. <laughs> he stole players. it. Hang on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, well, I talk about this a lot, but generally, I do like to just you know, hypothetically build a lineup before a tournament. It just sort of helps me get into that player mindset a little bit. Um, and yeah, Mechrogue, uh, Rainbow Mage, Nature Shaman, Odin Warrior is kind of what I came in, uh, up with coming into this. So. I'm happy to see that multiple players have gone with that as well, but I do think Mech Rogue had the potential to be a bit of a sleeper deck, and I think you can still kind of put it in that category, because a lot of other players went for uh, Secret Rogues, in case he had the Miracle Rogue as well, mm. so even though Rogue was very popular, it wasn't super dominated by Mech Rogue overall, but to me, this was a real eye-opener, because, you know, you... You lose Prison Breaker, you lose Yogg. Those were kind of the only <laughs> things stopping and those absolutely degenerate mech boards that you can throw down very early. Yeah, and we've already seen it uh, this weekend sort of recover from not the best openings in the world. But, but Bannerface wants to continue on throughout this tournament. He's going to have to take down Wiku, another extremely strong player. Uh, definitely one of the... Uh, I guess newer players we've got to see, you know, time after time in the past year or so, um, of course, but still very impressive nonetheless. Also bringing the Mech Rogue uh, and, and pretty much rocking the exact same lineup. So again, uh, kind of what you were just saying, subtle where like this lineup of Odin Warrior Shaman, uh, Rainbow Mage and Mech Rogue seems to be the one that's getting the most work done overall. Yeah, I would say so. And I think um, there are possibly still some improvements that could be made to this with the benefit of hindsight. Um, not necessarily everything has gone flying through with awesome win rates. I think Shaman is still a little questionable. It's picked up uh, back to around a 46% win rate overall, but um, this is kind of the deck that was a little bit awkward mm. overall. But Shaky. I think it is... Yeah. It's also the deck with um, a lot of agency to it. It's a deck where 
player mistakes can cost you win rate a lot a lot more obviously and readily than maybe it can with a couple of the other decks in this lineup in particular um so we'll we'll wait to see where things pan out when we get to the very end but honestly we're uh, we're running out of time for the sample size to be affected with the number of games that we have left as we are really getting into the the meat and potatoes of this tournament now yeah so after just checking out some of those lists and talking a lot about the lineups uh, do we think that the, the Shaman win is the win to look for in this pretty much, you know, mirror match. Because I think we both agree, you'd be fairly confident that Mage is getting over the line. We've seen it time and time again this weekend. Uh, and again, Rogue has been performing well. So is it Shaman? Is that the one we really need to laser focus on? I think so, yeah. I think, you know, Warrior... Warrior speaks for itself, it's getting banned yeah. in this series, 70% ban rate, and then when it gets to play, it still has close to a 60% win rate, right? So that goes <laughs> to show good. you where that deck is positioned. Uh, but because of the nature of the other decks that are doing well, um, the rogues and the mages, uh, for example, there's a lot of decks that get on board very, very quickly, and that's what can be a struggle for Shaman to deal with in particular. If you can put pressure on Shaman to the point where they have to start throwing out like a, a crash to AoE your board right. without really doing significant damage to face, that can leave them really wanting in terms of actually ending the game. And that's what a lot of these board focused decks are really able to do with the amount of pressure they can put on early. So I think that's why we're seeing Shaman just struggle that little bit. But we have also seen the likes of Pocket Train really, really finding those spots to just say, actually, no, you're not going to put me in a defensive mindset. I'm just going to sneak this lethal <laughs> through that yeah, you're not going to be able yeah. to spot and really turn the tides, uh, pun intended. So we'll <laughs> see how it turns out. Well, as game one between these two players begins, we are going to see Weeku on that Shaman. So again, a win would be huge for him here just to pr really propel him into a favoured uh, situation in this series. But of course, McBanterface with a pretty good opening with this Mechro. Had the uh, one drop and then has the Spider sort of lurking in the hand for a little bit later on. Uh, maybe even not that later on with the coin, actually. So really good opening here, I think, for McBanterface. Uh, missing some of the Spark bots for now, but not looking too bad at all oh options options yeah low-key really important taunt totem here because coin stealth is an option for banter um and if you want to do that you'd have to attack with your minion first to retain the stealth afterwards if you wanted to gain the benefits of the stealth of course that now makes it incredibly awkward because then you'd have still have a taunt totem to deal with next turn with your magnetic minion wanting to go face which makes life a bit difficult mm -hmm. um the alternative play is to play two three on curve this turn but you know that goes straight oh it's a three four. Oh, let me let me let me wind it all back <laughs> uh not knowing where the click clocker landed i was yeah. assuming that was a two three uh, which makes it very, very awkward just going into Jazz Base on Curve, which is what the Shaman very, very often wants to do. But since it comes down as a 3-4 here, I actually love this play. It's just so annoying and disruptive for Wii Q to have to deal with if he wants to play Jazz Base. We were both living in the same world there because I was like, oh, it would be nice if you could get that Inventomatic just down, right? And just have it at least for one turn and really gain some kind of benefit. But we can see that, and, and obviously McBanterface knows, that Shaman has a good sort of widespread of removal that could just get rid of it. But you're completely right. As a 3-4, probably just the best singular outcome for that situation for McBanterface because now, you know, questions can really start to be asked in where does McBanterface put these stats and also just how hard does he choose to push and this is a small detail it's not like a massively impressive thing for a player at this level to get right but i just want to point it out we queue holding on to the first charge of this jazz base i think way too many people just put the jazz base on and go oh the point of this weapon is for me to use both right. charges of it i want to get it down to the second charge as quickly as possible no in a lot of matchups you still want to use both charges very effectively as a fiery war axe right like we don't have two mana fiery war axes in the game for a reason now, right? So the fact you can play a three mana fiery war axe with this much upside, yes, get those uses out of the swings. Don't just throw away the first one. For sure, and look at this now. Really uh, well dealt with here. Gets the piranha and the weapon swing to finish this off, but also gets hold of a hex, which is going to be potentially like super important in this matchup. First huge minion problem dealt with, and this, uh, this divine shield might not actually be a big deal if, if Hex can just get sent its way. If it's not stealthed, then Weeku's kind of sitting in a good spot, even though his health is relatively low for turn four. I think it might well end up being stealth, though, because 
you know the pool of cards that that card has been discovered from, right? And it's not just Hex that would punish you. It's also potentially just Altered Chord, right? Because you know there's mm. Piranhas to bump the shield, uh, and then Altered Chord would I be guess able to make a mess. It, is it stealth this turn, though? Because this hand doesn't scream two-turn lethal to me. True. You do actually, with the double coin um, picked up from the, the squirrel on the previous turn, you can actually make a big enough minion that you would be resistant to Altered Chord and it would only be the Hex that ends mm. up punishing you. So there because... might actually be a temptation to just ignore the stealth part and just get all the damage faced. But you can also use that as a Mimiron setup, which it looks right, like what right. uh, Banter's going to go for here. Yeah, I like this a lot because, again, if you wanted to retain the stealth, you can't attack. Oh, sorry, you you would push one, let's say. Um, and, and then, like, is that really setting up enough anyway? So I actually really like this uh, sort of slight pivot from the yep. banner face here because I think this just ticks all the boxes, resistant to options your opponent may have, whilst also giving you progressive ways to actually win the game, as opposed to, this is stealth this turn, I hope I draw a high damage magnetic thing, right? And hope that's going to work, whereas this seems uh, a lot safer for me. Final choice you could put into the mix. I'm not advocating for this. I don't think it was right. But if you want to give credit for that card, uh, the Hex card that we've been talking about, if Banter wants to say, hey, what if that's Primordial Wave? You could have actually played this out as just straight up three separate minions this turn, sure. right? And just uh, have the, the biggest spread. But I don't think that was really worth going for. Feral Spirit always looks appealing against Mech Rogue. There's just some speed bumps to get in the way. Lightning Bolt always looks appealing because face, but I'm gonna go for Overdraft, okay. I mean, this definitely helps open up mana for the following turn, but I was kind of surprised the plan wasn't even potentially just Feral Feral. Bent face now has to try and break down as to whether he can get through these taunts in a, an efficient way whilst again kind of protecting what he can we know that there's just a hex sitting there ready for anything big so do you think there's merit or do you think that face will actually try and spread stats or try and build a wider board as opposed to the single target all in kind of uh, strategy we've seen quite often from mech rogue Poss very possibly yeah because again you're starting to look at the pool of cards that this discovered option can be to. And the reason we're, I'm focusing on this so much, by the way, is that when you start making like 10 health plus mechs, the cards in Shaman's deck don't really exist to deal with that. It is the discovered options from Lightning Reflexes yeah. a lot of the time that end up punishing you. Um, so I think you're relatively confident at this point that you're not going to be dealing with Primordial Wave, for example, because I think you would have seen that on the previous turn, if that was the case. <laughs> to, yeah, um, to deal with the Mimron, for sure. To deal yeah. with the Mimron, yeah. So I think Hex is certainly something that you have to consider at this time. And this is a nice bonus as well, like the Stomper coming out. It, it doesn't scream game-winning, but at least the benefit we can see is if Hex has to be played, that's all that's getting played. Mm -hmm. So it would have to, you know, a lot of trades would, would go down and still leave McBanterface with something on the board. Um, unless I'm missing something. But yeah, I feel like that's quite likely. And I think that's a card that you also want to get value out of um, because it was on the far left of your hand before you start doing your gear shift turn, yeah. right? Like it's a yeah. very, very good card in the matchup. So... Even if it's not going to be the optimal turn to play it, you want a turn to play it before you refill with that exactly. gear shift later it, on. It always does something as opposed yeah. to... Yeah, sometimes it just wins you the game on the right turn, but it always does something good. And, and the Bandit Face is going to get that knowledge now, see the hex, and at least can tick off that box, say, okay, there's the one to discover cards, gone. Yeah, and I was trying to look for a reaction from Banter just to try and see if he could pick up on whether that was something that he had been planning for. But, um, you know, in uh, typical Banter fashion, not mm -hmm. giving an awful lot away with the uh, facial expression. Looks like a gear shift turn to me.
And the thing you got to remember as well is like, we Q had a really good turn with that hex for sure, but he isn't out of the woods yet by any means because but we we've seen rogue just get the job done time and time again and we yeah. could yeah can build a board has another base as well has some card draw but that's all got to be done without overloading too much without leaving some sort of awkward room here and the bandit face actually going to go a little bit wide with these mechs now uh, drop the reborn spark bot and then yeah lock in that gear shift to no surprise and tidy up some of this board oh another stomper yeah, second Stomper is very nice. I think the big decisions that turn from Banter were just A, how high he wanted to stack the Magnetics, and then B, whether the Spark Bot, for example, was worth playing, or whether having two mana remaining instead of one after the prep gear shift was important for, for anything that he could draw. Mm. But I think since it was a relatively high-statted vanilla minion that he was dropping the Reborn on, I do think this makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and it's just the extra question, because if something can be magnetized on the start of the next turn, right, um, you're really in a, a good spot. Well, I was going to say this is a hand that is a long way away from really being able to turn the, go turn the corner and do something aggressive, but if you're going to draw two cards that allow you to start <laughs> yeah. thinking about that in the near future... Oh, there's Crash. Yeah, you've always got to have at least an eyeball on conductivity, though. It can allow you to do some very, very degenerate things. It's going to be uh, that overdraft that was picked up earlier on. Going to pay off quite a lot here. Going to clear up all of that overload for next turn. Not too shabby at all. Yeah, and simultaneously able to take care of the full... Bronze Gatekeeper with the Reborn as well. An interesting factor here for me is this second Speaker Stomper. Like, is there room to deal with enough of this board and play the Stomper and th threaten Lethal enough with having that Speaker Stomper down? I think so, right? It's yeah, I think pretty, with, the, with the Bone Spike. Pretty perfect sure. with the Bone Spike and the Bronze mm. Gatekeeper, right? Just take out the two taunts and then you can think about, you know, because you're playing Speaker Stomper, you might even just get to push face at that point and just say, that's fine, have your right. plus two spell damage, I'm not super worried about it. It's really tricky, isn't it? Because if you make more trades, that's fine, but then you're further away, but you are playing around just leaving that spell damage on. You know, even if there's just any... Even like a a normal crash or something, right? Just something to, to deal any kind of AoE damage. Mm. It looks like it is going to be respect mm. given to the zappers. It's going to trade down instead. And I think if you're not making the push here to be as aggressive as possible, it's not Speaker yeah, Stomper's agreed. side time either. Yeah, agree. Now, is this going to be primordial? Just to, again, switch off, or hopefully, for, for Wii Q, uh, switch this problem off in terms yeah. of the stealth minion. I mean, as nice as that mech is, it is all stacked on a one drop, so it is hard to imagine a better target for your primordial yeah. wave. And there's just a fish as well if you really want to save the spells. Ooh. While a now, is there anything? Stealth, it cannot taunt. <laughs> is there something that Banterface can like realistically draw with the knowledge we have of this primordial that's going to pull him back into this game, or do you think Weq sort of, you know, managed to get over the hill at this point? I mean, it's very, very hard for Mechra. I mean, I was going to lead. <laughs> this sentence was going to lead towards Titan, um, but. <laughs> It's very, very hard for Mechrogue to do any sort of damage from hand while out of cards. Uh, sorry, when, when off board, it's just not really a thing that they excel at doing. Um, the part of my eyes lighting up at pushing a little bit of damage on the previous turn is then at least you can start thinking about like Krabatoa off the top. It pushes a little bit of damage with the weapons and then maybe you can scrape over the line. Um, but I think there's some caster vision involved in that where I could see 
that the board was going bye bye no, mo- no matter what Banta did because of that primordial wave that was available mm. and then the piranhas that could come down to clear it up at the end. Uh, I think what Banta did made the most sense in a vacuum, um, but I think this was the best draw in Banta's deck and it's still not particularly well, good enough. You can see just from Banta's reaction, right? It's kind of just like, eh right uh, what has to happen for this to be okay sure i'll you know obviously banner's not going to just concede at this point in the game especially uh, with the voltron draw but it's looking a little bit dicey mm-hmm. oh. that's a good draw sure is Now the real question, is this play everything and go face? <laughs> I wonder. Or are you respecting the minions and just lightning bolting them away? So it's a real tricky decision, right? It is. Voltron but- is very scary to leave alive, especially when your opponent has not played their any yet, correct? True, yeah, any is still true, remaining yeah, in the day. Yeah. Well, well, what about, can I interest you in half? Kill the Voltron, leave the little flipper. I'm just, I, I don't know if I can look at the screen while line, two lightning bolts go to minions. Oh, you don't have to lightning bolt it. I mean, you can just weapon the penguin. Oh, sure, right? sure, like... sure. Okay, this, I'm also okay with this. Yeah, I think it's just too clean, right? Like your nat- the natural play, which was sure, play sure. all of the cards in your hand, gives you a six damage lightning bolt. So I think at that point it would be fairly yeah. irresponsible to leave the Voltron alive. <laughs> you know me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a deeply irresponsible person. <laughs> at least I know it. Yeah. And now Banterface has to just try and fight back on this board. Weirdly enough, the player on barely any health is the one very ahead right now. Get some eviscerates in your rogue deck. That's what I say. No, I'm joking. Is there a world where McBannon actually like ever passes this turn? I was going to trade the stumper. Okay, I didn't know if you wanted to keep the stumper, but sure. I was wondering if you like could trade. Uh, sorry, could wait one turn and then likely draw a mech then go with the spark bots and then play stumper. You know, next turn try and like package all of that together. Uh-huh. It's maybe a long shot, but I feel like Banner needs a long shot to work here. Oh. And I'm not sure if the tradable was... Uh, I mean, I'd have to look, but I don't know how likely that was to hit something high impact this turn. Or more high impact than a stumper. Right. And with seeing all that damage and all those cards played out, like, if I was Banterface, I would assume I had the time. Yeah, I don't think you're necessarily expecting to die next mm-hmm. turn, right? Because, like, this board just already doesn't exist, right? (laughs) Yeah, but I think think you can flip that on its head, right? I think from Banter's side, if you can say, okay, I'll play these cards, they trade relatively one-for-one with my opponent's board. If it comes down to an empty-ish board and both players top-decking, I like the rogue in that situation. Okay, maybe we just disagree then. That's fair. I'm just looking at the weapon and thinking, well, that weapon swing already leaves Riku ahead. Yeah, I mean that's that's fair. It's very close, though. I'm not. I'm definitely not saying it's it's you know, the the the, the risk factor of well, what if the next draw was a two one for Banner Face? Then <laughs> then he basically passed a turn for nothing, right? Uh, that's the downside of my suggestion for sure. I don't think there's any great merit to just not being a card deeper in your deck, right? I th- but I do think, like, maybe even after the tradable, you see your next card and you start to think about, okay, well, what if I just hold on to these four one-mana cards? Well, one of them costs zero because of the effect of the, yeah. the one drop. Um, and then just, like, pray for any next turn, and then I can do all of that in, right, in one turn, right. arguably. Like, there's there's some options for sure. Because hmm. it's like any of this Krabatoa... But outside of that, I wouldn't say there's, like, a card. Hey! Oh, there you go. See? <laughs> like, I, th- I think Banter's just simply ahead now, right? Yes, this is very scary. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh my. Working out whether he wants to... Like, where he wants to face trade, because he has Krabatoa to deal six, right? So he doesn't... Like... Hmm. He could throw away a weapon charge to take one instead of two. I guess that's the decision right now, right? Yeah. There's uh, there's still this guy that you've got to think about as well, oh, though, yeah. right? <laughs> like, <laughs> Good old big goal. Pretty big problem if that comes out and you're suddenly healing for six. Yeah. But the Krabatoa is pretty resilient from a top deck, right? Yes. From, from Wiku, that's... that is fairly resilient right now. I think I... weirdly enough, Taunt Totem is the scariest thing for Wiku to do next turn. <laughs> Okay, take the two, gonna lock in the weapon. That gives him ways for Taunt Totem, but there's Flash of Lightning. Okay, go again. Turn. Oh! It's gotta it's be game. Taunt Totem! Oh no, it's, it's not. It doesn't matter, yeah? Oh! Yeah. Wow. I look at Banner's face. That is also my face, and I'm not even playing. <laughs> like, obviously, Turn the Ties technically clears the 6 5, but you yeah, just can't but... do it. You're just not allowed yeah. to face tank wow. it. Yep, there it is. That game was a roller coaster, and honestly, correct me if I'm wrong, Sol, but I think that Banterface will be very happy with the outcome of that one because I'm pretty sure he was thinking, right, well, there goes game one. I'll have to deal with it all in game two. But uh, yeah, let's start the series off with a win. So, two points. Firstly, you know that that game was crazy because uh, Banterface's <laughs> expression changed like 14 times towards the end, which I think is some sort of world record. I thought you were just um, going to say changed. Changed, full stop. stop. <laughs> yeah. um, also, just, but just following up on what you said at the end, I, I think Banter is experienced enough and will have played that match up enough times to know that it's not over, right? Like when The, the, the biggest problem that Shaman has is... Uh, being low on cards. If it's low on cards, it can't mm. really do anything to you, right? It, it really, sure, really sure. does rely on big, big combinations. So when it comes down to this kind of top deck war, I do think that's where Banterface's head was at. It's like, okay, let us let me find a situation where we both play the remaining cards in our hand and we're both still alive and playing Hearthstone. And I think if he can get hey. himself to that position, all he needed to do was draw Krabatoa. And yes, he got lucky in order to do that immediately with the very first draw after he got down to that point. But it's in there. And there are other cards in there that are card draw that can find uh, can get him to that point. So I think he would have been, you know, feeling unfavored, but certainly not abandoning the game. Sure. And I, I, I could, sorry, I could just imagine the chat now after he's uttering the word is, well, all I needed to do was draw this exact one card. <laughs> True. Uh, but yeah, I think Krabatoa was, of course, the, uh, the the key to victory there for McBannerface. But like I said, just a fantastic start because it, even if he wasn't expecting to just straight up lose, it was not an overly uh, comfortable game of Hearthstone, let's say. So we're going to jump straight into game two and we're going to have the Mage Mirror Sotl. McBannerface currently leading the match 1-0 and there's the... Uh, I guess signature opening Woo! of whatever keyboard and then no doubt a cold case coming up soon. Uh, WeQ though, he's uh, really looking to make a big stride forward, getting a, a win on the board here in the mirror match. And uh, now forget about cold case, we're hitting something even better than cold case from this prismatic elemental, that's what's happening here. Have we had any uh, Love Everlasting mage games yet this uh, this tournament? I don't remember any. I don't think so. But I still remember the first time I did that, and I was like, how is this allowed? I know. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 I honestly was like, wait, why aren't more people talking about this? <laughs> yeah, obviously, like, if, if it was from, like, Discover a Spell, right, it'd be really rare, and it wouldn't happen that particularly yeah. often. But because you can curate a pool down to, okay, I'm going to three see three spells, and one of them is going to be a holy spell. Like, it happens a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Got some of that Stranglethorn heart on the go. Bellowing flames, it deals <laughs> ten. No one knows why. <laughs> Not even the devs. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Think it was a code in error. Too embarrassed to change it now. <laughs> what do you mean you put it in, in binary? <laughs> <laughs> 
Cosmic Keyboard coming down no full McBanter face. I think uh, looking at just these straightforward turns one and twos from both players, I think I'd rather have a keyboard than the Elemental right now. Same. Okay. Yep, Forge of the Flames. Now, obviously, your opponent having the keyboard coin cold case start is the nuts, but if you're going to want anything in response to that, it's <laughs> yes. a card that deals 10. For two mana, for some reason. <laughs> uh, I think you'll find it's four because you have to forge it. So. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm enjoying this. Uh, hopefully, this continues with this new extra way we describe cards now is just this card costs this much and deals this much damage <laughs> it's just like how we've described minions for the past five or six years i've called it bellowing flames at least twice already i don't know mm -hmm. what more you want from me raven Wait, where did the other one go? Oh, the creation. Okay. I didn't even see the other one go off. Yeah, yeah it just did, didn't really have an animation, that, did it? It was just like, you are now two. It's yeah. Like trying to fall out three. <laughs> About as good as it's going to get here for Wiku with the board clear, because this is the situation I feel in the mirror where you do start to slip if you're in, in you know, on Wiku's side of the board here. Um... But, as you mentioned, dealing 10 is quite good and clearing <laughs> up a lot of the board, but this is going to get him back into it a little bit, because otherwise I feel like you've just taken too much damage and then suddenly you're just going to burn out pretty quick. Yeah, agreed. Needed a card of significant power level to be able to Ooh. swing back from uh, being behind. Rewind? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, I'll take a free mana. Yep, I sure. mean, fine, yeah. <laughs> oh, is it worth doing a... Like, killing the 2-2 two -two just to get the Infinitize? Killing the 2-2 two -two just to get the Infinitize. Oh, you mean Arcane Bolting it? Yeah, 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 sorry, yeah, Bolting it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Problem is, is it, that oh, it also oh. eats your last keyboard charge as well, right? Which is a little bit painful. Yeah. I mean, it personally, might just I'm okay. Minions this turn instead. I was going to say, I'm okay with just going Artificer and going Infinitize. I think okay, this is the, the one I would end up on personally. I was wondering whether it was just Artificer and Prismatic Elemental and just look for something better mm. to use the last uh, the last keyboard charge on. But sure. Yeah, the difference is like going for a bigger minion versus just having an extra spell in hand. Um, mm hmm. Or at least, at least utilizing Infinitize is probably more accurate, since you get a spell from the Elemental anyway. But I like this as well, after Billowing Flames, you building a little Ooh. bit of a board, not overly threatening, but again, if you take, if you manage to deal an extra 2-3 damage here and there, that does start to stack up. Inquisitive Creation for Wiku is going to be drawn now, so that option is there to just clear that up. I didn't even look, but I'm a easily assuming it's more than three right now or at least three should i say yeah cold case and flames have both been played right so yep. it's certainly certainly frost and fire oh, there's also a wisdom in hand oh sure yeah <laughs> that that also helps <laughs> yeah Remember the Arcane Giant era where there was also Yogg in the game? Oh, and people, sure. <laughs> and people used to say, well, I mean, how am I supposed to know how many spells they've cast? Like, it literally tells you. Just look at that card in their hand. <laughs> This is where things are getting a little bit tricky now, and this is where the the, the full display of mage skills is going to come into play, because these decisions, even though they say discovering a spell that they may not use for the next five, six turns, 
mm -hmm. getting those choices right i feel makes such a big impact on the game because at least many times i played i picked a spell and gone this will be great later on and then it just never does anything whereas you know picking the right uh, options getting use out of everything you've picked can actually just pull you ahead in the game so one of the situations yeah. right where like reverb is a fantastic card but is it how long is it going to take for that to pay off yeah and sometimes you have to look at situations like this and like solar eclipse is only not broken because the developers get to design the rest of the cards you're supposed to play with Solar Eclipse in that <laughs> yes. class, right? So if you get offered it in a different class, you're probably just supposed to take Solar Eclipse you'll end up doing something broken. And also, by the way, Solar Eclipse is pretty broken even in Druid anyway. Yes. So. <laughs> oh, you know that card that's pretty much been played in every Druid since the cards existed? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, even that option, right, where Banterface went for solar and you broke down. Why? Um, yeah. But there was... You could have cleared the board that turn, right? Yeah. Like, that was an option. But yeah. getting these decisions right really does make the difference, especially when you play in the mirror. Yeah, and I think um, just breaking down the turn from Wii Q a couple of turns ago, because we were immediately like, okay, Inquisitive Creation just clears the board. That looks good. Um, helpfully, uh, Elemental Inspiration has just appeared on our screen, and that is a card mm. that you always have to have in the back of your mind. So instead of playing the Creation on the previous turn, uh, Wii Q has gone from a situation where his Wisdom of Norganon cost three, when we were talking about it at the time, to where it now costs zero, meaning he's cast five different spell schools already up until this point. So now, having spent the last two turns doing all that, and still being sat on that Inquisitive Creation, he can actually respond really, really nicely to Elemental Inspiration if it comes out on the other side of the board. Yeah, things are going to start heating up now. Like, McBanterface can draw one million cards if he wants to. Uh, Wii Q's got hold of Sif now, so even though he took a bit of a beating early on, there's a counter spell to back up, sort of, or at least slow down uh, McBanterface this turn, even though we can see it won't really slow much down at all uh, and and then there is sif like locked and loaded not quite gonna go yet but just having it there is gonna be very nice so yeah two four six uh volume ups that's nine you get solar eclipse in there as well yeah yeah million cards yeah no, that's right you're correct <laughs> i mean come on This is why I would already be stressed if I was McBanterface, because he's obviously sat going through the turn in his head, but he's running out of time and he can do a lot of things this time. <laughs> Correct, yeah. So I'm getting, I'm already, as I'm watching this bar timer go down, I'm getting more stressed. It is okay. a, um, a drum I've banged a lot over time, and people like not making the first fork decision soon enough in their turn, so then the quality of the decisions they make later in the turn are worse. What I will say is trying to work out what you do about objection, counterspell, explosive oh, runes, yeah. etc., etc. On that turn was a very, very difficult first fork decision. But yes, I think that is a very valid point to raise. That it's kind of this trick of the human brain, right? Of like, well, I know what this first decision is, so I'll take a really, really long time to try and work it out. But there are there might be five or six other decisions left over the course of the yes. turn that your your brain just doesn't know about yet. And even now, you can see that uh, Banner finished his turn 10 cards. Maybe that was unavoidable, maybe it wasn't. But um, but still, not exactly where he would like to be. Another counter spell going to be dropped down there for Weekure. I imagine this is going to be traded. Oh, no, never mind. Just going to lock it in. Yeah, I think just doesn't want to spend mana dealing with the Artificer mm. and also uh, wants to be looking very, very hard at setting up a lethal on 10, right? So it doesn't want Banter yeah. to be gaining armor because you now have Sif, Forge, Molten Rune, and the Arcane Bolt. And you had a couple of shots from the Infinitize to find another one mana burn spell that could fit into that for zero as well. Yeah, and it just locked in Holy as well, right? Because I don't think there was Holy played beforehand. That's so. right, yep. Yeah. yeah, I mean that that was discovered from history of magic. So right, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, just ticking enough boxes to warrant being played there. And I is guess yeah, is that actually what it's called, or is that just the Harry Potter class? I've just made up. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, what did you say? Discovery of magic. Okay, good, yeah. <laughs> history of magic. Come on, Ron, we're late for history of magic. <laughs> I mean, yeah, valid. It's Leviosa, not Leviosa. Oh, you, you, that would be you. It would actually just, that was a line you would write for that uh, film. And again, my banner face, tons of stuff, but getting use of it, getting these cards out of hand is just as important as creating them at this yeah. point. Because again, just another kind of weird situation where the... Uh, it probably sounds worse than I'm... That it, sorry, it's probably not as bad as I'm making it sound, but it feels like banner isn't really progressing too much. Here, where is Weeku? I, I don't know. Looks like he's got a really good handle on this game. Yeah, stacking a little bit of armor is giving him really strong defense against the Dark Arts right now, though, so that's something. <laughs> Fine, <laughs> I guess. Be like that, Raven. See if I care. What? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Very good. I see what you did there. I was just letting it sit, <laughs> letting it simmer. <laughs> I think nature is the last remaining spell from mm -hmm. uh, spell school from Wiki. Quick so work find, on the uh, work find on like the, a, the link. <laughs> find like a hex or a primordial wave, some sort of transmogrification effect like that, mm. maybe. Oh, no, Raven, I could do those. this all day, okay? Don't don't challenge me. Well, I was expecting something a bit more naturey, honestly. <laughs> Give me a plant name. So, I'm doing names of subjects, Raven. That's the that's the bit. Yeah, but, oh, you know, need nature. Could have gone with herbology, but didn't. Could have gone with herbology. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a good shout. My banner <laughs> doing the typical thinking pose right now. <laughs> Someone quick make a statue. Yeah. Oh, the tried and tested cold case again, gaining more and more armor, trying to defend, but there gets to a point where you know, defending gaining armor all game isn't really going to cut it, and there's still so much that Banner has to drop here, because I mean, it's, it's I'm not going to lie, it's hard to keep track of all the cards in hand, but Sif is there. It's just that there's no bird available. Yeah, and unfortunately for Banter, this all of this armor is incredibly necessary, because uh, while I've been messing around with uh, with Harry Potter subjects. Week you has gathered. I did talk about it. Mm. The uh, the extra burn zero mana picked up from uh, yeah. from Infinitize which can stack mm. in there with the Sif as well. Has a two mana molten rune that can be thrown in as well if he finds one other one mana burn spell for example. I do think we need to make it a requirement that all the players play the signature versions of the cards because I'll be honest, I didn't notice until just that when I said it that Sif had been in hand for Panda Face for that long. Oh, really? Because he's, okay. he's not playing the signature one, right? So it's like, what kind of animal doesn't play signature Sif? I like this choice as well. Uh, burning the arcane, uh, arcane bolt from Weeku just to have an arcane spell get cast in order to uh, set up the lady in order to get the discount on everything else, because now you can actually cast both of those Molten Runes, right. both forged in the same turn with yeah. Sif. So you throw away a little bit of damage to gain a lot of damage on the following turn. Yeah, now it's just going to be nice armor, friend, <laughs> in, in yeah. the next turn, because it just probably won't matter. banter again just trying to think of a way out of this because there's just there's just not much going on there is the uh the solar cold case if he just wants to keep going down that road but is it actually going to progress the game plan is it going to get him anywhere three cards left for bants yeah that million oh, cards and that he... does not show it at all that that million cards that he drew earlier is uh proving to be a little bit of a problem right yeah. now Fire. 
playable? Uh, yeah, reverb. I guess reverb Let's go yeah, into yeah, that. Yeah, because there's Sif, Solar, Blast, and stuff, right? Like, but don't think it's going to matter, especially with the extra five from having the minion stick on board. Uh, not that it's going to matter too much as approximately one million damage. The same amount of cards that Mabantaface drew. He's yep. going to take in damage form right now as Weeku looks to be in a good position to take game number two and even up this series. Yeah, clean game in the end. I think was behind early, certainly was helped relieve a little bit of that early pressure with the Bellowing Flames, otherwise we might have been just looking at a game that panned out entirely differently. Right. But I think what Weak You did very, very well there is recognize he was heading towards the Sif OTK. And I know that sounds very obvious because a lot of people will just look at that and say, well, it's a Sif OTK deck, that's what it does. But it's a very, um, it's a real Swiss army knife of a deck. It can win in a large variety of ways, and sometimes you have to identify what that win condition is several turns in advance and step towards it. And I think that's mm -hmm. what you did very well from sort of the eight mana turn up until the turn where Banterface actually exploded. I think that was all mapped out very, very nicely to progress you down that garden path towards the end of the game. Very nice game. Yeah, and like you said, though, the mage taking a win for WeQ, fantastic. The uh, rogue uh, being on McBanetface's side for the win is great, but there's still those shamans left over. And we said ourselves earlier on, the mages... I don't think there's anything too much to worry about. Banter, of course, someone had to lose the Mage Mirror, but if Banter decides to Q Mage again, I think he'd be very confident in uh, any of the matchups that he's got going there. So, tough one from Banter face there, trying to deal with uh, maybe too many cards in hand and, and not getting hold of the actual, you know, sort of nailed down plan that you really want that for example week you did but still plenty left in this series that we're just one and one and if you just joined us recently this is a top eight match single elimination so the loser is going to be done and dusted the winner moves on to that top four so a lot on the line for these players a world a guaranteed world championship spot is on the line as the one you know the last chance for some of these players uh this weekend so yeah, a lot on the line here. Although I think uh, a fair few of them are do pretty, doing pretty well on points as well now. So that's something we'll have to look at and investigate when the time comes. <laughs> it is a, a speed bump for lovers of smooth narratives that players have been incredibly consistent throughout the year. Yes. Not, o not only in which players have qualified, but also which players have made top eights. So we've had it through consistently throughout the year that a lot of the players who are in the top eight, it's like, okay, they're playing for a spot of world, sure. But they're also actually in really good standing overall in terms of the number of points that they have in total. So it has made things a little bit awkward in some places. Um, we are now going to see the reverse of the match that we saw previously with Banter. Uh, picking up the mantle on the shaman, Weak You looking to build those early boards on Rogue. Oof. Weak You's opening looks quite good to me. Would you say, like, this is the opening? Is there anything Weak You's really missing as a mech rogue here that you would you uh, know, swap yes. something for? Anything for a frequency oscillator. Uh, squirrel sure. on two. Squirrel on two on the play is what you absolutely want. Sure. Not far away, though. Not far away. Yeah, it just means that you kind of have to delay for that extra turn. But yeah. Drone Deconstructor is a nice consolation prize, right? Because you can find Stealth. You could find Divine Shield, for example, if your one drop wasn't Click Locker and already had the Divine Shield. You can find ways to consolidate that board and uh, try and protect yourself from the Coppertail Snoop, which will start to cause some damage. Where does the Snoop go here, though? Well, now that your opponent has drawn schooling, things start to get quite complicated. Because you may even... Play oh, I hate myself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess Ooh. you do have the tradable... Oh, yeah, I was about to say you might even just play Inventomatic, because again, this time I did notice it's a 3-4. Right. Um, which I think makes the most awkward board against the Piranhas. But then as I started to say that, I threw up in my mouth because it floated <laughs> a mana, and then I realized that you could just trade away the Speaker yeah. Stomper, which is a downside, sure, because we've seen already Speaker Stomper can do some work in this matchup. But uh, I do think it just makes the most irritating it's, board over. It's not a mana-floated downside, put it that way. Exactly, yeah. It's like, yeah, this is a good turn now for Banter, right? But it's the whole turn, and now... The squirrels are gone, and you go, okay, okay, here's the actual thing that I didn't want you yeah. to kill. Now I will drop that on the board. 
Yeah. The piranhas are gone. So I'm getting mixed up with his animals, of course. But they so are. What did I say? You said the squirrels have gone. The <laughs> squirrels like, nope, have nope, gone. The squirrels there. <laughs> so it's some uh, that's kind my of a... That's my cat hunting in the park behind our house. <laughs> Turn the tide's going to be used here to clean up some of this, but again, not quite all. Going to have to use the overdraft as well. Yes, from you. I, doing did, I didn't even say his name. Why has he just wandered in the room? I just, like, <laughs> it's like, you summoned me, master. <laughs> yeah. Did he just respond to the word squirrel? <laughs> squirrel, angry? where? Yeah. you sure it's a cat and not a dog? No. Or is it the mention of squirrels? One of my dogs is still just snoring next to me. So yeah, <laughs> really a good hunting dog, this one, isn't it? <laughs> so, great news for Banter is that he was able to pass the threat check of the Coppertail Snoop. Uh, if he didn't, this game was pretty much over because Innie was coming down behind that and there was the gear shift to be able to draw cards right. to actually have things to spend all of those coins on because sometimes that does become a problem. You can curve out perfectly into Innie, but then you've played your whole hand. So the fact that you're getting three or four coins every turn from your Coppertail Snoops doesn't actually mm. mean diddly squat. The bad news is, though, there is an Innie. So there is the, Innie, yeah. that is something you would love to avoid if you can, if you're on like, Banner's side of this board. But what's the setup here? Like, can can Banner afford to just weapon pass here? Oh, okay, I like this. Yeah, I do too. Max yeah, tempo, build a board. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, max tempo. Draw some cards. You don't face any overloads. You still get to drop the Golgoneth on the next turn. Oof. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Noises. Damage, presumably. Yeah. yeah. If you want to hit minions so. twice? You do hit minions twice. This shuts down the Titan play some of the time from Banter. Uh, luckily, Banter already has the turn the tides to go with the Titan, though. <laughs> making it an actual legal play on this board. Yeah. This would have been so brutal without, right? Because it's like, yeah. yeah, you can kill one, but that's it. <laughs> and then you'd be looking at Voltron Prime Innie, which is possibly mm. the most fun two-card interaction in the game. <laughs> oh, okay. Both players <laughs> sort of, like, yeah. No crab! No crab! He yeah. literally just said no crab! <laughs> Both players just, uh, you know, swinging at this point. Gonna get rid of the any. This makes sense, right? Like, you don't want to rely on the top deck, just try and cycle some more cards and build into it later. <laughs> uh, yeah, any getting shoved back in the deck. It's a weird card, like... It's so close to being cuttable in this deck because it does mm. do that in a lot of games. Like, you sit there staring at it in your hand going, this innie is going to be the nuts as soon as I get to play it. And you just never do because your opponent is desperately killing every mech you play for the entire game. But any turn you do land an innie, it's just so powerful. That it, it feels it, like it, you it, just win, right? Yeah, it just retains its place in the deck just on overall power level. Mm. See? For just one card, so for just one card. Mm -hmm. Problem here is this is just simply a million damage. <laughs> it has to be coin hero power, right? No. Okay. Trying to magnetize the crab, Robo Crab. Unfortunately, is not 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 possible. Mabana face down to one. Potentially, she's gonna lose this game and start to slip away. Shaman once again, looking to be in a tough spot, and that's gonna be it. Yeah, Weeku takes game number three, two one up, so far, and and it. 
It really does just seem like we're just going to talk about Shaman for the rest of this match and maybe the rest of the day, Sol, at this point. Because Mage getting the job done, Rogues getting the job done. Again, if McBannerface chooses to queue Mage, I think he would be really confident in whatever matchup he get. Well, it would be the Shaman one now. Be confident. And it really is just like, who's going to get Shaman over the line? I do feel like this class has really fallen in to that ever-present fourth slot, right? Like, there's always that fourth deck that's like, oh, this is worse than all my other three. But, yes, I accept what you're saying, right? But then if you look at some of the other decks that have been brought in that fourth slot... Druid has a 16% win rate. Demon Hunter has a 33% win rate. Uh, Warlock is killing it, but it's two wins and one loss. That's just not a real sample size. <laughs> Looks good <right>? to me. <laughs> yeah, so, like, yes, okay. Shaman has been brought by a lot of people as kind of that fourth deck. Um, but still, yes, this series has not done it any favors, but it was running at 45 before we started this series, mm -hmm. right? So it was doing okay. It was it was underwhelming, but it wasn't a catastrophe that we were seeing oh, from some sure. of the others, and right? And even, even Hunter that we've seen a lot at is in the 40s as well, right? Mm -hmm. Like, the, the, that fourth deck, by nature, right? Like, if you bring a, to a deck, a lineup to Conquest, and all four of your decks across the whole tournament have above 50% win rate... Well done! Shake my hand! You probably you won. won the tournament, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, yeah. It's not often that things yeah. work out like that. Yeah, and, and don't get me wrong. I definitely don't think uh, Shaman was... I wouldn't even call it a mistake or anything. I just think yeah. it's becoming glaringly obvious that it is that number four, right? I think yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Rogue... Um, is is really stepped up because I, I was a bit unsure of what to think how rogue would do going into this tournament if i'm completely honest i was confident on mage confident on warrior but the rogue looks to, the rogue choices should i say look to be really shining whereas the shaman does seem to be the uh, the struggle deck right now i was very bullish coming into this that mech rogue was going to do very very well in this tournament mm -hmm. And I think that has been borne out. Rogue itself has done extremely well yes. in this tournament. How, yes. how well that has broken down between the secret rogues and the mech rogues, um, not entirely sure at this point. We are going to see as we go into game four, though, McBanterface on this mage, uh, hoping to even this match up and give us a, a good old shame and mirror uh, to, for the game five. But for now, WeQ still has the ability to fight back here and, and just uh, end this match quickly, especially with this hand. Looking quite good. The piranhas are available. Some earlier plays that, you know, if need be, can be used as tempo. But maybe just missing just a little bit on some guaranteed sort of good amount of card draw here. Yeah, I think really this... Yeah, if this hand drew a three-on-three, three, if it drew Feral Spirits or mm. uh, Turn the Tides, suddenly everything was looking fantastic because... Yeah, you have Thorim, you have Flowrider, but you currently have no way to overload, which means you currently have no way to draw cards. Uh, you also don't have a particularly good tempo play on three, which are... I, I just named a pretty comprehensive list of the things this deck wants in the early game. Um, WeQ does have the Piranhas, though, which means he's not going to be taking a ton of damage in the early game, which yeah. is nice. Uh, but yeah, it's still a hand that needs a couple of extra pieces to pull it together. And I like this as well, just don't try and get too fancy, just play the three piranhas, leave one on the board. If it gets pinged, great. If it doesn't, great. You know, whatever at this point. Yeah. Spend your mana, right? There was no other exactly. real effective way to do that unless you just want to play a vanilla spider tank Thorin, but that does not seem worth it there. Okay. Where were you? Yeah. <laughs> Flash of Lightning is the mana spend, and then you'd still be able to go Flowrider, Thorim next turn, but it just wasn't a Flash of Lightning hand, was it? it, it like, no. it kind of is now, when you have a Lightning Reflexes in it, but before you pick that off the Flowrider, it just mm. certainly was not. Yeah, the risk, the risk didn't look like it was worth the payoff, right? Or even no. the potential payoff. <clears throat> Cold Case, again, from a banner face, just doing the, the usual, doing the basics. Just playing Mage, having a good mm -hmm. time. This hand is coming together, though, I would say. Like, whenever there's double crash, you have to always just sit there and be like, hmm, <laughs> what's achievable in the near future? It's 
decision now, really, I'd guess, between the weapon and the feral spirits here. Yeah, and it is that decision as to whether we actually have to fight for board and play the, the tempo battle this game. Or whether we can just ignore all of that and say, "Hang on, I've got like a li I've got lightning reflexes, flash, double crash in my hand. Like, can There's I just get there?" The chance of drawing the titan as well, right? Like, just not <laughs> overloading into six. And I know, you know, that's a one in nineteen at this point. But you'd still, if you've got a good enough turn without the overload, why not, right? I think that's fair. Yeah. Arcane bolt. Take off the floor rider, but Banterface is just going to keep the tempo and keep pushing damage with these skeletons. Not looking too bad at all. What's he thinking about here? Because that was a quick early decision, followed by a long pause. Just whether he wants to draw. Yeah, I guess so. It just seemed like a surprising delay, that's all. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's kind of weird, isn't it? Because, like, I was going to say, Sif immediately looks tempting, but when you look at what you can do next turn into Elemental Inspiration, suddenly it's like, hmm, yeah, I like Norganon. <laughs> Weeku's saying, I've had enough, I can't get hit, and then get hit by the death rattles again. So yeah, I'm just going to take a beating now, go down to 11, set up the weapon swing. But Norg for plus one is coming down this yeah. turn, right? And that's why this was the choice. Is that you absolutely had to lock this down from your opponent, because you are constantly scared of that setup. <laughs> yeah, the time wasn't far off. One turn late, but still. Yeah. Uh, suddenly a really, really ugly spot to be in for the Shaman. Right. I think it is just Titan, right? I think it is just Titan, yeah. You can go reflexes and look for the 5-4 uh, the rushes to be able to answer, but at that point... Why are you betting your future on a situation where you can just shoot it for 20 anyway? It yeah. makes more sense. Yeah. Just gonna hold. Doesn't use the spell discount, yeah. Wants the Feral Spirits to be playable next turn as potentially guaranteed minions on board, so you can mm -hmm. either draw the Bioluminescence or find it from that Lightning Reflexes potentially. Yeah, or even just generating the overload as well, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A little bit tricky here from a banner face. Does have the elemental inspiration, but in a weird situation where suddenly the Titan didn't use the deal damage heal, <laughs> right? It's like, oh, that's just still there. <laughs> Yeah, you just can't let this thing live. Like, your opponent's hand would have to be something kind of random in order for you, with a right. second charge jazz base and an alive titan discounting a spell by three. Yeah. How do you not die next turn in that situation? I guess, like, the long shot is you saw them play a crash, but that's too long of a shot for me still. Those are not it, actually. Having drawn no. bio number one off the top, these were not the cards that Weeki would have wanted to see this turn. No. Lightning Bolt and Crash, not bad. But it's more about how this turn is going to finish, right? Like, what's the outcome here? Because no heal available either. Yeah, so Zappa, Ferals, swing the weapon. Six, put your opponent yeah. to 23. You have plus five spell damage. Plus six with the Zappa. You have to go in and do it. Yeah, I agree with this. <laughs> Bandit faces. <laughs> the eyebrow raise. 
He's waiting for the third burn spell. He's waiting for the third yeah. burn spell, and it's not going to come. And it turns out that he is still in this series because he has Sif double arcane bolt coming back the other way. Oh my god, the desync is so intense. I promise you, what you just saw from Bantaface's reaction was him realizing that the third burn yeah. spell was not there from Weak U. And that means he gets to take this one down and square the series up at two games to two. And we are going to go all the way to a game five decider. Yeah, I was going to say that I'm not sure what spell damage exactly Sif was on, but I'm pretty sure the answer was enough, yep. right? So, uh, yeah, it was a fair play for Weeku there going for it. I think, as you mentioned, that the turn was correct, right? You just dump it all, go and see what happens next turn if you're still alive. Uh, couldn't get the Titan to heal, didn't get hold of any extra heal as well for any sort of security. And, and yeah, just uh, fell to the to the wayside there. And we are going to come down to a Shaman Mirror. Uh, I... I uh, it wasn't too much of a prediction, really, I would say, but the rogues did their job, the mages did their job, and now it's just down to a shaman face-off, and it's going to be a really tricky one. How how do these mirrors normally go, Sotle? Is the person who wins board early generally the one who's going to take victory, or is there opportunities for a very back-and-forth game? Uh, yes to the first question, but also somewhat yes to the second question. Um... The benefit of having early tempo, of just like landing fish on the board, playing Feral Spirits on three, dropping Crash on the board and pushing through early chip damage, is that there's an incredible fear equity in doing that for the plays that your opponent then has to make, right? If you chip your opponent down to 20 and you pass the turn to them and you've got two minions in play, you're sat I'm sat there looking at that board going, well, if I don't pay attention to that, they can kill me from 20 right. next turn because I'm leaving them with two minions on the board. So suddenly, this card draw that I want to play, I might not get to play this because I have to I have to deal with the board instead. Um, so the oh, this is my first anomaly of the tournament, Raven. Um, oh, but I looked away for one second. Which one was it? <laughs> plus plus five health. Oh, okay, thank you. So um, that actually changes things a little bit, right? Because that actually gives the players a little bit more of a buffer to play with. You're going to hmm. be less scared of turn five, turn six lethals if you're leaving boards up on the other side and they do get the jazz base down early. But you can still see, right? Like, even though Common Wisdom might tell you, well, this is an OTK deck against an OTK deck, well you just keep schooling and plays schooling on yeah. one because getting that tempo battle right in the early turns is so huge. This deck is so underrated as a tempo deck mm. um, in terms of how to most effectively play it, right? It's a big reason why this version of the deck won out over the totem-heavy version of the deck, right? With the yeah. Fuse spell, and then that's and much better at being an OTK deck, but it cannot tempo, so it loses. That, this is Hearthstone we're playing, okay? It's taken us 10 years to learn this, but I thought we would have finally got there by now. <laughs> yeah, we've seen it time and time again with these styles of decks where your end game plan doesn't mean anything if your opponent just plays stuff and kills you. Right, yep. so like we, you know, we've seen it time and time again, as you said. We're even going to see the the tempo piranhas available, uh, getting dropped down there for week two, just to say, you know what, I'm just going to play these down. You're not really going to kill them off, and I'm going to have that board advantage going in now. Exactly what I was referring to in the lead up. Right now, these three, these three little fish just get to chip away some damage, push banter into the vicinity of 20 health if they were starting at at 30, which they're not. Um, and then suddenly that fear factor is huge. I think right. ban Banter having seen this schooling coming down will actually be somewhat thankful for that uh, anomaly, giving him a sort of a free Renathal at this point. I mean, Banterface already kind of agonizing over the choice here. Mm. Because they're all good, but what's correct? <laughs> right? Like, turn the tides again feels like the type of card you want playable. Also, that's a thought. Has anyone talked about this? How many Renathals are in this tournament? 64 decks, and I th is it two Control Priests and that's it for Renathal decks? Maybe, yeah. And then the Anomalies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, right. but, but yeah, yeah, I think you're right, actually. Well, the biggest upset of this tournament, Sol, is zero Paladins, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Why?
Why did you want there to be paladin? I, I was ready understand. to cast some divine justice, okay? Because there's something just, I don't know, all these fancy decks, whereas paladin's just like, I'm just going to play a dude and hit you in the face. Mm -hmm. It's just, just an honourable deck right now, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> I do like the idea that, you know, because of, like, order in the court and the various effects that I have, because, like, most good paladin effect uh, decks abuse order in the court to some yes, degree right yeah, yeah, yeah um whether it's like do this and then i draw my purator and then that draws me all my light rays or whatever like that that kind of thing or the other version where you you play order in the court and then you always draw the garden's grace but then the yeah garden's and then grace that leads all... into your second one yeah and then god's <laughs> grace great. always costs zero by the time that you play it like mm. because that's the nature of paladin decks they basically just play the same game over and over and over <laughs> yeah, and over it's again great. <laughs> and that game is get them <laughs> yeah Here the Wiku arguably has board control with the totem down, but looks like this is going to be a weapon equip and go. I don't think there's that much merit of just playing Turn the Tides for a minion when you have the, the Jazz uh, Bass available. <laughs> it kind of is, though. It's a 3-3 on the board that oh, doesn't okay, exist okay. otherwise. Yeah, I like this. I was thinking about it, but I just thought it was just going to set up the weapon instead and just have that flex for next turn. Yeah, I just don't... Again, it's... I don't think the weapon is going to be popped two turns from that turn four that week you just played. So if that's going to be the case, then just take the extra 3-3 three, three a turn earlier, right? And just have that sure. extra 3-3 three, three in play. This is fine. I guess 17, still a bit... by the way. He started <laughs> at 35. I was going to say, I guess it's still a little bit early of thinking maybe comboing them both to kill a Titan, for example, right? Or to help kill a Titan. Uh, still a bit early in the game for that, so. Yeah, agreed. And yeah, I think, honestly, face. with the the hand that we keep staring at here now with the Jazz, blade, uh, jazz base uh, lined up, it's not so much killing a titan. I mean, he is killing a titan, but that titan is the titan of the America's Hearthstone scene, McBanterface. Hey. That's who's going to be killed here. One day I'll forgive you. <laughs> Please! You just I keep, just want keep, you keep to like me, Banter! <laughs> it's like, I'm sorry! Okay? <laughs> I'm sorry! <laughs> <sighs> I haven't been this far in the mud with an America's player to like since I called Muzzy a choke artist live on stream. Oh, that was a whole arc, wasn't it? Oliver? It was a whole arc. That never got old. We 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 used that for like a good two years straight. <laughs> this is the thing you have to understand. It's all excellent television, though, isn't it? That's the mm. point. Kind of interesting choices here. Is this just Hex because he doesn't need the health and Hex is cheap? <laughs> yeah, sounds right. Sometimes the simple answers are the correct answers. More often than not, I'd say, actually. Is there any juice in this jazz base? Because there is a there is a little niche trick that you can do where you can actually potentially stack both charges of jazz base, right? Like, So if you have one like this and then you overwrite it with the second jazz base and then swing that jazz base that you've just equipped, you get the first spell discount effect, and then also going into the next turn, you can swing the second jazz base right. that you just equipped and get it again. Uh, usually, there's not much of a way to get that to gain you more than one discount, because you, obviously you can't cast other spells before popping the second jazz base, or the whole thing's redundant. Um, but it is a weird niche, spotter difficult, lethal situation that does come up sometimes. Tournament life on the line. Both players trying to get there, trying to piece together some kind of burst. But Wiku definitely ahead by miles, at least health-wise. Yeah, nigh on 10 months of work on the line right now mm. as well. And Banta finding nothing. How dare you insult Lightning Bolt like that. Yeah, I think this is just Banaface just saying, I've got to do something. Let's go. <laughs> it's not enough, right? It's 28? 
without being able to get the second bio down? Yeah. Yep. I'm sure Weeku was thinking, not like this. <laughs> not, not the fifth burn <laughs> spell. Not the fifth oh, burn yeah, yeah. spell. Not from thirty-five. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, uh, fourteen seems like a more attainable number. Yeah. I'm just trying to. It, honestly, my brain struggles so much with doing crash numbers. You can stop there, mate. Hmm. You just, you just your brain struggles so much. End of sentence. Harsh, but yeah. true. But fair. Yeah. Mm. Look, we all struggle. It's okay. Some more than others. I think... So the problem here for Wiki's hand is just minion generation, right? Just can't yes. really get yeah. enough stuff on board for the, the bioluminescence. One discount currently coming from the Jazz base on the previous turn. So if you find Feral Spirit from Flow Rider, you're paying two for it. You do still have an overdraft, so you can get that one mana back. But you would, if overdraft wasn't your first spell, which it wouldn't be, you'd be paying it's one for one, one right? mana to get that one mana back anyway. Yeah. You call down the of Is this just going to stabilize instead, or at least attempt it? Yeah, this looks okay, right? Clear the board and just say you don't have seven after all that? Yeah, that was a... It was a hand. By the way, like, Banter going for it 100% full force with his chest on the previous turn was absolutely correct because of this Thorim being able to reset this on the following turn right. anyway. Um, but Weeki's turn on that previous turn, yeah, I don't know if some mega genius finds some god-tier line on that turn. It was one of those hands, having played this deck a lot, that's like, it's screaming at me that there's some hidden god play in it, mm -hmm. but I just could not work out I what it was. I think it was just like a mana or two short, wasn't it? I think if, if yeah. this was turn eight, turn nine, maybe, we could definitely talk about outs, but I think just a lack of mana was the real problem. Mm -hmm. and this is so tight. Two players have yeah. been working like 10 months fighting for a world championship spot, and it's only the anomaly, really, that is keeping them alive at this <laughs> <Yeah>. point. <laughs> Yeah, because weirdly, that, that would have been it, right? McBanner would have lethal to EQ in this exact game. Obviously, the game maybe and well would have been played differently and so on, but yeah. Just as maybe EQ could have done the other turn better if there was less health, of course. But there's Zapper. Sol, you tell me. Zapper Flowrider, go looking. I had the overdraft anyway, right? Yeah, overdraft's there, yep. And there's the crash with the uh, ferals. Tides? Turn the tides is three, but then crash still costs three. Oh, for sure. What's that on the left? Okay. Oof. How is this game still going on? <laughs> I don't know, but they are now both officially dead, sans anomaly. So, you know, mm. we have that going for us. I just feel like it's that thing where you just poke them both with a stick and say, do something. <laughs> it's like, what? It wasn't, it wasn't there, right? Two minions, okay, so bioluminescence, and overdraft. You'd be overloaded for two, so it would just do four. Yeah, no, that wasn't it. <laughs> How could you not do eight that turn? Like, I don't believe it. it. That just, must it, it, have been lethal. And Bannerface can't believe it either. I think he was so sure he was dead. So now is this just Titan, AoE, heal? If Titan draw oh, three is yeah, just lethal, true. right? Well, yeah, well, I, I didn't even look how low his deck was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there it is, Zap <laughs> plus Lightning Bolt. I think McBannerface can't believe it either. That's not only going to be game, but that is going to be match. McBannerface takes the victory there, and look at that. That was so close, and there you go. I love that. It's the fist pump of, yes, I won, and then the actual reaction of, how the heck did I win that game of Hearthstone? Because I think both players, at multiple turns throughout that end game, expected each other to, or expected themselves, I guess, to lose and die. Because there were so many turns where, in maybe any other game, the Shaman would just have lethal. It's like, oh yeah, I'm sure, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna press end turn, 
I'm pretty much dead, whatever, you know, I'll see what happens. And I think, what, twice it happened where just neither player could get there. And I think, you know, if we would have had cameras for both players, you would have seen shock on McBanner face and Weakies there after each of those turns. Really incredible last game. And you can take that back to the, the Rogue versus Shaman game as well, right? Like, Banterface thought he was cooked twice yeah. this series. Like, for sure. He absolutely thought he was dead um, in... Oh, no, it was the Mage game, sorry. Like, where... Actually, all three, right? No, the Rogue, like, yeah. The Rogue, yeah. yeah it he, was. Thought he, <laughs> he thought he was out of it with the Rogue until the Crab top deck kept him back in it. And just the, the straight-off fact that yeah. he wasn't dead to the Shaman on the other side. The Mage, he was one burn spell away from dying, and he thought that burn spell existed, and then he had the Sif counter lethal. And then the Shaman Mirror. So all three games we Q lost with Shaman... Banter probably would have thought he was out in all three of them. Uh, and sure. two of those, the Mage and the Shaman Mirror, were actually at tournament life on the line in that, at that point in the scores as well. So that seems like an incredibly unlikely series from Banter's perspective to have won. But I think, you know, Banter is a phenomenal player. This was two great players with two good records with very similar lineups going up against each other. So the margins were always going to be that fine. But yeah, I don't think too many of us would have predicted that ending of just an anomaly and just a few bad draws, basically keeping both players in it for that yeah. one extra turn and allowing things to fall in favor of banter. Yeah, luckily for banter and I guess for us, we've got a little bit of time to recover as we're going to go to a break while we set up the final top eight match of the day. And then we'll obviously continue into that top four. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with some more Hearthstone.
Hello everybody and welcome back to the Hearthstone Masters Tour Fall Championship. My name is TJ, I'm joined by Edelweiss once again. We kicked off the show and now we're back for the final quarter finals. How you doing? I'm doing great. What a series to follow. I think that's probably my favorite match of the weekend so far. Yeah, that was a, a good one. Very close. Every game was close. Every, <laughs> Every game, game you could look at it for the last five turns and be like, no idea who's going to win. Literally no idea. Um, and maybe that's just the nature of Shaman. Get it? <laughs> nature of Shaman. I didn't oh, plan God. That. Um, but yeah, we got one spot left in the semifinals, and it's going to go to Coach or Balance as the two players that are going to be competing here in this next match. Yeah, and Balance, I believe, is one of the few Priest players. Mm -hmm. right? Control Priest. Ayo. I'm sorry. Wait a minute. I'm saying Coach has control priest. Please tell me oh. they don't both. Sorry. <laughs> Wait, did I look at it wrong? No. I didn't think so. We... Okay. No, no. It's balance. All right. I was. I had a heart attack for a moment thinking we had been stuck with control priest mirror. Oh no, we have. I'm correct. <laughs> Coach and balance both have the XL control priest, which uh, is. Kind of curious, these are the only two players who have brought it, and both of them make it into the top eight, so uh, maybe they just had a read, kind of unfortunate for them to then run into each other, as I think even Priest players are not terribly happy to see that mirror. Oh jeez, I have the completely wrong decks open. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Koich does have, on the other hand, the Enraged Warrior rather than the Odin Warrior, so at least doing us a favor by going a little more aggressive on that side of things. I'm, I've always been a pretty big fan of Enrage Warrior. Uh, I don't know about you, you TJ, but I just, I don't know. I, I like getting those huge stat numbers, which which you can, yeah, definitely do now with Battle One Faceless and Anima Extractor. It's a pretty fun tempo deck with a lot of skill expression, which is cool. I also love small Steam Guardians. <laughs> I don't know why it's small, but it's small. Um, and an interesting uh, list that doesn't run um, the Ramorn Ramornia. Yeah, Ramornia or Grom. I think. Yeah. You know, previously when we had sort of Druid Stone going on, one of the arguments for for cutting that big top end was you just had to kill them quicker than that. And I think that's that certainly can be a, a continued argument even even now, but. Uh, I would prefer to have those going into uh, another control priest player, certainly. <laughs> yeah, it kind of need it for the the damage, but we'll see if we uh, if we get to that point uh, in the series. Um, moving over to talk about balance, uh, it's kind of interesting, actually. I completely skipped over on Co H, even putting up my deck list for this round. I didn't even put his up, uh, hit the correct decks up, that so many Priest players actually made it in uh, to the top eight, because we actually did see, even though we lost, Requiem earlier with the Shadow Priest uh, make it into the top eight as well. So even though the times we've seen the deck on stream have been quite lackluster, uh, <laughs> the deck is obviously performing well, or the class is obviously performing well across both archetypes or... uh, to make it to this point. Perhaps the, the players, uh, you know, Priest is, uh, at least as of our previous stats, you know, still not the greatest performance win percentage-wise. It's at 42.86%. Uh, now, I don't know if that is, you know, the Shadow Priest dragging down the controls or, or vice versa in terms of stats, but uh, it's a little surprising that all three of them made it to the top eight when the stats for it have not been stellar. Yeah. Um, but 40% is still re respectable. Like, it's, you know, winning nearly half the match it didn't have the matches that it takes part in. Half the games that it takes part in. And Control Priest is much different than the Control Priest of old. You actually get to play things, and you can be proactive yeah. with the deck, uh, as opposed to you know, in previous iterations of Control Priest, where you were just reactive until super late <laughs> stages in the game. Uh, one of the, I think, most important cards in Control Priest nowadays is probably Ignis. 
Um, yeah. <clears throat> gives you so much flexibility. It gives you ways, consistent ways to like gain armor beyond just, um, you know, generated effects, right? Which helps a lot uh, in many matchups in the current metagame, getting above certain thresholds of life. And also, you can make a bunch of Ignises. You can just Ignis all day, every day, <laughs> and make a bunch of weapons that fit every situation. You know, get a 5 cost for Tempo, sure, yeah. Then get a 10 cost for that, you know, end game win condition. Uh, you can do it all. Yeah, a lot of times, if Priest is able to beat out some of these, you know, more direct damage decks, it is because of armor from Ignis giving it the capability to do something it is normally not able to, which is exceed the uh, maximum life total of you know, 35 with Renathal. But yeah, getting so many Ignis from Power of Creation, from Power Court Synchronize, like Priest is a lot more now about like finding key minions and just getting tons of copies of them. <laughs> yep. And that is more fun than just taking your opponent's cards and hoping that's something good or waiting for your opponent to play big stuff and then killing it and that's it so uh definitely much more of a fan of the control party still tends to be long games they still tend to be quite grindy and you know like to uh grind out decks and that's why we're talking about the armor because games do tend to go a little bit longer um but they can end games which is <laughs> thumbs up they can win <laughs> they can win games of hearthstone not just not lose games of Hearthstone. And we're going to get to see it right off the bat. Certainly matchup-wise, uh, in terms of being the Priest here versus the Enrage Warrior, uh, you're probably feeling pretty good as balance, and we're coming in a few turns in. But see the uh, Cathedral location here for the Priest, even though there's not a ton of minions, it's just really great tool for card draw. You know, Once you pay that three mana up front, you can then use it uh, for for just you know three cards over time right you pay your tax at, at at the start and then the next ones are free and this is a very common use case where you even just buff the enemy minion right before you kill it <laughs> just to get that card draw thori balori <laughs> i can't call it anything else now <laughs> Yeah, it, it can be an obnoxious card for control decks to deal with, but Priest specifically is sort of the, the king of, you know, silences or, or dealing with threats without actually triggering stuff. So uh, no silence present just yet, but there are certainly two copies of Shard of Naru in the list somewhere. Yeah. And could be crucial in this game as well. Um, just to... Try and stop these eggs, get rid of some buffs that are going to happen on the board later on in the game. Uh, even like Trial by Fire. Um, I don't think it's Sango Depths, because I don't think you want three locations on the board, but it could be. <laughs> okay, it is Sango Depths, it's just the cheapest. It's a rare situation where you have three locations on the board. I mean, sometimes a, a ping is nice, you know, maybe thinking, well, it pairs with the Holy Nova and, uh, you know, it allows you to take out this 3-3. This three, three. I'm not sure there were any really great options there. So, yeah, just kind of the cheapest to get out of the way. And you don't usually care about board space as much as the Priest, so kind of okay to play a bunch of locations. Yeah. For Koich, though, it's not, you know, it's looking okay, but with the number of board clears that priests have access to, you're always a, a little bit on edge of, you know, how long is this going to last? How much value can I get out of it? So I'm sure he's thinking about what resources he wants to spend, and, you know, is it worth doing jam session plus the uh, crispy skipper, we sometimes call it, the Sun Fury there to get two procs on, you know, Acolyte for card draws. Ops to just keep things as is. And I think not playing the Sanguine Depths last turn for balance was a nod to picking up this Trial by Fire, right? So 
one situation where board space would matter. Yes. And one of the only ones. Um, he's gonna go, there was pretty clean clear with just two bumps into the Steam Guardian, then Acolyte Thori Balori, but it's just gonna make use of... Actually, this is actually, what, a full? Full, full. Clear. Yeah, and crucially, oh, only one attack used on the Acolyte, right? So you don't end up drawing the opponent too many cards. Gonna leave yep. up the egg for now. Yep. Pretty clean turn. Ends with the two four fours that are full health uh, after the location hit. So nicely done. And for a Rage Warrior, it's always tough to kind of start from scratch. Um, obviously, the Thori Balori is going to do some work in trying to fight back this board. But when you fall behind on board with a Rage Warrior, it can be kind of difficult to get back unless you've done a significant amount of damage to your opponent and can try and go for uh, those OTKs. Um, have a little bit in the makings of it with the Crazy Wretch and the copy with Jam Session, but still not nearly enough. And Koi has to just think if it's worth trial by fire for four right now, because there's no board space, you're just roaring applause and then see what happens. Yeah, I mean, this is certainly the matchup where you would wish to have something like a Gromash. Of course, uh, Gromash plus location plus the Battleworn Faceless is a way that you can get a massive amount of Gabo damage. I think it goes up to, like, what is it, 24 damage? Or... Gromash plus location is 12, and then you copy it, so yeah, 24. Uh, yeah, and that and... can be one way you take the Priest by surprise. Gonna have to do it the old-fashioned way here. Yeah. Actually, Grom plus a Rage is the old-fashioned way, but... Gonna have to do it... <laughs> the gonna the have to old, old-fashioned way, yeah. Yeah, gonna have to do it the new-fashioned way, with a bunch of cards in a single turn, and then killing. And... Uh, these trial by fires for Koh are actually kind of awkward because of this this egg. You know, I, I'm wondering like how long he's going to be sitting on this reduced jam session together with the Craze Wretch and things. Because one of the options on the previous turn would have been to buff the egg, uh, awaken Thori Balor, and you know jam session on that board. Seems like the goal is to go for just a massive hand buff turn. I think Koich is going to try and curate the hand so that all the buffs land on that Craze Wretch. Yep. Also has um, the bonus of being able to clean this board up as well. Because you can alternate attacks with the Thori Balor as you play these fire spells. Just what resources want to get rid of. Now this is uh, a little bit surprising to me. Uh, Battleworn Faceless, very powerful card in Rage Warrior, but it does have the awkward sort of anti-synergy with uh, Anima Extractor, where any buffs that it eats are kind of wasted if you end up using it for the copy effect because yeah. it, it transforms so uh, yeah usually I like to copy the extractor itself so you can kind of minimize that happening but you are you know sometimes starved for mana in terms of being able to do that So, a lot of resources generated, a lot of buffs being placed. Got two on the Crazed Wretch. It's decent. I saw uh, at least one go on to the Dismitter Ogre as well, so... Yep. There's some damage being racked up here. And 
<laughs> this uh, one mana weapon for balance, you know, typically you're looking for on a one mana weapon, you know, it's, it's say the, the death rattle deal one to everything and poisonous, but uh, it's still just an efficient weapon here uh, with lifesteal and gain to arbor. The only way to clear the board, but it <laughs> he came over so many. Yeah, he attacked first. Okay, there we go. <laughs> I was about to say, if he's going to do it how I think he's going to do it, then it's going to be a lot of buffs thrown over. Yep. This will clear and then follow up with the Sanguine Depths. Not sure if he maybe meant to do the Armor Bender, but the, the important plays got through. There is another Extractor now, so even though the Battleworn Faceless ate some of those buffs earlier on, uh, Koh might be able to just go again, and, and this time copy the Anima Extractor. There's always the, the risk, though, of... Dirty Rat, but as the Enraged Warrior, I kind of feel like you don't really have another plan. <laughs> like, you sort of have to go for this all-in uh, hand buff strategy, and yeah, I just hope you, you can dodge the rats, because it's very, very unlikely that you end up actually sticking a board. And in terms of okay. balance, just looking to clear and draw cards. That's kind of the constant uh, name of the game for the priest. Yeah. Has a lot of ways to do that. With the clergy plus handmaiden as well. Uh, Parkour synchronize. Uh, not really anything currently to use that on. I guess in a pinch you could use it on like armor bender. Um, the, the behemoth, uh, probably not great, can't be used this turn. But it's likely going to be wide, unless you're staring at a single minion, which Koich doesn't really have too much in the way of single minions. Cannibalize is fantastic here. Just be able to stop these buffs from coming on. Is it fantastic? I mean, that's not really how you want to use that card. There's not really anything else you're going to use it for in this matchup, though. There's not, like, big stuff. And Well, I think <laughs> oftentimes, like... you know, your ideal use case is up against something like, uh, you know, you play your Dirty Rat, you hit their big minion they've been buffing all game in hand, and then, and then you can cannibalize that. Yeah. But no Dirty Rat in hand. I mean, I guess a lot of card draw still. Just trying to find ways to spend the mana. And with this many cards, I don't know. In this situation, I feel like it was decent. I I mean, I think I had to do it. I think you're just not necessarily happy about it, right? Yeah. In terms of Koich's plays here, I mean, these embers are a lot less useful when you're not doing the sort of, you know, Sun Fury, embers, anima extractor combo. Uh, so I'm a little surprised that we did not see that coming down a little bit earlier. But, you know, the, the flip side of saving this battle-worn faceless like this is, and I'm sure Koich is thinking about it in this way, you get to save it for the Crazed Wretch. So, you know, he's been sitting on this Crazed Wretch and Jam Session for quite a while now, and I'm sure has it in his mind to, you know, use the location in play, plus the Sanguine Depths in hand, plus Jam Session on the Crazed Wretch, and then copy it with the Faceless. And and so that is kind of the amount of burst damage that, that Koich has been working towards. Is it a 4-7 right now? He hasn't moused over in a while. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately... Oh. oh, and there goes the faceless. 
And there goes the other one out of the deck. That is one of the, you know, really tough things about if you, you let things get to the point of Dirty Rat Whirlpool is you not only lose copy in play, but you lose copy in your deck. And I think Koich was looking to pull the trigger on the next turn. Three six, And it would have been a lethal setup as well, unless Balance had been able to gain a lot of life. And what, 24? Something like that. <clears throat> But now back to square one, only four cards left in the deck. I don't just don't know if it's going to be enough damage to get there. It's got to kind of go wide and then hope. Yeah, I mean, you need something to stick. No, no silence on the Thori has meant a considerable amount of value out of its, you know, recursions, just making it all the more awkward for, for balance to keep getting clears. Yeah. And... Here's the weapon. Finally, is I think that might be both <laughs> weapons in the bottom three cards, which is in the very three. tough. Yeah, for a second, I, I was I had to double check that they were there. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> wait a second, this doesn't seem uh, this doesn't seem particularly good. But yeah, they are there. They're just at the bottom. There Sometimes have been happens. some players that have actually been cutting Anima Extractor or, or going down to one copy in the ladder list. Uh, this was during the Druid meta, but uh, just because they saw Battleworn Faceless as kind of the, the better card, and since there is a bit of anti-synergy there, they were, were you know looking at ways of just going lower to the ground and, and not worrying about hand buffing so much as just taking advantage of the weapon. But I don't think there's any lists that have cut Imbued Axe. It is just way too good of a snowball card. Good snowball card can also be a good setup card at times. If you yeah. just need to be proactive, just making a bunch of stats on the board, getting them out of range of certain AOEs. This is just very awkward here for balance you know this only clears the thori and you know yeah. you'd like to have saved it for the following turn i don't think this is enough it's it's not infused but it's 10 13 14 15 plus 4 19 yeah 2021 20, jam session is 24 both jam sessions Oh, both jam sessions, yes. It's the last card. <laughs> and also Curious Ranch, too. <laughs> uh, just to add to it. So, Balance is not able to find something to get that last push uh, taken care of from Koich's side. That was yeah. a little bit awkward. Not what I expected to be, quite frank. Again, this is usually quite favored for the Priest. I think it really comes down to the fact that Balance never saw any Shard of the Naru, which are a huge card in the matchup, you know, very good against all all the buffs, against Story Balor, which Koich was able to get massive value out of. So I think if you're Koich, you're very happy with that game one result, uh, not just because of the win, but because the win into it unfavorable. Yeah, that's uh, a huge win. Maybe a loss for us because the priest is still on the table. <laughs> um, I was thinking that it means higher odds that we see that priest mirror. <laughs> yeah, I, I was like, I, I'm, I was about to breathe the sigh of relief. I was like, okay, got the faces out of the deck, decent life total, one last push to take care of, and balance just couldn't take care of it. And I feel like that's a weakness we've seen from priests quite often because they're. Sometimes they get forced in these positions where they have to be so reactive. Um, and, but they just run out of tools against uh, these types, these styles of decks, which just keep refilling. That's the one benefit, I guess, if you want to call it that, for Co-H of having like Jam Session and Budax at the bottom. Right. Was that the, the Acolyte early on, both Light of the Phoenixes came like at the perfect time uh, to be able to continuously have a full hand size throughout the entire portion of that mid game and that allowed them to have like sort of waves of push and as you mentioned the Shire of the Naru just not being there um, Balance may have just run away with the game that Thori Ballora had been just taken care of uh, earlier on because he used that to trade in to so many minions and then to deal 
a good amount of face damage at the end as well. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the problems Priest can have is actually just too many cards in the hand. Balance couldn't make enough hand space to actually play that handmaiden to draw three to find the cards that he actually needed, right? You play something like Identity Theft, get two cards from your opponent. I mean, the Trial by Fire was a, a pretty good pickup, but besides that, I mean, it's just you're replacing cards in your hand with other cards that you don't necessarily want, and then never having the hand space to play Handmaiden for the, the draw three that might have found a board clear that much earlier. Alright, getting some mage versus priest <laughs> going on here. We just need one of these priests to win before they phase each other. That's <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be the last deck for both players. <laughs> that's, yeah. the, that's the trajectory uh, we're heading down. So we'll, we'll see. Balance fighting tempo with tempo here. Just tempoing out the artificer. Certainly Mage has been, you know, one of the better uh, performers. It, it's pretty likely, it seems, that people end up getting, you know, wins with Mage. Uh, I suppose it's kind of middle of the pack. Rogue has been the best, but uh, yeah, it's it's an awkward matchup for the priest, where you have to kind of dirty rat Sif, but then also there's a lot of boards you still have to clear. Mhm. Mm sort of need to get copies on the dirty rat too, to be able to hit the minions that you need at times. <laughs> Snap, like this... Ignis. There's potential for four Ignis this game. Yep. And that's the beauty of <laughs> getting it from the protocol is that it that's your forge also taking care of for, for the Ignis. Yeah, absolutely. Don't even have to worry about it. So now um, that's a a big boon for co -H. Just gives you proactive stuff, and especially just fits the curve perfectly. Yeah, and I think co -H is just happy to have seen you know the volume up happen before the cold case, so that does give time uh, for being a little safer playing the Ignis on four. You'd probably do it either way, but just not quite taking that chip damage just yet feels pretty nice. And I think you go for a five here. Yeah, just play on curve. Yep, took the five. Wind Fury summon, perhaps? It's a good tempo option. There was armor too, but I don't think you really need it at this point. Well, and the armor is less useful if it's just getting chipped down by things like volatile skeletons anyway. Right? Like, you yeah. do have healing in the deck. Yeah. So, yeah. Wind Fury Summon makes a whole lot of sense to me. Take out the Skeleton, and then the Artificer. Ooh, that's a good one. Very good one. Oh, but so is love everlasting for balance. They were just talking about it, too. <laughs> I don't know that there's a game you ever don't want love everlasting. As I know. It, yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely broken. I mean, there's Last no for some pretty insane Sif combos, too. Insane Sif combos, it just smooths everything along. Like, there's pretty much no turn in which you're not playing a spell anyway. So, it's just free. Like, you never end up like the priest sometimes does, where you feel like you have to play a spell or else you're going to lose your love everlasting. In Mage, it's yeah. just. <laughs> it just oh, happens. I was, I was gonna you, do you're that just anyway. playing spells anyway. Yeah. The only time where. You may have to think about it as it's like it's turn six and you got Norgan on and it's a really good play. 
uh, Wither is the pick here for the second discovery of magic. And uh, honestly, even without the undead synergy with the volatile skeletons, I think it'd be a solid pick just as a one mana nature spell. Yep. That's not a good one. <laughs> so those two are less good. <laughs> yeah, certainly. If you if you take the stats from both of them, it's pretty average. The three eight and the one one, but <laughs> alone it's not great. Still I have think... another Ing Ignis. Exactly. Oh, oh wow. Okay. Going for the Meltranix. That's pretty cool, actually. I'm, uh, I'm a little surprised to see it play oh, this turn. Uh, <laughs> well, it gets rid of the Love Everlasting, potentially. Right, uh, yeah. Most, most, of, most of the time it doesn't, I guess. But in this instance, it, it might just. I mean, it kind of forces the elemental inspiration, right? Yeah. I think that might be worth it. I mean, it's, Norgonon it's just four. fits the curve so well. Oh, it's f yeah, you're right. It's four already because there was even a holy spell played. But you're you're facing up against a board. Yeah, but the Norganon isn't doing much either, right? What do you, what do you do? Just kill the four three? Yeah, that's true. And you lose your love everlasting. I mean, not having an inquisitive creation to sort of answer back on this is definitely a tough spot for balance, but a lot of times priest has symmetrical board clears. So even though he may not have wanted to, it was kind of forced into this elemental inspiration. It does present a bunch of stuff that Koich has to address now. Going for a 10? No, nope, these are ones, so I, that was probably a poisonous and then a deal two. Yep. And I'd be a little surprised, yeah, if we didn't see this other synchronized coming down on the Ignis. Because uh, we are nearing that 10 point, and a lot of the 10s are very, very good for what the priest wants to do here. Oh, yeah. No card draw, no inquisitive creation. This is just a, a really weird spot for balance to be in right now. Yeah, can make use of the uh, wither to get that out of the way. Yep. That only steals two, though, after you summon the skeletons. Yeah. But it's still something. Yeah. And it's another spell in the pool. Immolation Aura. I don't believe we've done Fell yet. It actually might not even be bad to kill your own skeletons off right away if you... Well, you could Wither and then Immolation. Right, right. And that's like... Okay, Lightning Reflexes. Also fine. Doesn't add to the current number of spell schools, though, and uh, not getting a terribly big clear here, so. Oof, perfect Amanthul onto the skeletons there. Alright, let's see what the pick is. Dragonbane? <laughs> There's no fire spells in Priest, so. Yeah. 
Dragon Band is really the only one that makes any sense whatsoever, so... <laughs> it's not terrible. It could be a little bit of damage, like a last push of damage, too. Yeah, absolutely. If need be. Try and put a little bit of pressure on. And oh. this is the power of Love Everlasting. Koich was not able to heal, and so... You know, that Forged Molten Rune is just enough doubling the spell damage, and... Uh, yeah. Three instances, that's 27 damage. It's not even something I was looking for because eight mana. It's not really a turn you expect to sift, but yeah, like you said, the love everlasting. Uh, just able to let you do things that uh, feel a little bit unfair at times. And I, th that was like a decent game from Co H, too. Like, there was a good amount of pressure, a good amount of tempo. I mean, Lost a game with Dirty Rat in hand <laughs> and ways to like yeah. answer Sif. It had if it had come out with like a board in play. Uh, that's the only sort of thing that you could point out that maybe could have been done differently. Is just ripping the Dirty Rat. Um, but it's hard to expect that damage to come out. I mean, maybe the turn that the Molten Rune was forged that could give you maybe a slight indication, uh, yeah. which was the previous turn as you set up for it. Um, but that was it. Like that was the only like thing that said, "Yeah, you're, he's going to kill me this turn." So, yeah, it was um, maybe a slightly unusual spot for someone to to forge a molten rune. That maybe yeah, that could give you an indication. Uh, perhaps I should dirty rat. But I, I think you know, it maybe got carried away with playing the pressure game and was like, "Well, but I'm I'm keeping them on the back foot. I'm not dead, <laughs> right?" And, yeah. and as you say, you're just not used to on that turn being dead to the Sif from, you know, a fairly healthy life total at 25. But Love Everlasting just makes those plays happen. It certainly does. And now we get one step closer to a Game 5 pre-smear. It <laughs> feels like at this point it's just inevitability. Because um, both players just can't seem to get a win on the deck. I will say, should it come be to that? Priest versus Rogue right now. Should it come to that? There is one small comfort, which is that from what I see here, Koh does have Sister Svalna in an ETC, and ah, I believe Balance does not. Yeah, there is no okay. Sister Svalna, no ETC even for Balance. Balance took more of a strictly like anti sort of teched strategy without really thinking about. The mirror, because Svalna is not super relevant most of the time, I would say, facing current meta decks besides yeah. another priest. So I think I can I can yeah. respect taking it out, but of course then runs into the, the one player where maybe it would matter if they end up in that mirror. Not something to be expected. It's great for the value. These uh, priest mirrors don't tend to really go to fatigue anymore. Um, so, like, pre previously we used to see this game where both players would play towards fatigue and just try and pick as many drowns as possible um, to make sure that they were winning in that race, but I feel like you have access to enough big threats and, and multiple Ignises to where, you know, one player can can pull ahead a lot of the time uh, in sort of those, those board battles, enough to put it on pressure to win, so... I mean, the other unspeakable sort of outcome in those matchups was players using Finley to intentionally shuffle cards into their deck <laughs> to do yeah. better in fatigue. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it was uh, brutal. We didn't see that many, though. That was the, the one saving grace for us. It was, they were few and far between. And, you know, every once in a while I can appreciate, like, those type of long... Style games because you don't get to experience them much in like ranked play. Sure. Um, because not many people are playing decks on ladder, and then if you get into it, they have to be like of equal skill level enough to get to that point in the game. And then three, you have to find someone willing to sit there and play it out. Because a lot of times one player will concede because they just want to <laughs> save themselves some time when you're playing in ranked. So it really tests like that Hearthstone uh, game knowledge, right? That the sort of instincts. Uh, that you need. Um, so, we're not going to get it, though. 
it's going to be Rogue versus Priest now. Again, one step closer <laughs> to the the mirror to end all mirrors. Let's see if that ends up being the case. I feel like when these kinds of lineup uh, matchups happen, it puts me in this very awkward position of I never want to root for Priest, except that rooting for Priest is what prevents me from having to deal with both players eventually being Priest. Yep. <laughs> And uh, Balance's hand looking pretty good here. Uh, I know if I'm on Rogue, I definitely always like to start with Ooh. Potion Belt. I think that's a fine result, right? Yeah, <laughs> I guess. It's, it's a bold uh, choice, but, but a fine result. Yeah, it's just a free 2-6. No information, I want to taunt into this 3-2, and I hope you don't have Kabatoa, right? Yep. Nicely navigated. I think ah, uh, good potion. Zacho is maybe yelling at the screen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's the Kravito. Would have had to cannibalize in two turns <laughs> to, to be able to deal Still, with it, I suppose. I don't know, leaving a, a full Kravito up potentially for two turns would be pretty rough. Yeah, kind of devastating. <laughs> Oh yeah, this is a Hearthstone hand right here. Mm. <laughs> Location, pass. Location, pass. I guess actually, this is a great mixtape, right? Because you're guaranteed to hit the Cathedral. Really oh, like that yeah. play. Cathedral being used as intended for face damage. <laughs> Sticky situation, helping to kind of keep some semblance of pressure here. I, you know, the awkward thing for a rogue going against something like Priest is Bone Spike becomes a, a very challenging card to use. Yeah, but I feel like it hasn't been too detrimental. It's made things a little bit take a little bit longer, like in this private eye out, but it wasn't even there yet, so overall not the biggest of deals, and can kind of just have his way with this early game, get some tempo. Koich just has to decide now. Alright, so now there's Dirty Rat and there's Cannibalize in hand. Right, so you can do but them in the same turn. <laughs> yeah. But not going to be the play, because uh, you're still not really answering the three fours that are on board and you just give them good trades into the dirty rat even if it did pull out something good so little surprised Ooh. at the trade there which could potentially have triggered the uh double cross yeah Kabatoa again another thing a lot worse when your opponent doesn't have a minion play you don't get to yeah, make that, that attack for four <laughs> Yeah, playing it on curve is oh, there quite we go. good. There we go. Okay. We found right, our shadow just... step target. Pack it up. Yeah. See ya. You... Is it too greedy to... Nah, there's a cathedral. I was going to say, too no. greedy to just hold it for a turn. No, just just go in turn. three times, right? It also activates your Queen Ajara for next turn. Just get rid of the whole hand. Yeah. End with a break dance. Because the Icebearer is going to be there next turn also. Yeah. So you're still going to have a secret. Yeah, I mean, the Ice Barrier was just there as something that was never going to get procced and also is a mage secret that has to be played around. <laughs> oh, that's just rude. <laughs> <laughs> Better play that power chord synchronized, because it's... You're losing the hand. <laughs> I 
multiple players their game plan. This game is just emptying each other's hands. Okay. Oh, Synchronize interesting. Synchronize with the Queen of Shara. I do like this because uh, Koich is not working with much here. So trying to get some additional value out of cards outside of just dirty riding everything. But he's on three cards. He knows it's not sticking around. Oh, unless unless we're taking a break for Krabatoa. Yeah, definitely. It's a I, solid Krabatoa break going on right now. I guess you can wait until a couple of the spells have been played before you steal the Queen of Jara, because it's currently not active, I think. Oh, never mind. Just do all of the things. At this point, you take Cannibalize. Queen of Zara doesn't matter if it doesn't activate. Yeah, and still needs two more spells for it, so even if there's a spell drawn off the top that's playable. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is just... Like... The, the peak of annoyance out of this rogue deck. You know, normally, I think people would be most frustrated at what Priest has to do. I think Secret Rogue brings to the table an element that players are finally like, no, no, this is not okay. <laughs> this is a perfect game to showcase it. Uh, he's alive at three. Uh, no, at one. Okay, now at four. Um, they draw first and then you don't hit anything. Yeah, you just, you just land prison here, I think, mm -hmm. for sure. Yep, pr prison for sure, absolutely. Yep. It's always lethal. No, no, there we go. Oh, no, it actually found is the line. lethal. Okay. <laughs> actually lethal. <laughs> yeah, found the line. <laughs> I, there's still, I stick by my uh, by my call there. You definitely slam prison. Look, no one can tell us that prison wasn't lethal since it wasn't played. Yeah, so multiple ways to lethal. Actually, prison probably represents more of a lethal, it's more damage. <laughs> the um, psychic damage. It's, it's the mental damage. Yeah. But that's uh, three games so far this series and uh, three priest losses uh, so far this series. Doing some serious damage to that win rate. Yep. Oh yeah. That's where that's where we are right now. Just Sunday, final day, the Masters Tour Fall Championship, hanging around, watching Priest lose. That's uh, exactly how I expected but, my Sunday to go. But TJ, Sunday is a fun day. On. Yeah, it's fun for the player in each individual game that's not playing Priest, and then in game five, when it's inevitably built Priest, then it's not fun for anybody, so <laughs> that's where we are right now. I can imagine we're going to see Priest versus Rogue in this next game. Um, so, we're getting there. It's like that. Yeah, nice little lethal spot at the end. If I had looked at that for like 45 more seconds, I would have seen it. <laughs> If my brain had not already slammed the prison? I mean, realistically, like, Whirlpool could have come down there for Koh and had it not been a lethal that turn, and there still would have been very low odds of winning that game. Yeah. <laughs> not much you can really do. Maybe was... Could have been an Ignis, potentially? I don't even know if there was a card for that game. Um... It's blended together with the previous priest game, <laughs> but balances. <laughs> they one game always away. blend Just together. The, with the priest. They they do. They really do always blend together. That is absolutely true. All right. Is this Imagine the one? The gonna be playing the rogue. Someone has to not yep, play. It's okay. The rogue. All right. Is the rogue. You can do okay. it, balance. You've got this. <laughs> There's so much on the line. <laughs> Rooting for no other reason than that no one wants to see Priest Mirror. <laughs> There's probably a few out there who do. It's all right. They understand, at least. Yeah. Cheroo. Ah. I don't know between the clergy and the armor vendor. Yeah. Clergy has higher immediate upside and the armor vendor 
potentially has higher long-term upside. Obviously, entirely dependent on the game state. If you can copy it to get a little bit of health to live an otherwise lethal situation, then maybe, but... Yeah, I mean, I think playing the clergy on one is where you, you do the most in terms of threatening the opponent with you getting value, and so... Uh, you know, had there been a, a, a magnetic, like a poisonous magnetic there, then you can expect it would have been played to kill the clergy. Yeah. Of course, now is that card worth it? Very curious to hear the thought process here for balance, like what he's debating between. I mean, I think it's between hero power or like coining the Holy Nova. Because Holy Nova often doesn't get a ton of value in this matchup. It can, but uh, very frequently, you know, the, the rogue is just all about making a big minion. And so uh, doing two damage to the board isn't really doing a whole lot. Yeah. I mean, I could have also seen just like armor vendor like pass <laughs> yeah just to have multiple attacks on the board to be able to clean up like this uh small mechs and also with like shard the naru in hand it allows you to clean up the mechs after they're silenced yeah. potentially um so but shard the naru is such a premium card it's hard to know like fully when to use it and yeah. i feel like that's a oftentimes a big deal in this matchup a lot of times when you can clear the board simultaneously to be able to keep the mechs clear. But now we have two, so we can be a little bit more liberal with our usage. Yeah, and, and they're getting the uh, solid Holy Nova that I wasn't sure if it would come or not. Uh, pop quiz, TJ. I should have done this earlier when there were two blues, but uh, what are the spark bots in hand? This is terrible for someone who's colorblind. <gasps> oh no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh... That I don't know. There's a one of the blue ones and two of the green ones. <laughs> I yeah. don't know which blue they, it is. They're and, so close. Which green it in, is in color, right? So the the earlier like kind of lighter blue one that got played, of course, was the reborn. This is the wind fury, and then we've got poisonous okay. and stealth. I was gonna. I was actually gonna go with reborn. That was gonna be my fifty fifty guess, but I would have been incorrect. Now, to be fair, I'm not as colorblind as Brian Kibler. <laughs> um, Who's like three magnitudes has three magnitudes worse color blindness than I do. Oof. I mean this is the kind of deck that the rogue is, right? You can hedge a little bit, you know, putting one of them onto the enhancematic, but no matter what, you can't really play around Shadow of the Naru, and uh, this has gotta be one of the more polarized matchups there is. So understand Koh wanting to just kind of Try and get it out of the way. You know, you hope that the shard is not there, but if it is, there's not a whole lot you can do. Now this is going to be tough. Because now there's going to be multiple turns where Koh is just trying to set up. Yeah. Trying oh. to find like a spooter. There's a couple things that he has to hope for. He has to hope for he can make a push before turn eight and Warpool comes online. And also has to hope that the second shard of the Naru is not there. Yeah. Well, it turns out both of those things are not the case. Yeah, so, we... uh, going to be in a world of hurt. We got Rush Double Wind Fury. So, uh, you know, reasonable there. Get to rush in the Divine Shield, take out the 3 2, push in for 8. But, I mean,. There's just a wealth of, of answers here in terms of Shard of the Naru, Cannibalize. I mean, there's just so many tools that Priest has access to that make the rogue miserable. It's sort of unless you can kind of catch them with their pants down in those first few turns, uh, it's it does not get better after turn five.
balance in a great position, but just trying to figure out the most efficient way to spend mana here. I mean, I think the love everlasting coming into the hand is is a little bit of the the question. Like you always want to get that down as soon as you can, but it means yeah. going for shard instead of cannibalize here, and cannibalize while you know really good for dealing with a, a buffed minion does have the issue of if there is a stealth, you're not able to target it. Whereas, you know, Shard of Minar, of course, gets around that problem. Yeah, but getting the Love Everlasting online does open up Whirlpools as early as next turn. I don't know about you, but I have not been loving the Speaker Stompers this weekend, at least in the Rogue. Yeah, it feels like either a dead card or a win more card in a lot of situations. Um, but maybe we're just seeing too small of a sample size. Like, to get a good read on it? I don't know. It doesn't even look like it's doing anything this turn because it's balanced out by the Love Everlasting. Yeah. <laughs> At least not for the first spell. All right. Oh, oh gear that's shift. a good one. Okay. Yep. We're we're a turn away from whirlpool though. Uh, Mimiron could have could have been used earlier. Now Koich, I think, is is in kind of all in mode, right? He's seen two shards. He's sh seen. Uh, I believe one cannibalize. Uh, yes. But of course, the whirlpool shatterer of dreams here, reduced by the love everlasting. I mean, I think you had to play the member on there, right? You just you gotta go. Yeah. Well, with second whirlpool loaded up, <laughs> I mean, balance at this point could just like run Koich out of cards. <laughs> like that's. Not even just win the game, but just completely neutralize every card that Koich has. I mean, all that said, there is a, a risk of the Prime coming down at some point in here. And Balance has not been able to, to hero power gain life for, for many turns. So it's getting uh, you know a little bit danger territory. This is true. Can fit in a hero power here. If Whirlpool would be the option, which kind of has to be with the life total here. Yep. So Koei just got to be thinking. All right, that's uh, that's, that's got to be that's it, everything, right? right? That's got to be everything. No more. Yeah, frequency oscillator, not. Not the turn nine pickup you want as the rogue. Uh, rogues yeah, this... six two so far on on day two, uh, and has won five straight games. But I think that streak is about to end. There's so many good hits here. Yeah, I'm on Thul's one. Armor vendor is another. Honestly. Yeah, just to be super safe. Right? Yeah, you can just double armor vendor, shore up that, that healing you're concerned about. Finally, there's a minion that Light It Burns is actually able to clear. Weave in the hero power. Or just play the second in location. Yeah. World's your oyster at this point, if you're priest. That, sh that should very well be it. Too much life gained. Koich on the back foot. Not many resources left whatsoever. Oh, okay. There's the prime, but it's it's about a turn too late. Yeah. If that was picked up last turn, maybe a shot. Yeah. 
yeah, I was gonna say you kind of have to go for more value here. Yep. Okay, oh. a spooter. Yeah. Spider's good, but can't quite play it this turn. And I think between the the two attacks and Dissonant plus Holy Nova, there is another clear. There's even potential for, you know, Power Cord on the Voltron. <laughs> Prep, sure. Oh, wait, it was on the six damage side. Yeah, yeah, so I don't even need the Nova. It's a squirrel to boot. I think the only reason Koich is still, you know, in this game is because it's not ladder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and now effectively has to wait for the spider. <laughs> like, that, that's it. And even then, it's just... Feels like it's not going to get there. I mean, balance doesn't really have much to do, but even just these couple small minions will eventually uh, be able to close it out. <laughs> Koich rubbing the eyes, knowing that... This will soon come to an end. <laughs> oh, that's... I mean, that's just salt in the wound, seeing your opponent <laughs> get an extra copy of Prince Renathal just for, for pressure. <laughs> yeah, just for a 3-4. Like, just a, just a spider tank. Okay. One, one of the better remaining top decks, but... I mean, when you're at this point where both gear shifts are gone, so it's, it's really just about your top card every turn... Uh, there's, there's really just no keeping up with uh, all the value that, that Priest has available to it. Yeah. Out of minions, though. I mean, that's the... Yep. Oh, there's Ignis. This is uh, Dredge, though. So no reduction yep. for picking the Ignis, but uh, with the location in play, you are able to get that Ignis immediately. I think just lock in any defensive options. It'll probably be a five. Let's get out of the way right now. Is that a ten? Oh, yeah, it ten. A ten. Yeah, all, all right. right. Sure, yeah, ten. Holy Nova. Just, just trying to say... Could have picked a one. You know, then it would have been perfectly fine. Yep. Are, are we done here? Like, come on. <laughs> yeah, or... For a coach, you got you got to feel you know wanting to to play it out, have as much time uh, on broadcast in the Master Tour as possible. But it, it's you know these are those kind of heartbreaking ends that why uh, Control Priest tends to be the villain. <laughs> also, because it just take once they get ahead, it just takes them some time to win the game. Yes. Yeah. Like, they give you small bits of hope here and there. But that's the end of the deck, so is it just Spider and... <laughs> oh my goodness. This might actually have been a, a little bit scary two turns ago. But... Yeah, seeing the lethal damage on board, Koich finally decides to pack it in. Um, you know, that valiant effort, sticking it through to the end, just on the off chance that, that you know, maybe there was something. But uh, Balance gonna gonna take the win there, and, you know, Koh's loss is our gain in that we have dodged the Priest Mirror. We did, yeah. Uh, Priest still took quite the beating uh, in that series, for sure. Um, there was a Priest in every game, and <laughs> only one in the very last one. So, not sure if that bodes well for balance moving into the semifinals uh, uh, later this afternoon, later this evening, whatever time zone you're in. Um, but seems like playing the decks well, and the other decks are are taking wins, um, and that's the kind of position that he needs to to put himself in. Um, but the last priest remaining in the tournament now, I believe, with Requiem being eliminated, and now Coage also being eliminated. Uh, has to rep for the the priest players <laughs> in this tournament, which is you know a huge weight on Balance's shoulders. Do we count 
wreck them on, among priest players in that number. That was a absolutely. that was a purple priest. I don't know if that. No, absolutely. That's a priest. Wreck them <laughs> is a bona fide priest enjoyer, and don't ever let him forget it. That's a uh, that's a fact. <laughs> One that he'll never be able to escape. I don't think he even really necessarily agreed with the priest choice, but couldn't find anything better in the two days that these players had to prepare on the new patch, which it always happens this way. Like the smallest patches, I guess this one wasn't that small in the grand scheme of things, but um, basically one deck being brought down and Rogue being slightly brought down because they slightly. were also in an, uh, a user of two of the cards that were taking a hit from rogue still like on fire both variations yeah. uh on fire we actually had three variations technically in this tournament because i think there was one like old school miracle rogue player but hey see uh, the one the top out, eight yeah yeah with the one holdout um but both secret rogue and mech rogue firing all cylinders like feels like they can't lose a game as you mentioned with the stat that you said earlier uh with the win rate um especially today so that's how six games in a row that we've seen from from rogue uh that are one yeah, it's out. so it's now 7-2 on day two, Rogue is, and it's now won six straight. Well, no, no, because Rogue finally broke the streak there. Rogue finally lost, so... Oh, Rogue finally lost. Oh, yeah. It was so on you, five the, straight wins and then lost to you, the Priest. You play, you play one squirrel, and all of a sudden, I think you're a Rogue. One squirrel, and all of a sudden, I think you're a Rogue. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Got that See, backwards. The, so I was just so accustomed to Priest losing. I was like, there's no way that Priest would have lost there. Yeah, and I think the the priest is is rubbing off on us a little bit from seeing it so much. We've been we've been, been going on quite long, but we are going to go to a break and uh, be back with the uh, first semifinal match after this. Catch you soon.
Hello everyone and welcome back. We've got semi-final number one coming up for you in just a few minutes. But what a day it's been already, Sol, as we're about to get into Hemlock versus Pocket Train. Yeah, with the, the standard we've had so far, it's amazing that things could even be considered to be going upwards. But uh, <laughs> I think it is. I think this is the match to be looking forward to. I think these are the two players um, out of this year's system overall. Um, we'll really dig in deeper later as just to how impressive these two players are. Pocket Train in particular, just that little cut above, I would add to that as well. But we are now in top four stages, semi-finals of the last chance for direct qualification through to that world championship. Yeah, of course. And just in case you were, you know, just tuning in or haven't quite caught some of the discussion around it, uh, this isn't the only way to qualify for the World Championship. This is just the guaranteed way to do it, um, which is to finish first place, obviously, in this Masters Tour. But there are um, top cut points going in as well. So points gained basically throughout the year um, to be able to qualify to fill up those last two spots that are available for the World Championship. So still... Not to play for, for these players, but of course, the number one goal for them this year is to win a Masters Tour to just get that guaranteed. Yeah, and you can see Hemlock's route to attempting to do just that. I think Hemlock, to me, number two player on the circuit this year overall. Um, he has put in some fantastic performances, as has Rogue as a class so far <laughs> in this tournament. Really deciding to, uh, really showing to be the a big winner for the players who have brought it. Uh, which is most of them, to be fair, but I think the debate may still rage um, between the mech rogue and the secret rogue and how things break down. You can see Hemlock's version of the deck here uh, is still choosing to include uh, Prison Breaker, even after the nerf, mm. which, you know, fair enough. And I think also a single copy of Breakdance in there as well, a, a particularly interesting card to look at. <laughs> Yeah, I think the big difference for me with the Rogue so far has been um, probably expected, but when Mech Rogue wins, it feels like it really wins, but when it loses, it feels like it really loses. Um, whereas I feel like the Secret Rogue, um, at least at surface level, looks to always have a way to get back into the game. Uh, we'll see how it's been going for Pocket Train, of course. Um, what a journey Pocket Train's been on over the last, uh, I guess, couple of years at this point, especially. Um, um, and it's been going well for him so far. Wants to just sort of seal this uh, World Championship spot up with today without having to worry about anything going on with points. Yeah, I feel like uh, the journey of Pocket Trade is a nice way of putting it. I feel like Pocket has like aged about seven years in the last two <laughs> years just from the pure stress of playing high-level Hearthstone um, as well and as often as he has over that time. Uh, we did just see him there on the Shaman, although we are looking at the Mage. Uh, Pocket Train, interestingly, I think is one of the few players who's kind of not suffered the Shaman curse so far this tournament. His Shaman, is, his shaman players seem pretty smooth. He's kind of got it out of the series in the way he's needed to. Um, but this Rainbow Mage, I think, has been perhaps the success story of the tournament. Right. Uh, although no one really would have found that to be unexpected, right? I think generally people coming into this tournament... Um, if you put a little bit of thought into it, you would. I think we most people would get as far as Warrior Band a lot, Mage winning a lot. I think a lot of people would have got over that. Yeah, I'm with you. I was just going to add exactly. If you're expecting Warrior to be banned one way or the other, whether it's Odin, whether it's Enrage or whatever, then you would just put Mage like, yes, okay. There's a reason pretty much everyone brought it. There's a reason pretty much every single player brought the same style of Mage. And that's because it's just extremely strong and uh, it gets the job done as proven time and time again through the matches we've seen. But we can see both players getting ready. They must feel so close but still so far away subtle right because like yes when you're in the finals you know it's that last match but semis you think well, i've got to win this one and then even if i do there's still one more so even though they've got so far to get to this exact point to make it to top four it still feels so far away Yes, and it's a familiar story for both of these players. I talked a lot already about how good their records are overall, but just to break it all down. So three major Masters Tour events so far this year, right? 
Hemlock was fifth through eighth in spring. He was fifth through eighth in summer, and he's top four again now. He's also fifth overall in the actual point standings that you get from the ladder finishes to get to this point, which can then just get you through to the World Championship in like a second chance, last chance kind of thing if you don't win the Masters Tour, right? Incredible record. But then when I talk about Pocket just being a cut above that, Pocket, third, fourth in spring, runner-up in summer and now top <laughs> four again and is tied for first overall in the number of points um, gained through ladder finishes. Yeah, so right. both of these players have incredible records, incredible levels of consistency. And we've talked about this for years and years and years. Consistency is really the marker of great Hearthstone players. And there really isn't anyone who's been more consistent than these two players this year. But when you talk about how, okay, now this is top four, but we still have to push it that extra step to make this 10 months of work that we've put in actually worth it and to hold that World Championship invitation in our hands as if it was a tangible object, which it isn't, but ignore that. Um, this is another Harry Potter reference. Is there an owl going to deliver the World Championship invite <laughs> or something? <laughs> Accio World Championships. No, um, but yeah, they, not, both of these players have fallen at the last hurdle, right, is the point I'm making here. They have both right. consistently yes. got very, very close but then just haven't quite made it over the line of the last step. Well, let's dive straight in. It's going to be Rogue on the top four. Hemlock and Pocket Train going to be sitting on that mage. And we have a bit of a wild game one, Subtle. Yes, indeed. Double Shifter Zerus. Uh, one of them already been gobbled up by Hemlock on the other side. Uh, does find, amusingly, a second copy of Private Eye in the hand from the Shifter Zerus. That's fun. <laughs> Yeah, this is probably one of the more wild uh, anomalies, right? You see, like, oh, you know, plus one health every turn, or both heroes get plus one attack. This is like, oh, both players just get two shift as errors. Could be anything. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> what I will say, like, just in case anyone is watching this who is primarily a Battlegrounds player, who has experienced the similar anomaly in Battlegrounds, it's, it's a little bit different in Constructed, because in Battlegrounds, your Xerus will just transform into a 6-drop, and then you have a 6-drop, right? Like, that, that's, that's just it. You could have a 6-drop on turn 3 or whatever. How You can't... If you get, like, some massive game-impacting crazy card, it's probably going to cost a lot of mana, right? So right. that doesn't end up having a huge impact in the early game. Honestly, a lot of the time I play this Anomaly... It's just a frustration that I have two extra cards in my hand, uh, like, you know, just for hand space mm. issues, because generally well, I play decks that draw a lot of cards. Um, but certainly things can have a big, big impact if you hit the right I was going to say, right that's time. why I think, like, the way Hemlock has, whether chosen to or not, or just made that decision at the time, but, oh, just play a card that you can play, right? Yes. It's not a yep. negative. Get one out on one as a 1-3 that you didn't have regard you know you didn't, wouldn't have had otherwise right so like yeah just play it get it out the hand and it's still beneficial it, not i think the goal of, of utilizing these kind of touch on what you said is not to make like oh this this um Zerus has won me the game but it's more oh this is just an extra card to plop down pile a little bit more pressure on when otherwise i wouldn't have necessarily been able to <laughs> so like hey just two extra little minions right like it's fine a little bit of synergy as well God tier synergy. Your putricide yeah. is a two four now. Incredible scenes. But if you look at both these players' positions now, Wait. Hemlock's got the Zerus out and it is piling on the pressure. Is that fierce outsider Crimson Sigil Runner? It is, right? That's fun. Okay. Big fan. <laughs> Pocket train is gonna now defend. Get rid of the putricide himself. Well, it's, an, it's a pretty intense tempo swing, right? Because you actually mm -hmm. get the double value from the Putricide as well. Which is really, really nice. Obviously, the Putricide gets cleaned up very easily here with the two one-health minions on board, but you actually just get a full mixed concoction out of that play from uh, from Pocket. I think that's a really nice spot. Yeah, both players just making the most out of what they've got, right? Pocket did get a hazy as well. Pocket is a uh, is long renowned as a fan of, of hazy concoctions. Going as far as to say, on numerous occasions, that it is always hazy. Future <laughs> side going to get cleaned up. Oh, nothing too crazy going on, but does get that 4 3 on board, which is going to be you know, at least you know, maybe for Hemlock, trade, trade fairly with the 3 3. 
both players just using these early turns to sort of shimmy for position. Okay. Quite the leap ahead on board presence here for Pocket Train. Just to use Discovery of Magic or History of Magic or whatever else you want to try and call it. Uh, to give him a few more options going forward in the next few turns. Not too bad at all. Especially with the Inquisitive Creation just sat there. Because to me, that's... It might sound a bit stupid, but that's when it feels most powerful, is when you've just got it sat, waiting and ready to go, right? Not when you've had to throw it out for an emergency clear, but when it's just sat there and you know that, yeah, more or less, you know, most boards I can just clear away kind of effortlessly. It's not a particularly familiar rogue hand on the other side from Hemlock, is it? Just a bunch of minions that all cost quite a lot of mana. It's mm. not really what you associate with playing Rogue. Yeah. Would you like some cards with your cards? Yeah. It's a little awkward. No real smooth mm. options with, you know, you're not firing off zero mana concoctions, no crazy shadow step synergies happening here. It's just a handful of uh, fairly mediocre mid-range minions. Yeah, the prison breaks, probably not too far it's probably too far away right even with the prep like prep concoction that's probably i don't think there's been that many spells is there uh no hemlock spent a lot of mana on playing the uh mm. the Zerus minions so i wouldn't have thought so i think whatever this turn looks like hemlock's just thinking what gives me the best Krabatoa next turn <laughs> that's what i would be looking at anyway Tess, okay, sure. Again, it's that kind of thing, like, Tess is a card that could be kind of crazy for Rainbow Mage, right? You spend a lot of time playing uh, Discovery of Magic and Prismatic Elementals and getting cards from different classes, but again, it's a situation I was talking about before, because it's constructed Shift Azeris, you do need the amount of mana <laughs> required to play the card, you can't just jam it and play it. Right. And already now Pocket just getting himself in a fantastic position. So you're way ahead on board. Hemlock not really been able to really challenge it. While still having plenty of juice in the tank as well in the hand. Has no Gonan available for next turn on curve. Has, um... Uh, I think he said Unstable Elemental or something. I just made up the name of a card, I think. But Elemental Inspiration is what I meant uh, for the follow-up. So the whole board pressure's there. Um, it's just missing just maybe a little bit of burn options from hand. I imagine this is Krabatoa. I think what Myra's is the closest to that actually being a card. Wasn't that the actual name of that card? Myra's Unstable Element, the the draw oh, the rest of your that's deck card. Where I've got it from, yeah. But everyone just called it Myra's, right? Mm. Might even be wrong on that. Oh, I'm gonna go for Prison Breaker instead. Okay. Look at that nerfed card in full effect having to do so much extra work yeah. to uh, deal with this board state and i think it's something the pocket had understood and was leveraging for basically every turn up until that point like yes the prison breaker was not uh, active because of the amount of mana that was spent on minions early from hemlock but pocket train just had no real fear of just playing three <laughs> mana spells and feral spirits and whatever else and just getting a whole board full of three health minions not a thing that would have been game winning pre-balance patch right I see the explosive runes come out now. I'm going to go for shooting star number 500 today. Yeah, so that's going to help clear up some of the boards. Leave the 4-1 though. Not really the best, is it? Not the best offerings I've ever seen. No. Arcane Defenders obviously will end up as a 7 mana card, but when it's Meh. fight fighting for attention with elemental inspiration, mm. it seems a little bit underwhelming. Did go for it, okay. Yeah. Just not very good choices. Yeah, I was wondering if just no pin a card just as a 
backup plan maybe was ever worthwhile but yeah I, you know echo your thoughts not the best choices overall and really slow turn overall from pocket decent amount of value but it's gonna mean hemlock gets to just pile on some of this pressure right now i'm gonna deal significant damage yeah, it is significant damage. Good damage being pushed with the uh, actual Blingtron effect. MC Blingtron, my second favorite MC in this tournament after MC Banterface. You know that got me when I knew it was coming. I still sort of half chuckled to myself. <laughs> Not gonna be a little bit tricky. I mean, again, Krabatoa just seems good, right? To just push reasonable amounts of damage again. Do, will get hold of the board. I think trying to get Astalor down doesn't really scream proactive to me. It goes back to your point about the uh, the inquisitive creation just chilling in hand, though, right? Like if it wasn't there, if that if that safety blanket wasn't there, mm. Hemlock pushed a lot of damage, stuck a nice board, and if you know Mage just kind of had to play into that and not clear it, suddenly you'd be looking at you know a couple of uh, damage discovers from this potion belt, and you might be just pushing lethal for Hemlock. But inquisitive creation is just such a good card for yeah. maintaining control of these things. The crab is gonna come to play. Would you say Krabatoa has been the most impactful Colossus? Now that we're, you know, many, many uh, long time down the line. Impactful? No. Like, yeah, I'm gonna be very pedantic over your choice of words. Like, most, <laughs> shocked. You, most ubiquitous, maybe? Most common? Like, it just, it, it does just seem to show up in just about every rogue deck after time. People sometimes argue about whether or not it should be in some rogue decks, mm. but... I think if you like take a class and say which which colossal gets played the most in their class, then yeah, it's Krabatoa. Does that not make it the most impactful? Possibly if it's in every yeah. deck. Hmm. Yeah. I'm just saying, like the actual impact of it hitting the board on a case by case basis <laughs> is fairly low because it's cheaper than others, right? Which I sure. guess you could. Argue Sorry, with. the way you said that, then talk about words. I'm just thinking like. Does the graphical and sound effect make it hit the board harder than <laughs> some of the other some of the other colossus? It's like I don't know. Ask, go down ask a real one deep of those rabbit hole. Ask one of those various psychopaths that still have screen shake on after this time. Oh, probably the best change to Arston that's ever happened was <laughs> when that option. It, some of the things used to actually make me feel sick. Honestly. If you still have screen shake on, you're a bad person. It's as simple as that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I hate, we just I, being honest. I hate to break it to you. I'm sorry you had to find out this way. <laughs> wow, remember when, uh, who was it yesterday that went fishing needing exactly double damage for lethal and hit it, and then Hemlock needing double damage for lethal got neither of them. Right. Yeah. Does get the consolation prize of draw four, though. It's kind of strange, isn't it? Because we can see that Pocket does not have a high burn aggressive hand. But Hemlock just doesn't know that, right? It's, it's yeah. kind of kind of tricky. Hemlock has a couple of ideas on some of the cards. Obviously, knows the Elemental, knows the uh, Zerus, knows the Infinitires. But other than that, I don't think anything's a sure thing here. But he has managed to build a bit of a board, gain some of that armor as well, which is going to push him up 17, which makes him feel at least half safe, you would say. <laughs> Rag! <laughs> Play it. I mean, come on. Yeah. Take us back to what was it, Worlds 2016? Mm -hmm. I remember there was a really good play in that tournament. I can't remember who it was specifically, but someone represented not having rag for quite a long time to bait the other rag out of the opponent's hand oh, first right. so that they could rag the rag and then just, <laughs> you know, they won rag tennis essentially is what they did. It was really good. As the tournament where we were uh, vibing in the crowd while we were commentating, wasn't mm. it? Good times, good times. 
It didn't feel like good times at the time, but no, yeah, probably was. <laughs> Wish there was some way to know. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the good times before they're over. <laughs> Oh, someone who's not having good times right now is Hemlock, facing down an absolute flurry of elementals. We have plotted long enough. Now it's either that Queen Ashara is the best chance here. It's a Gigafin angle! Yeah. Now is this the most impactful Colossus? <laughs> huh. um, doesn't look great. And also, to... really not a lot of time to make decisions at that point anyway. Not that it probably mattered. And that means Pocket is going to go up 1-0 against Hemlock so far. Uh, again, another victory. Chalk it up for Mage. There you go. But I think really well controlled from both players and um, i think hemlock got away with having those zeros nice and early to be able to just pile on a bit of board pressure but I, I really do just think it was pocket gaining board and having the inquisitive creation in the hand that really sealed the deal because it was just okay hemlock had to fight to get the board back and then pocket could just go okay there you go gone again and i think that really just put enough of a delay on hemlock's plans that pocket could then just do the mage thing right and just get to those late game stages where you can suddenly start pulling uh, rabbit out of hats <laughs> one rabbit one out of multiple hats, hats. Yeah. Yeah. i mean you know if you're gonna be a magician these days you've got to subvert the form to some yeah. extent right so and also yeah. that'd be impressive imagine you line up 10 hats and one rabbit's just jumping through and yeah, yeah. if you pulled the sick. same rabbit out of multi like yeah. genuinely like yeah i'm down mm -hmm. pen and teller make it happen um uh, yeah scramble at the end from hemlock for sure um i do i take your point i think both players really just used the early Xeris minions as soon as they could, right? Like, as soon as they got a thing that did something. I think Pockets ended up being a little more impactful because that uh, reverb on the Putricide and then rush into the Putricide, get a fully stacked potion yeah. on your own side was um, a much bigger swing than Hemlock got from any of his uh, Xeris minions and I think was a large reason why things eventually snowballed in the way for Pocket Train, but... Good, good opening games. Two, uh, two solid players. Long way to go in this one. Pocket Train staying hydrated. It's nice to see, of course. Could still be a long way to go in this one. Mm. Long way to go in this tournament. But he's looking, he's looking energized. He's looking, he's looking youthful, yeah. attentive. He's been a very bitter and jaded man for many an occasion over the last few months. But uh, he's looking good so far. Yeah, I also enjoy that we don't even have to remotely think. Oh, you know what time is it for Pocket? Hmm. You know, how's he, how's he getting on with the time zone? But no, not too much of a big deal for us. Mm -hmm. Hey, that was we get into game two. Pocket gonna jump over to the Shaman, whereas Hemlock's saying it's my turn to play Mage now, and uh, very likely get a win if uh, the weekend's anything to go by. But Pocket will need to pull something out the bag with this Shaman list. But more than capable. <laughs> the same of rabbit off. after it's come out of all the hats, pull it out <laughs> of the bag as well. <laughs> yeah. And then in the end, Bunny Hopper just comes out of the bag, and you're like, "Way! <laughs> didn't, didn't see that coming." Go. And then Bunny Hopper just wins the world championships again, <laughs> despite not being entered. It's just, it's just the hay maze again, isn't it? Brock Lesnar at Money in the Bank. We should have stuck to the office references. Yeah, 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 so... All I know is, ah, oh, wrestling. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> Again, solid start for Pocket Train, just having access to those piranhas. Uh, gives some flexible choices in the early game if Hemlock uh, drops that keyboard. No weapon on two for Hemlock is great news if you are Pocket Train. Uh, I think, obviously, this goes without saying, weapon has a huge impact on uh, most matchups, keyboard that is, on the mage side. Um, but I think against Shaman in particular, they, the difference between a game plan where the mage pressures them early and a game plan where the mage does not pressure them early is just 
phenomenally large and mm -hmm. the way that mage pressures early is almost exclusively with that keyboard so having missed that pocket train now has a lot of luxury to just be getting on with his game plan here yeah i'm just seeing like, some deja vu going on here as i swear those piranhas were dead a second ago um, but yeah, more piranhas back on board for pocket gonna contest once again but this time hemlock has a cold case did have to use that fire cell to be able to clear off the previous push and again i think this is the the respect the players have for this early game right is when pocket just drops three piranhas against mage right early because that's it looks kind of weird maybe if you not played the matchup much or not played the deck much but this forces hemlock into awkward situations luckily for hemlock he's managed to respond reasonably well so far oh there it is at last Yeah, still just about in time, I would say. A little bit awkward yeah. because of the uh, vague anti-synergy with the Chaos Strike. You'd want to play the Cosmic Keyboard first just to get an extra 2 drop from the Chaos Strike, but then to get the damage from the Chaos Strike, a little bit weird. Yeah, I wonder if it's even just get the keyboard loaded and just go Arcane Worm Ping. Like, is that, is that crazy? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think it's crazy. I just think like having the two one on board, utilizing the ping, saving you know, saving the keyboard for maybe something a bit more impactful. I was so I was wondering about this, but I thought this would have a discovery of magic in the turn as well, which apparently it does not. Oh, okay, so Hemlock is actually still going to play the keyboard and probably use an Arcane Bolt to take one of these off the board and just gain an extra one drop, like actual max tempo. Yeah, oh, sure. Oh, okay. okay. I'm fine with that. See, I was thinking this wasn't a keyboard turn and you'd spend that uh, one mana that was just spent on the Arcane Bolt on the Discovery of Magic instead and sure. just try and look for something playable this turn. Um, and then you can potentially still ping off the 3-1 uh, the if you want to, or you might find something uh, more impactful from Discovery of Magic. But yeah, Hemlock just saying, you know what, I don't need massive value uh, from these keyboard charges. I just need stuff on board now. I need pressure now. I need to give Pocket Train some actual questions to answer so he can't just merrily march his way drawing through his deck. Pocket, meanwhile, merrily marches on drawing through his own <laughs> yeah. deck. Well, I'm not going to try and keep up now with that Chaos Strike getting played. There's the creation as well. So now I imagine you really want to play another spell this turn, just so you can uh, get that attack through without costing yourself the, the durability. I could even see this being... Oh, okay. Just oh, yeah, fair enough, sure. sure. I was thinking of whether... Maxitude. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking of just, like, cycle the Viper discovery of magic and then infinitize and just do it that way but yeah whatever works Beow. but this is when games creep up on you because pocket looks like he's falling behind which on board he is but with that card draw focus, with some of the discovers, and you know, with the, the right card drawn here and there, uh, Hemlock could be in a lot of trouble. Because it's that benefit, isn't it, of Clash, that not only does it often push tons of face damage, but it's also clearing the board a lot of the time as well. Yep. Oh, he's going to get the uh, command of Neptulon going to come out and help with this instead. Second Ooh, flash, flash is oh. pretty good. Okay, just going to okay. drop the turn of tides in. Sure, just max tempo. I thought Pocket might just go for a more all-in turn than that, but I think just finding three rush minions off the uh, sure. lightning reflexes, he just decided this was good enough. But uh, Pocket was really one of the first people I saw doing this with the original version of the deck. Well, the original Pocket version of the deck. Lots of people were playing various bad versions of the deck before that. Um, he was kind of the first person I saw doing these kind of mini pop-off turns where you'd actually all in your entire hand, but because you just had Thorim in your hand, it didn't matter. Yeah, Play yeah. the Thorim the next turn and then just redraw like a pretty full hand straight mm -hmm. afterwards. Yeah, I think there was a real temptation to just uh, you know play the Flash that turn and go for that way, right? Because you just think, hmm, next turn could get very interesting. Yeah, I think if you'd have found like 
cheaper nature spells like bolts and crashes you might have seen like the novice zapper novice zapper bolts and crashes turn and then just you know deal whatever 12 to 16 damage to your opponent with whatever you discover and overload for three or four and then just slam the thorum next turn right to, to right. get all those cards back as it happened he discovered board cards so he played board cards Sounds simple when you break it down. <laughs> I feel like creation should be like, I don't know, seven mana at this point. It just always gets the job done. There's Thorum though. Gonna start cycling a ton of cards here for Pocket. Yeah, and this, this is where things start to get spicy, right? When double crash is in hand, lightning bolt there as well. Obviously, the two zaps already on board um, means that they're almost certainly not going to add to any of this potential pressure next turn, but still, it's a lot of power. It is. The issue Pocket has, though, is just no no Jazz Base and uh, Flash of Lightning not really seeming like it's queued up in the near future, right? So... It's hard to convert this hand into any kind of realistic lethal, and if he doesn't start doing that in the next one to two turns, you kind of have to be fearful of the Sith Burst coming back from the other side. Hmm. And luck so far, though, just going to defend, obviously get these spell damage minions off the board, try and be as safe as possible. But again, another um, slow-ish turn. Oh, okay. That is the draw, I think. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. I'm trying to think of a better draw here. Is it deal heal? I'm guessing it's it has deal to be, heal. right? Yeah. I think card draw is not something he uh, overly needs right now. Get double trade minions, deal heal, and then actually just push the damage face to face so you clear up the 3 4. I guess you clear the 3 4, make the 5 7 as annoying as possible. Is that a real thing though against the reverb class? Probably not, but I guess it is just responsible to, to take the trade. I think primarily in this matchup, like you might sit there thinking, oh, draw three is really good, but then your opponent just reverbs you and uses the good ability against yeah, you because it's yeah. still remaining. So you, even if it's not necessarily the best choice for you in the moment, it's very often just correct mm. to do it that way, just to deny the mage access to that ability of their inevitable reverb. Yeah, and I think really for me, it's never a bad choice. It feels like, right? You know, okay, well, not never's a strong word, but you know what I mean, right? It's never terrible to do it, uh, especially if your opponent's got that board. So, yep, looking good overall. Reverb's going to come down, though, no true surprise. I imagine Pocket was uh, expecting this. Mm -hmm. Pew. That is a cast that we've still not really done, isn't it? The uh, full cast being uh, just sound effects made by us. Well, there was the one where they thought that the sound wasn't going out live, and then they did sound effects for the entire time, and then it was going out live, but that was an FGC cast. So. Hmm. Yeah, we've done bits of games before, but not actually like a whole game. Pocket with the flash now. All the cards in the world in his hand. And definitely setting up Lightning Bolt available. Overdraft going to be the choice, though, to help clear out some of that space and some of that mana. And this is terrifying, isn't it? Look at the hand available for Pocket, and Hemlock needs to pull something out of the back. Of the I think that's what Pocket just did then, right? Just raised the hand saying, well, let's see. 
yeah, this is the turn that you like expect to die, right? Where if they've drawn Sif, there's a good chance with 10 mana, Sif kills you. Um, it's not there. Pocket Train, however, does have a different problem to deal with, which Ooh. is the Solid Alibi, which has now come off the Rewind as well. Yeah, and you saw, I think Pocket Train knows, like, okay, they didn't have Sif because I didn't die. So if they're just playing one solid alibi, I'm fine with that. Like, we can wait one turn, and then if they don't draw Sif the next turn, I'm probably still winning the game. When you see right. solid alibi into rewind, then you start to think maybe you might have some long-term issues this game. Yeah, that's really tough, isn't it? Because yeah. it's just that scary moment where you know the, the raw impact of them just drawing the one card they need. And even, as you said, like one turn, even two turns feels scary. Now seeing the card draw on top of that, it's not as if it's just saying, oh, well, two alibis means they draw two cards to try and hit Sif, right? No, because the mage has tons of card draw access anyway. Yeah, you just saw a wisdom come into the hand. Obviously, uh, Volume Up was cast, which can't actually draw Sif, but it thins your deck out, so Sif becomes a more likely draw to follow up. And if you do, if you then play, you know, if you play Volume Up and it puts a zero mana draw two in your hand, that's made right. it exceedingly more likely that you are going to find the Sif. Okay, Altered Chord coming out for Pocket. It's going to help. Is this ever, like, hmm. I think it's like, is this ever just Neptulon to just play it and just threaten a little bit more damage, even if it's two damage next to an extra? I suspect so, yeah. The other option mm. is uh, Zap, just because Zap actually gains you mana, right? Especially because you've actually just equipped a fresh Jazz base. Um, so right. if you then play you know, zero mana for a Zap, that actually gains you one extra mana on the spell discount immediately. That's fair. Um, but I don't think it's required with this hand necessarily. <laughs> Fuck, it's just like, has he got it this time? <laughs> It must be a really tough position. Obviously, we are only in game two. It's not as if the winner of this game is one and moves on to the finals yet. Uh, there is still plenty of time, but it is a, a a rough position to be in. You can see by Pocket's reactions, right? The squinting, he's almost can't even look because any single turn, he may just be dead. And with solid alibis, there's not a lot he can really do about it. <laughs> <laughs> I love the slight delay. It's like, no, 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 no. We can see he's already played Alibi. <laughs> it's like... Finds the uh. second one as well. I'm not going to use the Viper, actually. He just cycles the Viper. I was thinking he needs to kind of get another card out of his hand so he can play the second Wisdom. Yeah. He wants to draw more, but I guess he can still do that on the following turns. It's also whether he wants to forge now. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So at this point, does Pocket have access to anything that can increase his chances of not dying to Sif? I don't think so, right? No, I, I believe think it's just both, a set up and go. I believe both reflexes have been played, mm. which is where you find your altered chords from, so the the life gains out. Yeah, there's Flow Rider. Um, there's one Flow Rider left in the deck, I believe. Flow Rider in the Overdraft and Lightning Bolt, I think. Sounds right. Wisdom. Both players pretty much at the bottom of the deck. Still no oh! Sif. Wait, is there no more card draw? Nope. So it's got to be, what, Infinitize or... But um... like, at that point, you're spending two mana on the Infinitize. You'd be spending more mana on the card draw. Like You, you just still don't have it then, right? So defense. No! Oh, solid alibi again. <laughs> and pockets reaction any second there we go <laughs> oh no <laughs> he's throwing his hands up in the air but in fact he does care Yeah. 
gonna take the flash just for more heal. Inquisitive creation gonna clear the board. Not that it overly matters at this point, I would say, in the game. Yeah, it does find one more card here from the Flash of Light yeah. as well. I mean, with the Viper, it it it's so close. I mean, it just is, right? It's just, it feels just like automatic game, right? Because there's Alibi and a Viper trade with the natural draw and then the turn after even if it's bottom card there's viper trade again yeah you see so you can see two non-viper cards from your deck this turn right yeah. so you have a straight 50 50 of one of those being sif uh you then play solid alibi again this turn but you're still out of card draw so now you have the viper in your deck so now next draw you're actually 66 percent of the time you don't draw sif right because one of those cards is now the viper yeah. but if you get the viper you can trade the viper back in if you spend one mana trading the viper though you can only cast sif and molten rune so uh there's there's this <laughs> you're telling oh, me there's a chance <laughs> Which kind of makes Hellfire here pretty attractive, right? Because you can just burn them down now to the point where just Sif and the yeah, Molten Root yeah, are yeah, lethal. Yeah. As long as Alibi comes out, it doesn't really matter what your health looks like, does it? Oh, wait, didn't actually play the Hellfire? Didn't play the Hellfire, no. Oh, okay. Star Power does a million, but not to face... Problem now, of course, as well, is that there's also just a board on the other side, which uh, Pocket kind right. of has to deal with, or else certainly be dead. Can Pocket afford to crash? I think you just have to. I guess he can't afford not to. But, be precisely, yeah. But, like, I think there should still be enough, right? With the, with the double lightning bolt crash in hand. Okay, so there's the Viper. So this is okay. the exact oh, situation man. I was talking about. Surely. But can't... But there's also... Even if the Viper whiffs, can't, can't it just be Norgon and plus just one? Just Norg plus that, one, yeah. Yeah. Oh, please, ta is this going to be keyboard lethal? With the, the, the deadly voice? <laughs> <laughs> you ever beaten a man to death with a keyboard <laughs> before? Yeah, not a musical one. Oh. <laughs> Is it still in the deck? <laughs> so yeah, we're Norg plus one -ing. Can Pocket make it work? Because the thing with this as well is this means no cold case, right? So no armor gain? Yes. Oh. Deal five? Oh, what? Deal five, reverb, oh, reverb. then plus oh, one sure, sure, to sure. take the damage off the board, sure. Yeah. Which is plus two now, of course. Yep, yeah, yeah, no, good point, good point. That could actually be a massive difference yeah. as well. Yeah, that's just better, right? Like, it's simply as, as a play, leaving just a 1 1 on board. Obviously, the weapon's there as well, but the, the difference between one and two feels the difference between doable and not doable. Yeah. So would this have to be like, oh no, this is just, oh god. So it has to be <laughs> crash again, right? If it's not lethal, like pocket trade is being very careful here that this isn't lethal. Mm -hmm. I don't think it is. And if it's not, then yes, you just have to crash yeah. all of this away and just try and get there with the lightning bolts next turn. So this is guaranteed Sif if Hemlock wants it. But at this point, I don't even know what the, that spell damage is. <laughs> 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 it's actually crazy. What? So now you can you can trade the Viper and then you can get Sif and you can still cast Hellfire and Arcane Bolt. Probably not in that order. Correct, but that would <laughs> still not be enough, right? I really feel like you were supposed to just rip this I, hellfire at some point. 
Yes. Or even... No, gone in five damage to minion, right? Yeah. So there's even... Yeah. But I think if you're going to say Norganon 5 damage to face, you have to be able to tell me how much damage Pocket Train can do from his hand with plus 2 on every card, right? Because if you don't know the answer to that question, you can't take that risk as to whether like true. that extra 3 damage you left up on board ends up killing you that way. Yeah, true. But I think like Hemlock could do that maths, right? Because of yeah. how limited the card pool is. I don't know if yeah. he did or didn't, but I think he could because I don't think there are any huge impacts. I guess there's the one flow rider question mark, right? Yeah, Hellfire. How is this game still going? I, I don't know. So that's the five armor. Surely this is enough, right? Yes. Because there's double bio. A bolt bolt draft, yeah. Yeah, that has to. That's it, right? Yeah, yeah. <sighs> Again, I I know I shouldn't be questioning this like it's not, but it's with the way this game's gone, I'm shook. I'm just like, I don't know how it's... It's like, neither does Pocket. Look, he's like, I don't even know how I won this game of Hearthstone right now. Hemlock with a Sith that just doesn't want to come out to play. That is brutal. That honestly, huge win for Pocket, of course, but I feel really bad for Hemlock because that felt like one of the roughest games of Hearthstone I've seen in a long time. But it is one of those moments where there'll be a lot of opportunity to rewind that game and take a look at different moments like as you were talking about i think the biggest question was i think the norganon turn was very good to get the plus two but could it have been a five to face reliably that's the question or was there a spot to get the hellfire in and still say yes they can't kill me with whatever norganon one or norganon two whatever it ends up being so i think there were moments there for hemlock and, and no doubt hemlock will do this at some point is look back on that game and see if something could have changed but either way super unlucky to have sif just stick to the bottom of the deck yeah i think hemlock played the version of the game that you win as long as sif isn't your last card and isn't found off any of the viper trades mm. throughout the course of the game perfectly the yeah. problem, the question is, can you also find a line that wins that game where it's the last right. card as well? And I feel like the answer to that question is yes. Um, and again, like we came into this one, I certainly came into this one um, talking about how we could be seeing the highest level series of Hearthstone that we see all weekend, all year potentially as well with how good these two players have been. So those are the standards that you have to hold people to. Uh, so, yeah, really, really intense game right the way down to the, the finest razor wire in the end. Yeah. You can see the reaction from Pocket Train. What, four <laughs> solid he was alibis? Dead 20 minutes ago. <laughs> four solid alibis <laughs> yeah. he had to plow through in the end? Like, yeah. absolutely absurd Oof. stuff. And again, this has been a consistent story of the tournament. Like, sometimes just through Pocket Train being really good at the deck, and sometimes just through a little bit of good fortune pocket train is getting shaman through the series and other right. players are not and that right now is the big difference as to why he's now heavily favored to make it to the final and a lot of other players who have brought shaman have been struggling a lot more yeah for sure and the player's not wasting Woo! any time that <laughs> you okay rick rick <laughs> wait what yeah flare oh <laughs> yeah, that's all I heard. So I was like, right. Like, no, yeah, the change uh, casting partner. I, uh, not really an association I want these days, Raven. Just to no, uh, but the know. noise is the noise. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But yeah, diving straight in. Pocket could tidy this match with a quick, th well, quick in air quotes. Three, three zero. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like that last game really uh, took it out of us all. It could be moving on to the finals if you can just make it work with this mech rogue hemlock though Ooh. on the maids just needs to hold off and hope uh, this game goes a little bit better than the last one and we are landing a mimiron beautiful stuff obviously even if this gets reverbed the board is clear so you still get to play a full turn of hearthstone with mimiron in play and you will take that any day of the week and twice mm -hmm. on sunday and fortunately today is sunday <laughs> oh 
But what else can you do? Yeah, this is definitely a tricky one here as Pocket starts to really develop on the board. And he's uh, planning to cause some havoc. Prep, Spark Bot, you've got Wind Fury. <laughs> you've got all the reborn <laughs> yeah. in the world. Yeah. This whole game's going to reborn at this point. Look at the like the amount of things that are happening here for turn three. It's gonna give it reborn again. Oh, that's okay. Oh. I like that. That's kind of cool. I promise you, I wouldn't have seen this play, and I don't know why, because it's really obvious now. But I promise you, I never would have done yeah. this. I I would have just dealt the damage and just. Oh, moved they'd on have been wind fury in the in the head like yesterday. Yeah, but like mm -hmm. this is so clearly better. <laughs> Screw you, Pocket Train. Why are you better at Hearthstone than me? <laughs> And this is, this is the problem because at this stage in the game, Mage just doesn't have the capability to do as much stuff as Pocket Train just did, right? Yeah. So yeah. His, that's the problem for Hemlock. Like, he, Hemlock can have a decent turn, right? Has keyboard, has a void uh, scripture, but that is not enough. And that's the big problem here. Volcano Mancy, though, is something to consider. Yeah, that is definitely a card yeah. in this scenario. So. <laughs> But how would you, like, would it be like keyboard or the elemental? Oh wait, no, he's got the mana. For some reason, I didn't think he had the mana for it. Okay, perfect. <laughs> yes, by definition of the card, he has the mana left to play the card that just activated. Yes. Yeah. It's why that reborn is just so clever, right? Like, yeah. trade off and just spend the last mana on on the reborn again, and like now you just have. Giga Whatever. Wind Fury mech coming yeah. down this turn, right? Like, it's just so smart. Yeah. Oh, reborn again. Really wants to keep rolling for mana cheat. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the one you want. You want the preps. You can just keep on playing these mechs. Yeah, and there's that way. I think, again, he's crossed the line where there's no point with uh or overly worrying about the um the stealth one because he has cloak field anyway but even if he didn't i think <laughs> seven health is fine right of just saying you could just push the damage anyway and suddenly hemlock is in a disastrous state right now with just 10 damage uh, with Fiori Mimmer on. embers is a card it says taunt on it you're not wrong i believe that is what it says Yeah, and just get just pay the artificer behind it for uh, some armor. <laughs> and looks like I wish it cost two. <laughs> and I think you double. get a sap. Yeah, and wow. you get a sap. Maximum damage coming through from Mimorons. Really, really beautifully played. Like this seems straightforward. This entire game seems trivial. This game was losable. You had to get turn four right, and Pocket Train absolutely did get turn four right, right in a way that was basically unbeatable, I think, overall. So in the end, what I hyped up as potentially one of the closest, tightest series ended up being the second freest 3-0 that we've seen all day <laughs> since Man City at Old Trafford. So, sorry, I guess we underdelivered. Yes and no, because I will say that the, the Shaman versus Mage game, uh, where Pocket just somehow beat that many alibis because of, you know, one, Pocket's you know, good play, of course, but also just Hemlock's like slight luck factor, or lack of it, should I say, when it comes to drawing Sif. I think that one game really sums up the uh, the potential of these two players because it was so close so many times yes game three looked one-sided and it was but again echoing your thoughts i think uh pocket played it very well with those reborn trades getting the maximum value out of what he had available to him but yeah a series that doesn't look close score wise but had some very very close moments and i think that's just you know a shout out to both pocket and hemlock at how good both of these players have been all year so it's a shame to see hemlock lose but that's the nature of these top fours right someone has to lose someone has to go on to the finals and that is going to be 
pocket train. We're doing it all over again, Sol. <laughs> Yeah, making his second final of the year, um, and as mentioned, like Pocket is joint top of the overall standings, which means um, in these tournaments, as each individual player gets eliminated, they start rooting for Pocket Train, particularly if they're <laughs> European, because you know if, you, if Pocket gets an actual automatic spot to Worlds through winning, that opens up another point standings in the, the last chance mm -hmm. qualifications uh, for all the players behind. There's a few relationships like that going on in the tournament right now, like Weeku and Banterface was a similar yes. thing with the head-to-head the -head that they had with them both being fighting for America's spots. So. Yeah, Pocket Train, second bite of the cherry, second final out of three available so far this year. You know, leader of the point standings. He's 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 a player. Let's let's just put it that way. He knows what he is doing with a Hearthstone board in front of him. Well, we have got two more matches left today. We've got semi-final two, and then of course the finals to decide our champion. So make sure you don't go anywhere. There's just a little bit more Hearthstone left for the day. We're going to go to a break and we'll be right back with semi-final number two. Reborn again. Oh, that's okay. Oh, I like that. That's kind of cool. I promise you, I wouldn't have seen this play, and I don't know why, because it's really obvious now. But I promise you, I never would have done this. I I would have just done the damage. And oh, they'd have been with
Hello everyone and welcome back to the Masters Tour. We have semi-final number two coming up to see who's going to face off against Pocket Train in the final. I am still here, but I'm now joined by Idlevice. Welcome. Uh, I know you were just watching that semi-final. What did you think of it? What do you think of the quick 3-0 from Pocket? I, I mean, I just about blinked and missed it. You know, after the, <laughs> the series that TJ and I cast, I was ready to settle in, you know, watch another five game set. Nope. Pocket's just like, get in, get out, get on with it. Yeah, it was, it was really incredible and I'm really looking forward to it because I will not be casting the finals. I get to just put my feet up and enjoy as a spectator. But for now, we like I said, we have to decide who is going to be facing Pocket in that finals. It's going to be McBannerface versus Balance. Uh, so going to be a really spicy one. Again, so much on the line, so much work all year gone into this for these players to get to this like sort of one, two matches away from just a world championship direct invite, which has got to be the dream, right? To just say, we don't have to worry about points anymore. All that goes out the window. I'm just going. That's what these players really want. Yeah, absolutely. I think for every single one of them, it, just, it would be a huge relief if you could just focus on practicing for Worlds generally, rather than trying to grind out mm -hmm. for the points to get there. Yeah, and the Bannerface had a really uh, spicy matchup against uh, Weeku with some very surprised moments earlier on. Uh, because, the, again, we've seen this throughout the day because th this sort of that, natural... That um, oh, I'm, I'm myself I twice, there that. we go. Um, <laughs> because we can, uh, we, we've been seeing a lot of Mage and Shaman, both decks have the burst potential that you see a lot of these players going, oh, I can't kill them, I'm probably dead. And then they don't die, and then it's got to be, you know, okay, suddenly what's the recovery looking like? And at least there's <laughs> some really, really uh, out there. Uh, matchup. So we are going to check in uh, with McBannerface's Mage. Probably, you know, we're not going to talk about Warrior yet, but um, Mage, probably the, the star of the show this weekend. Absolutely. Yeah, Mage has been sort of that number two deck, both in terms of players who brought it and in terms of performance for a lot of folks. Uh, Rogue, another strong performer, but uh, Mage is really just this one deck, whereas, you know, Warrior and Rogue are kind of split between, you know, Enrage and Odin, or Mech and Secret. Mage is, is just Rainbow Mage, uh, except for CJ Kaka on the Naga Mage, the one player. And, yeah, it's been, you know, it's been holding up. Yeah, I'm just looking at the uh, bans for this match, and um, I, I think... It, we, we were told it was double warrior uh, it, sorry there were no warrior bands but i actually think there might be a warrior band so we'll see that soon we'll, we'll see the outcome of that in the near future but on the other side of course we've been talking a lot about McBannet face but balance has been the one uh, wielding the dreaded control priest um the the deck archetype that haunts my nightmares after uh after certain, you know, Grandmaster stints in the European region that seemed endless at times with a lot of Control Warrior mirrors. But we will not get the mirrors in this. I do believe there's Shaman banned out uh, from McBannerface and the Enrage Warrior from Balance has been banned out as far as, I'm, uh, as far as I believe. So we won't be seeing the Enrage Warrior, but if McBannerface is going to win, we're going to see some of that Odin Warrior. Yeah, and I think that may be a nod to Koich thinking that, you know, on this priest, if it does end up having to face the Odin warrior, there are a limited number of minions in that deck. So there's an opportunity to just go for multiple copies of Dirty Rat and, and going into that mm -hmm. turn eight or whenever feels the opportune time, just being able to snipe it out of the opponent's hand. And at that point, you've got plenty of ways to just run the warrior out of stuff. Yeah, it's very interesting, isn't it? Because like the Odin Warrior has a lot of control aspects of, you know, older control warrior archetypes, but it really does just have that now I kill you sort of button, which is Odin, right? You play that and suddenly control goes out the window, it's face, face, face uh, damage. So it'll be very interesting to see if there's any way to recover if that matchup happens and if those dirty rats can start causing some shenanigans. So it's going to be a cool matchup because I've not cast Warrior at all all weekend so at least <laughs> you know i get to cast maybe some form of warrior uh, before i go uh, but gonna be pretty interesting with this lineup overall because one thing that surprised me was balance is bringing rainbow mage makes sense it's extremely powerful as we've seen 
a rogue, secret rogue at this point, but still the rogues have been doing well overall. Enrage Warrior, it's one of the two extremely good warrior decks. But then the Control Priest, right? It's like, <laughs> it's not like there was some out there lineup that, you know, Control Priest really benefited from. So what do you actually make of just, it looks like a, it, I don't mean this as it sounds, but it looks like a real lineup, and then you just stuck Control Priest on the end for balance. Like, do you like this, uh, Adwes? I mean, I think it's got to be some kind of a comfort pick or something in my mind, because it, there doesn't seem to be a particular strategy built around the Control Priest. You know, it's not like you're assembling a control lineup or anything, uh, certainly with the Enrage Warrior over the... Uh, over the Odin Warrior. So, mm. it, it, yeah, it is a bit of a, an unusual pick here in balance, but it's also, it's built in a slightly unusual fashion. It's very uh, targeted in terms of, you know, all these tech cards and things, and yeah. there's no extra value, no ETC, no Svalna. So really not built for the mirror. I think balance was relieved not to have to play out that <laughs> yeah. mirror because as uh, were we all <laughs> <laughs> well in terms of you know just competition terms uh it would have had a slight disadvantage in terms of value mm. going into ko's voyage's version well here we go game one already underway again if you were just joining us the winner of this goes on to face pocket train in the finals with a world championship spot on the line bank face going to be on the mage and we're going to see this priest nice and early and how do you feel this priest does versus the mage um is it yeah you talked about dirty rat and it has the you know the potential to actually pull sif and maybe kill it as well uh, which is obviously a big deal but do you think balance has to go to that level of extreme to win this matchup or do you think he can do it let's say fair and square I mean, it's very hard as the priest with your limited number of tempo tools to actually just try and, you know, win out that way. It's not really the game that a control priest is playing. So, in a sense, you, you sort of have to just deal with every threat that the mage has to offer. And that is very challenging against this particular mage, which is so filled with value. I mean, we see infinitize the maxitude uh, is just infinite value potentially yeah, literally infinite <laughs> depending, on, depending on how you play it out yeah ignis is a way that you can uh get there with pressure though yeah as usual and as it has often been the case with a lot of control priests in the past as well is there's not not a lot of standard ways to win certain matchups, but there's a lot of weird ways to win certain matchups. Even if you look at cards such as uh, identity theft as well, right, and things like that can can sort of create odd conditions for you to actually steal wins. So, and, and again, I think you're exactly right where this must be some level of comfort pick for balance and if you're that comfortable with a deck that has to create weird win conditions a lot of the time you're going to be used to it so i think that's definitely going to go in his favor for this one but mcbanterface just playing like the raw good deck it gives me a lot of confidence in him for this game yeah and although no keyboard in hand for banter being able to go coin cold case into second cold case is always just a lot of pressure you know you force out that shard of naru because priests don't want to have to deal with all that extra chip damage from killing the skeletons and balances in a position where you know you can go for a big draw turn here but uh, not necessarily the uh, cleanest clears besides I think it's always a question of when you do actually go for the dirty rat in this matchup is probably the right. toughest thing because there's a lot of minions that you don't really want to hit yeah it's definitely tricky isn't it because there's not even the, the other than just letting the game go on and knowing that your opponent say has had five cards in hand for the last five turns let's say there's no signifier, right? There's no often not a setup turn that makes it obvious that they're about to do something. So it, it, it can be really, really difficult uh, to, to try and time this against, at least against Sif specifically. Yeah, definitely. And you have to kill it in the same turn or silence it because silence it. <laughs> otherwise it is immediate death. <laughs> otherwise, uh, you've just done them a favor. <laughs> like, yeah. I think it's like one of the tough ones because I would say versus the warrior, you would just play rat before turn eight. 
right and oh, just yeah. not let them drop it on curve potentially and that's that's just straightforward because they want to play it asap whereas that is obviously not the case with sif so you know very very tricky overall Yeah, the warrior both has fewer misses in terms of there's fewer minions overall. You know, they've built a deck around Chorus Riff and a limited number of minions so that Chorus Riff has higher odds of drawing Odin. Or if you miss on mm -hmm. Odin, it draws Finley, and then you flip your deck upside down to, to pick up that Odin. And, uh, you know, it, it is better the earlier you play it with Odin. Sif is not that way. Sif, a lot of times, is better the later you play it. Uh, in some sex, you know, apart from winning the game earlier, you do need right. to power it up and that can take time. So in this matchup, a lot of times as the mage, you're kind of happy if you don't pick up Sif until the turn, you're actually going to play it for the win. Yeah, and then that goes to an extreme and you're called Hemlock and you never pick up Sif, even though there's only one card left in your deck, <laughs> uh, which is what we saw a little bit earlier. Although very you know. likely against a priest, <laughs> that would be a perfectly fine situation. Yes. Yes, true, true. Yeah, and this is one of those weird spots for balance where, and, and again, this has often been the case for Priest, where it's just like, it's not really a lot to do. You've got nearly, you've got plenty of cards in hand, but because so many of them are like semi situational, it's just like, huh, I guess, do, do I just pass? Even you could see him hovering the dirty rat. And yeah, he's going to go for one. Probably hits a creation, yeah. Again, you'd be reasonably happy with this outcome, right? Uh, creation, definitely one of the more annoying cards to try and deal with. Yeah, it's just such a powerful board swing, you know, only having to spend four mana on the clear and, and then being able to develop whatever you want on the other Ooh. side and having a 3-4 as well. I think especially with, yeah, picking up the Ignis off the creation instead of more Dirty Rats. It's just kind of more reliable in terms of making things awkward for the mage. Mm. But Banderface now does have a pretty reasonable amount of health to sort of chunk through here with this 4-7 Dirty Rat, right? And normally when you see a Dirty Rat come down, you're like, nah, whatever. You know, it doesn't do much, <laughs> you know, once it's had its ability done, of course. But this is a significant minion that Banderface is going to have to push through. I think one of the reasons it's, you know, almost an auto include in so many lists is it, it, it pairs very well with the location. So sometimes, mm. you know, when you do just play it out early for either hand space or, you know, you're up against something where there's not really bad hits and you just want a big taunt, uh, getting that plus two power, plus one toughness uh, really makes things challenging for your opponent to trade into. Rewind, never a bad pick to look at. Gifts of Ashara's fine, but I do think overall Rewind is going to be more tempting here for Bants. Yeah, the card draw is a, a bit limited at present, so you're maybe even looking for Wisdom of Norganon. Hmm. Or another cold case, you know, those always feel pretty solid. <laughs> That's a pretty good pickup for balance, though. What mana weapon would you take here? Five? It's always ten. <laughs> always ten. No matter what, it's always ten. I I remember I this might have been in the theory casting that we did. Uh well, that is ten. When, when we were talking about Ignis, uh, me and Saul, I remember saying, Yeah, look at the ten weapons, it's always ten. So I was like, no, no, anything that's made a weapon, it's always the, you know, anything that discovers like a, a build and build a card is always ended up being the cheapest is the best. I was like, no, no, it's always going to be 10. And for once in my life, it kind of worked that it was in fact always 10s, especially pre-nerf. And I think especially in, in Priest, you know, where you do often have the resources to, to get to that 10 mana. And, I mean, look, we've picked up a Wind Fury armor weapon, I think. So, you know, fantastic combination, both just for damage and uh, getting 16 armor every turn that that's in play is just massive in terms of putting this wall between yourself and, and the Sif lethal. Uh, it's not... You know, that's one of the ways where you don't need mm -hmm. something like a Dirty Rat on Sif, is where you just gain so much armor that it's, it's impossible for 
a mage to get there without being able to sick a boar. Yeah, it's kind of interesting as well. Like, obviously, mage draws a very increased uh, rate, but even with balance drawing plenty of cards themselves, they're still nowhere near worrying about fatigue, right? Still, what, four cards behind um, a banner face at this point? So, you know, all the card drawer as well is just going to help give them some more options as they uh, check out this uh, discover. Surely you want Dirty Rat, right? At the top. Yeah, I mean, with already one Ignis in reserve and a powerful 10 mana weapon available. Yeah. Weirdly enough, I feel like there is such a thing as too much value. <laughs> Doesn't happen often, but it does happen. There's Sif. Yep. Okay. Four minions in hand, so pretty good odds if Balance does just decide to go for a, a Dirty Rat play next turn alongside... I don't know if you would play Behemoth just because you don't need the healing, but... Yeah, I, I mean, I think stage one is play the Dirty Rat and see what happens, right? Right, like yeah. Because uh, as you said, it'll be Shadow Word or Shard of the Narrow to silence the Sith if it hits uh, one way or the other. But if not, yeah, I think just filling out the turn's probably good. Because I do think the Behemoth it, at this kind of stage is more a big minion then would you really save it for heal, right? You right. play it more as just a big threat as opposed to saying, oh, well, they'll get me a bit low and then I'll just heal. It's like, well, a bit low might just be dead against mage, <laughs> so. Okay, I'll strike being the choice there from a banter phase, like just adding to the potential overall damage output. Oh, and going for a very early reduction now, having already gotten the Sif in hand, so. Yeah, I mean, when I talked earlier about are there any signals for Sif? That's probably one of them, if you're going to get one, right? Do you see the damage, uh, the, sorry, the cost reduction come out? I think that if there's ever a time to snap dirty, right, it's probably now. Well, that may be why Banter went for the fire spell there, you know, both because uh, it, it maybe signals, oh, I'm, I'm not quite ready, right? I'm having mm. to spend a fire spell. And also because if their dirty rat is played, there's, you know, a one, two in hand that you don't mind. It's just getting uh, ratted right. into play. Yeah. I think this is really good because you could always say, oh, it could have saved it for more damage. It's like, well, it won't be any damage if Sif gets pulled, right? So, yeah, I'm completely with you. I think adding an extra minion to the hand, because if you look at the, the burst potential anyway, it's pretty high as it is. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I like this from Balance going in on the uh, identity theft first. Just to, to yeah, take, a peek, take a peek at the hand. You yeah. know, if you see that there's a safe there, certainly you go in on the Dirty Rat right now. Yeah, just a quick lean to see your opponent's hand, see what's going on, or at least bits of it. Yeah, he's going to go with a Behemoth instead. Does remove the, uh, you know, it, it's not healing, but it does remove an amount of damage, right? Like preemptively almost by killing this off. Yep. That's just another thing that has to be dealt with. I think Balance wants to feel safe going into this turn 10. Like thinking, okay, I'm a very unlikely dead from 35 if my opponent just played one of their zero mana burn spells. And... I want them to have to deal with this board so that I can play my runic hammer and, and just start mm -hmm. gaining 16 armor every single turn. And this is getting pretty close. This is going to be arcane ball. Yeah. So what's that? Is there three arcane bolts in the hand, I think? Yeah. Yep. Two of which cost zero, so. Yeah. Oh, but holy, <laughs> holy spells. Uh, the second oh, one is free, wow. I suppose. There's the elemental, um, not el elemental inspiration, inquisitive creation. There's too many of these uh, similar-ish words. Come on. And for those wondering why Banter might have uh, taken Garden's Grace there, I think it was it was just a matter of discovery of magic. If you only have one spell school left that you haven't played, you don't have a choice. Yeah, it, it kind of is what it is. <laughs> like, you can't really uh, be fussy when there's only one option. Wow. Suddenly, like, this... Is this Dirty Rat or Dead at this point, I think? 
I mean, uh, it's a tough call because at 35 plus the 16, you know, it sounds pretty healthy, but that's a lot of damage with the reverb. Right, yeah. It's just the fact that you know there's a reduction on at least, you would guess at least a couple of cards, right? Because the reduction came down and it, um, it, it wouldn't have it wouldn't have happened right if they was hitting like one spell right like banner face would not have, have reduced one spell down so we'll and there's to see a, what the outcome is here for balance there's a forged rune as well so even if you don't know about you know the reduced reverb there is the factor yeah, of, you saw the forge yeah. yeah you saw the forge so if you're playing around molten rune and you know a couple of arcane bolts you know there's an extra one from the void scripture right so yeah, ben, ben, sorry, yeah, I just was looking at Banderface's response to <laughs> yeah, the arm yeah, and was yeah. like, no. It might still be enough with the reverb. I'm trying to think. You I can't play both reverb and the molten rune. Yeah, I feel like if it was enough, balance would already be dead. So I'm <laughs> I, assuming that it is not enough. I, he's counting it out. It might be just shy. I don't know from that <laughs> that expression. <laughs> This is how I work out lethals um, when casting. If the player hasn't locked it in when it's just like this spell damage minion plus burst, then it's not lethal. That, that's that's the, the, the way I approach these things a lot of the time. Mainly the issue we've got is I can't quite see what um, Sif's at. Yeah, I mean, I think it's everything but holy, but I, I don't recall the max number you can have. The problem is that if he waits a turn... There's there's just seven, more then, yeah. armor. Okay, yeah, 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 seven. So you reverb because mm -hmm. it's always dead anyway. So that's plus 14 spell damage, which means each of these is 17. Wait, why does my banner face look like it's he's exact surprised lethal. at this outcome? Yeah, it's exact lethal. Didn't has my banner face let my strategy down? Oh no. <laughs> I, yeah, I think he yeah. I, I think this I think this reaction and the fact he's gonna get up and just have a moment here really sums this up because I respect McBanner face a lot as a player, and I would have assumed that even after the armor swing, that McBanner face would have just known how much damage he could do, right? Just straight off the bat, before the turn even happened from balance, he would have said, at this moment with this hand, I have X amount of damage. Uh, so I was really surprised, and that's why I was saying, if he's not locked it in, I just assume it's not lethal because surely he would have counted, but I think that it's that moment where there's so much pressure and you know, even with players that are as seasoned as McBanterface, there's got to be that thought in your head that goes, I need to count this again, and I need to count it again, and then count it again, because you think, if I mess this up and lose this game, that could be the difference between a world championship spot and not. So yeah, I think at that moment, he was kind of half surprised that it was just lethal, but still, congratulations. What a, what a weird ending to that game. <laughs> Uh, to be completely honest, you know, had it had it been me playing there, I almost would have just gone in because I know if that weapon gets to attack again, there's there's no way you're overcoming, you know, an additional 32 armor over the next two turns. So, uh, yeah, just going for it at the end, whether he he double checked his his work and and realized or or just knew that he had to go in, uh, yeah, exact lethal. <laughs> Yeah, really, really big win there from a banner face because that started to slip away, as you mentioned, right? With the um, uh, with the Ignis weapon, suddenly that's a way that priests can, even without dirty rat, actually stabilize and feel some level of safety. Uh, but yeah, banner face got through there, so there's a loss for the priest for balance. But banner face getting the mage over the line, uh, but there's still plenty more to uh, to go where that came from because there's. Like I've been saying all weekend, I feel like any player who gets to play Mage in a match should win, right? At some point, like Mage shouldn't be the deck that causes them trouble. Uh, so yeah, we'll have to see how the rest of this matchup goes, but what a close start to this series. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Priest is a deck that you're always giving your opponent time. And so uh, Mage usually just has more options the longer the game goes. I think it's it's really just mm. that big weapon that can sometimes shut the door. But turn 10 is very, very long time.
to give the mage, as very frequently it's it's on 10 mana where they do kill you. Yeah, I feel like that matchup is just all about timing, right? Because you can see, oh, well, what if a dirty rat came down earlier, you know, to try and get the Sif? Or what if maybe there was a one turn delayed from a banter face, so suddenly the weapon could swing again? Then we play a completely different game of Hearthstone, and things look very, very different overall. So I think there is, or, or that was clearly, just that sweet spot of it's just in time to push that damage. Because any later, and it would have been game over, I think from a banner face, but also any earlier, like before the weapon gets to swing, there was a chance that a banner face could kill them then, right? So those like yep. just really, really clear timings are very, very difficult to sort of guess at when you're in that position. But without further ado, we're getting into game number two. And banner face jumping onto the warrior, one of the uh, the rarest classes uh, seen <laughs> out in the wild this weekend, going up against this priest once again. I've got a funny feeling, I advise that bounce is going to stick on priest till he wins with it or goes home. I mean, I can respect that, right? It's it's sort of <laughs> the deck that you just like, all right, this one I, I need to get a win with. It is, it is the one, you know, potential awkward or weak link. And, you know, I, again, I feel like it must be a comfort pick if you've brought it. So... Yeah. So, in this matchup, if the Odin doesn't happen would you say it's very likely to just be game to balance is that is that as as if we were going to oversimplify the matchup would you agree i think i would agree because you know there's two ways there's there's a late odin and there's a dirty ratted odin and uh, certainly the dirty ratted odin is, is just very unlikely you're going to get there it kind of comes down to ignis weapon at that point. I mean, in, in sort of both situations, it comes down to Ignis weapon. I think you're mm -hmm. you're looking for that wind fury, at least in the case of a late Odin. Sometimes you can set up situations where you get that wind fury weapon and you just sort of save it until you finally throw down Odin and you get to just multiply your armor cards, in particular, the, the tradable ones that you've maybe been holding on to this whole time and furiously trading to look for that Odin. <laughs> But if it gets dirty, rat, it's it's tough times for the warrior. Yeah. Well, let's see how it goes. Here is Balance. Uh, so that's to try and get going here with the priest, of course. Just gonna go uh, forge that creation protocol and just start the the slow build up, right? Uh, just build up all the resources again. I think we saw it in the previous game, right, where there was what three or. I think there was only three locations on board at the same time for balance, right? Just, you know, build that, sort of preload that value. Uh, and there is Love Ever's last in as well, available in hand. It looks like it's going to get dropped down on curve. But yeah, just getting everything set up. But again, a lot of the game will revolve around how this Odin makes an appearance. Yeah, and once again, I think the best time to draw Odin in this matchup is on turn eight. <laughs> as soon as you are on eight mana, if it comes into the hand then, because there's there's no way for the priest to sort of steal it away from you then. And we're not seeing the discovers here, but I imagine as the priest we're going for a five. Well, this is another matchup where you can go for a 10, assuming the Odin doesn't come down terribly early, and out-armor what the warrior is able to uh, present in terms of damage. Having a little bit of technical difficulties in terms yep. of not seeing the discovers and yeah, luckily uh, we'll find out quickly and, and we, we have a rough guess as to what balance will want <laughs> right yeah. uh, generally speaking oh actually went for a five so went for an uncurve play okay well, i guess it's not always 10 i'm slightly upset <laughs> i mean there's not a lot of fives in the deck I, I feel like it is frequently five or ten with the caveat that if there's a, something that needs to be addressed immediately you take a one Right, if you're in a very aggressive matchup, like frequently against Mech Rogue, you do ones looking for poisonous deal damage.
I would say the premium five in this circumstance would be Wind Fury and Summon a four drop. Yeah, I would say so. Just pressure, 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 right? You're trying to get hold of that board. Do you have this in a bigger size? There is Banter's Ignis, which is another thing that you don't terribly want to get dirty ratted. Yeah. It's tricky, though, because like you said, that it's not like there are hundreds of minions in the deck, right, from a banter face to try and clog the hand on purpose to try and dodge it because he does need to be uh, proactive himself. I see second Ignis come down now, so... Again, we'll discover the discover when we see it. <laughs> well, yeah, I do have some uh, discover... I think it's just the spectator discover bug that happens sometimes. It does go for a 10 the second time round, which makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And... If I'm banter phase here, you know, this isn't really pressure. You're not terribly worried about pressure from the priest, but you do maybe want to just go ahead and forge and play your own Ignis. Try and look for that Wind Fury weapon. And in the case of the warrior, you're happy to take ones because all you really care about most of the time is having that Wind Fury tag. These priests do tend right. to run Viper, so you can't really expose your weapon by picking a 10. Decisions, decisions from a man of face here. Really tricky because there, there are just a lot of options, even with this Finley, right? It's like, oh, do I leave the Finley in hand to try and cause shenanigans that way? Um, do you want to play Finley to just cycle through or, or sort of reverse cycle the deck? It's kind of tricky, but they just go for the board presence instead. It's going to say, you know what? Forget about Odin for now. I'm going to go for plan A, which is just beat my opponent up. Yeah, and there are, you know, a few of these board building cards available to the warrior. The primary one being uh, this this riff, the bridge riff. Although Banter did forego a minion draw there by, by taking this route, since mm -hmm. the bridge riff was not finaled, uh, to get the, the double meant losing out on replaying a chorus riff. We do get to see this five mana weapon, uh, which is the deal for and life seal, just to keep balance topped off in the mid-game here. When does this Prison of Yogg come into play? My question. <laughs> when are we going to start seeing fireworks? <laughs> you know, th this used to be, I think, just a regular Yogg pre-balance pre patch, but uh, right. <laughs> has, has since been swapped back for the Prison as just uh, sometimes you need an X-Factor. And I suppose that's uh, something I, I hadn't listed because I uh, I'm not really a, a prison of Yogg-Strong player myself, but, uh, you know, every once you in a while. Be, <laughs> you have to be a true believer to play that card. You have to just close your eyes, press the button, and go. We've had quite a few believers this tournament. There is the Wind Fury. On the second one, we'll get to see what mana cost was picked, and it is the one mana. So mm -hmm. that is the optimal weapon for the warrior. <laughs> yeah, you see the thumbs up from Banter there. Even the gain two armor, I think. Yeah, why not, right? I I guess that the pause here is, does Banter want to use it to actually just draw cards because he doesn't have Odin yet, right? Is there a world where he actually wants the card draw to be able to just use it to try and get to that win condition? Or is he saving the weapon for the win condition? Yeah, I mean, there, that's a possibility. There's always the option as well of just like, well, I'm going to take some time so my opponent doesn't know that I got the best weapon possible. Uh, right. And, you know, then you maybe just hold on to this, go for turn nine, you Finley, and try and play Odin that same turn. And yeah, this Oof. is go time for the Dirty Rats from Balance. Yeah. Well, there goes the Finley. But Banterface will be very happy to see, especially if there's a second one getting played now. Yeah, pulling no minions. Yep. Balance gets the bad news. You know, still a good position on board, but board is kind of irrelevant for most, if not all, of <laughs> of this matchup for these two decks. Yeah, it's like, oh, Banterface is like, oh, I can use my removal cards now. <laughs> Perfect. 
Yeah, this would now be the perfect time to draw Odin. And not only is it exactly uh, on curve, but also just seeing those dirty rats get played out. But not going to be drawn quite yet. I almost wonder at, at what point you prison for card draw. <laughs> well, I think, you know, the, the shield block in hand, right? Like, th there is the, well, there's maybe the weapon. I'm not sure exactly the outcome of what the weapon was after what I imagine was Wind Fury. Yeah, but it all in... depends on what Banterface, or where Banterface feels he, he is in this matchup, right? After seeing those rats. Is, is this just like, oh, well, you know, as long as there's no crazy disaster that comes out, I'll be fine. Or yeah. is it I still have to get a lot of work done? I think Banter can expect that the 10 mana weapon is, you know, what's waiting in the wings here, right? Having seen the 5 come down, you figure, all right, there is going to be a 10 mana weapon to contend with. My opponent still has coin. So being a little conservative with the removal, just using the trial by fire, saving the blade storm uh once again like you know board usually not super impactful so just trying to conserve as many resources as possible one thing i will say is my face looks pretty relaxed at this point in the game Okay, I mean, not he's... the most emotive of players but also just the fact that he's just sat, sat back and thinking yeah it's fine we'll get there I mean, apart from, you know, not getting the opportunity to Finley, he has dodged the big hurdle, which is getting dirty ratted going into your turn eight. Uh, and now it's just a matter of making sure that Odin is, you know, somewhere in the next, in the top half of his deck. Well, I, I was going to say that is a potential problem, right? Because with Finley being gone now, because it, that did get pulled by dirty rat, there's no mm -hmm. like, uh, oh, well, it's not in this. Oh, there it is. Never mind. Um, <laughs> it's not in this part of the deck. I'll search for the bottom half, right? Uh, but obviously now with Odin coming out, yeah, Banner giving the nods. He is <laughs> quite happy about the outcome of this so far. And we might see fireworks next turn, put it that way. Yeah, the strike from history being used from Amanthul means that there is some other removal that has to be played. So no coin weapon from balance, even if there were some good defensive options. I can see there's Wind Fury on that Runic Great Hammer. I'm not sure if uh, there is the 8 armor again, which would have been mm -hmm. something that balance is looking for. But yeah, now balance is very much on the back foot. And that Viper does not do anything to this... One mana wind fury weapon uh, as long as it it comes down the turn that lethal is happening yeah that's the benefit isn't it of going for the one mana is the fact that you you equip it and and go basically on the same turn almost all the time right so uh yeah any removal isn't the end of the world good taunt to uh, summon from a balance though that's going to help out a little bit does have light to uh deal with its odin Light and then can even location on the. What is it? I think that did say gain armor. Yeah, it just goes weapon gain armor, right? Oh, right, the discount. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he does yeah, have yeah, a. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was forgetting the discount as long as you order it properly where you uh, mm -hmm. do the light first. Yeah. There is still double bash, shield block, and a, you know, a million ways to deal with this board and push a lot of damage. Uh, so. <laughs> is that a very smug eyebrow raise from McBanner face? I'm not sure. <laughs> Well, this does this is when you... complicate things for sure. Yeah. <laughs> prison. Okay. <laughs> are we are we blade storming? What's what's happening here? Prison Peaked first. My interest. There is always some risk to the prison as well because there's uh, the potential to burn things. Although that was the mm. only minion left in the deck. And uh, also potential to uh, discard your hand. There is that tome tampering. <laughs> That's a possible random spell, which discards your hand and shuffles one cost copies into your deck. Yeah, it does have the blade storm, but unfortunately now because the prison doesn't really have a good way to clear the rest of this off. 
But on the other hand, the last ability remaining is the make a copy. So unless Balance plays something a little scary to make a copy of, there's not a whole lot of use being mm -hmm. uh, you know made out of it. Yeah, the hand doesn't scream, uh, you know, winning moment here from balance, does it? I think, obviously, the weapon is fantastic, but other than that, nothing really feels like it gets worked. And, like, all this weapon disruption or removal is good in theory, but with Odin, it kind of becomes null and void. Is this just going to be a, a Renathal and copy it? <laughs> Get a pair of five sixes? No. Okay. Are we actually going to see a Titan be able to attack? I know, what a rarity. What a treat. <laughs> That's an... Uh, I'm not sure I've ever seen that card played, Hedra. Yeah, it's kind of interesting with the whirlpool, right? Like, it's a potential threat, I guess, is, is the word I'll use. And uh, Balance placing some pretty high value on the two mana reduction from Love Everlasting. You know, could have just let it let it pass there, figure we're on 10 mana, don't need it anymore. But willing to kill his own 5-5 five five saying, you know, hey, damage doesn't matter for me this game, I just need to run you out of stuff. So right. I may as well, you know, keep this buff going. Uh, another way to do that, though, would have been to actually go for, like, a Putricide angle. Maybe play Putricide, copy it, and kill the 1-3, get a couple of potions, and use those to keep Love Everlasting going. Yeah, I think it's okay, though, because if you think about it, the the Ruin isn't going to get much value against McBanterface, right? There's, like, mm -hmm. nothing really to hit. Pretty much with with the uh, Shadowwood Ruin. Yeah, true. Odin it was the only big minion, and mm. that having passed, I mean, I mean, there's I think no minions left in the deck for for Bent Face. Right. So it's just it's what I think it's one of those just just get it out of the hand, right? Just get it thrown away while you can, while you've got the time. Looks like it's going to be Putricide now, though. Now, this is uh, about as much value as Balance could expect to get off the future side. Must consider... Though I think we do have to use the, the weapon if we want to clear that 3-6. Uh, which is sinking 10 damage. Yeah, I think if that's the case, then you just don't bother. Yeah. Because there's the Whirlpool, right? I think, like, the the Whirlpool might even come down just to sort of juice. Oh, never mind. No, I'm just going to play the Hedra now. Okay. Oh. I wonder if Balance made the mistake that I was making in my head there, which is thinking that Hedra was based off the spells that were in your hand, not the ones you played while it's in your hand. Oh, right, yeah, that's why I was talking about Whirlpool, right? Yeah, because, yeah. like, you, you know, you play it out whilst Hedra's there, and then suddenly that's actually a pretty, you know, pretty serious threat, uh, on average at least. But uh, Balance sitting on 1 million health, McBant face <laughs> on a measly 11, but there's, like, infinite armor to gain at this point. Yeah, the only reason Banter's been holding back on the armor has been just because it, it does also convert to damage. Right. But I think probably this, this Sanitize is going to get ripped if uh, he doesn't feel like Trial by Fire is good enough. Yeah, I think so. I think it's just, I think that was the moment, right? Just uh, using the Sanitize well, I think, is so key for this deck because if you sort of throw it away too early it can be really punishing because it does have that sort of just remove a board effect right like that's what it feels like that the text says in a lot of these instances is just clear the board 
And I like this, you know, not a particularly great three drop elemental to get, but it is guaranteed, you know, two damage and balance's location yep. is coming up. So you kind of disincentivize using that this turn. It's also interesting as well, because like Banterface is just holding and holding um, with all this because he just knows, well, it's not lethal, so <laughs> whatever. And he knows he can't die as well, right? Like nothing that balance is going to do to him will kill him from an empty board. Not that I can think of anyway. I, you know, nothing but random generation. I think, Sure. you know, some people might be a little scared about, you know, say if this Blingtron off of the random legendaries were an Alakir, then combined with this location, you know, that would be sure. 10 first mm -hmm. damage potential, right? But yeah, largely outside of those fringe scenarios, the 10 mana weapon was about as much damage as you can expect out of the priest and now that's out of the way you can feel pretty secure in your you know 16 health over there oh looks like it's gonna be the whirlpool as well again balance thinking well there's not gonna be that many more minions left can't really deal with these and don't want to be taking any extra armor damage because that's kind of like the the weird issue um with armor on the priest right is that well you can't really heal it so once it's gone it's gone uh, to an extent anyway so yeah, armor becomes a, a very precious resource any damage you took before you got it you're you're fine with being able to heal up but uh yeah. the armor once it's gone it's gone Now, I believe the last riff played was a verse riff. I hmm. I think I'm with you on that. So if there was some scenario to like play that one mana weapon and finale the verse riff, we have potential for quite a bit of damage, but yeah, just going to go for the bridge rift this turn. It's, it's not lethal yet. I think it's probably going to involve both of the... I can never remember the name of the spell, but the tradable, the one he just got rid of, <laughs> combined with the... Uh, oh, heavy plate. Short sword. Yeah, heavy plate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think so too, and I think that's what's... I, I, I was quiet for a second, because I'm just staring at um, Banter's cards that, that's left, you know, trying to see if, you know what's available is he waiting for anything specific but there's like i think there's like two from the depths which doesn't really do anything at this point um there's uh there's not that much more in the deck apart from as you mentioned those heavy plates so uh, i'm right there with you i think that's what's going to be needed here there is a trial by fire just to um defend a little bit here and i think that's the benefit of these rifts is that you just saw or banterface just saw balance have to use a whirlpool to deal with a quite a small board so it's like right if these minions again get to a, just peel this armor or any of this armor then it's they're going to be very very successful indeed at helping him get uh you know the, the finisher on this game because even like look at that even the behemoth's kind of useless apart from as a actual yep. minion threat as opposed to healing right right he's gonna be able to clear the board and represent some uh, threats himself but again Oh, there's even this hammer to sort of do some, you know, peel more of this armor away until he can get hold of the, the big burst turn as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, meanwhile, yeah, you're feeling safe on your own life total, so you don't even need to clear if you don't want to. Yeah. As long as this armor number from uh, Balance goes downwards, uh, but Bandit Face is going to be pretty happy. I, I think, think the, the interesting fact, sorry, um, is just can or, or how long will my face have to wait to get hold of both heavy plates if they're needed right i think right. that's the the question mark i have yeah for sure and it's you know just a little trick here when you're drawing one card a turn you kind of need both but when you've seen one you're trading to look for other stuff to do in the meantime so that makes it a lot harder to you know actually piece two of them together in a turn i think craftsman hammer is one of the you know things that Panther was maybe looking for in this moment. Yeah, just to uh, help but, fill the gap. Yeah, but it, it may come down to a, you know, prison result in terms of actually being able to pick up both of those heavy plates to use on the mm -hmm. same turn. And 
again, it's like, is this Whirlpool? Is this uh, Behemoth? It's probably going to be Viper one way or the other, right? Like, this Viper is not going to get a better chance because I don't think there's a world where Balance thinks that this weapon in hand from Banterface is going to be a 10 cost. Mm -hmm. So this Viper's not getting any more value than killing this weapon now. When the Blinktron actually is, you know, interesting as a kind of sneaky secondary weapon destruction. So yeah. I, I would think he may be just, again, protecting that armor. You go in on the Whirlpool, figuring there's not too many minion boards left. You can play the Viper on the other side of it. And then if that does mean that Banter's like, oh, the, the Viper is used, I can play a 10 mana weapon, which of course we can see isn't there, but it's gotta be in Balance's mind of, okay, well, at least I have this backup of if there's a 10 mana weapon, I can still mm -hmm. destroy it. I was actually wondering if uh... <laughs> there was a world where balance synchronizes the armor vendor there. Yeah, it's gonna rush drop Viper, break the weapon, and say your turn, my friend. This can help with the um, with the draw as well, right? From the depths. Yeah. I know I wasn't ha valuing it that much, but I guess if it gets to <laughs> guarantee, <laughs> okay. none of those are heavy plate. <laughs> Uh, and you have to put one of them on top. Yeah. I mean, it's... What would you say? It's probably Bladestorm, right? There are no minions left in the deck, so Chorus Riff is just... Not a nothing, because it has Finale, right? But it's kind yeah. of a nothing. It's about as nothing a card that exists in the Face's final six cards here. Let's see if I can show you the cards. Is it going to work? No, it is not. I don't know why I pressed that button. <laughs> No, no, it, it, it works, yeah. First, oh, well, it's showing, a, it's showing the hand like, as well. Yes, I was going to say, that's showing way more than six cards. Uh, but still, that is going to be some card draw, as you oh, said, prison. Now, coming out there to play. is a prison, oh. and I think this is why oh, people my. are willing to play it, because when it is, you know, the resource of last resort, sometimes it just gets you there, and that is a... Yeah huge swing for banter getting those those cards picking up both heavy plates we see one of them did get the reduction even though it wasn't viewable in the dredge earlier but uh yeah getting <laughs> miracle growth and uh you know a nine nine yeah. taunt if he wants it okay, on the following at, turn. at this point dirty rat's just gonna be hilarious if it comes <laughs> out <laughs> because suddenly there is a, it's a little bit scary i don't think it is gonna come out because of that of course I mean, Balance knows what's there, right? That there were no yeah. minions in deck before, and now there's a 9-9 in hand. But Banterface, so I think there, was trying to just quickly add up things, work out what he could afford to play, what he couldn't afford to play, how much mana he needs to spend. Uh, kind of similar to what we just saw in the... Well, what we just saw, what feels like an age ago now, in the uh, the Mage matchup of just working out exactly what this... Uh, from a banter's side of things, hopefully the oh, final no. turn no, looks no, like. No, no, no. Uh, he's playing it for the taunt, but... Oh, he's just going to synchronize. Wait, there's not enough mana to replay another one. I mean, it would just be to keep the spell discount going, but yeah, I think Balance was, was just kind of in his head. Oh, there's no minions left. I'm going to play this taunt out. Sort of forgot well, that that means there's a 9-9 nine nine there. Yeah, I thought this would have been again maybe slightly miscounted of just saying oh well actually if you play another one now that's still more taunts than there are minions on board right uh, so that would have been something but yeah kind of uh, interesting there but there's runic sword and here's about to be 18 bajillion damage <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it, it really came down to like you said all that armor was gained earlier on but because it was earlier on banter had all this time to just sort of chip away and it yeah. can't can't be healed back up now. He finally goes for this massive swing. Uh, look at this. It's going to be nearly sixty. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, nice. 50, Fifty-four damage. Yeah, basically a million if you round it up. Oh no, um, that, it, the gain too. Fifty, <laughs> fifty-six. And uh, but yeah, really, really good win there from a bandit face. Of course, the dirty rat on the Odin did not happen. The Odin came at a re relevant time. But I think for me. The real trick there for McBanterface was good recognition of how much damage he can do 
you know, at whatever point in the game, and also acknowledging that he should just take it slow, there's no rush, the priest is unlikely to surprise kill him as long as he's not on like three health or something right um and then saying yeah yeah balance has gained all this armor fantastic i think it was a 35 ish armor at the highest point i think which is a lot but it can't be healed it can only be more armor or nothing so the heals don't work and it's just i'll just chip away chip away chip away and then when it comes down to it when it comes down to that final turn it's going to be game because that armor will all be gone so it's really tricky from balance's side because on one hand you could say oh he should have saved the weapon swings for later you know to gain the armor at the last moment but when do you know when the last moment is if odin's already been played right that's the problem right and once you've started you kind of have to keep going because it's, it's getting chipped away no matter what. So right. what do you say? Well, they're not going to be able to, they're going to be able to weigh, chip away 16, but but not more than that. Or, or like, where's the waiting moment? I think it's totally mm -hmm. reasonable to just go all in, say, I'm going to protect this as much as possible. And you're not always able to protect it perfectly. Yeah. And suddenly we're only one game away. Is McBannerface going to be able to clear this up 3-0 or is Balance going to be able to fight back? Um, McBannerface now only has his Mech Rogue left. Uh, the Nature Shaman was banned out. Uh, so it's just Mech Rogue to go against basically the whole lineup uh, from <laughs> Balance. So very, very scary indeed because time after time this weekend, we've seen Mech Rogue get the job done either through you know extremely aggressive openings or surprisingly still managing to to finish the job in the mid to late game yeah it's a deck that you know on on one level you think oh it's, it's just turbo and if you don't win by turn five it, it's game over but uh, it does have a lot of staying power if it is able to you know pick up those gear shifts etc and there's just so many like little plays you can make with with mimiron to like squeeze out extra value or with ultron uh, and uh, a lot of times we've, we've seen, yeah, the game goes long, but they're able to just squeeze in and a little damage here, a little damage there, such that, I mean, Kravitoa has almost been the all-star in those situations for just right. getting that bit of extra damage over the finish line. Yeah, and I can only imagine what's going through Balance's head right now, because those have been two, you know, pretty rough games, right, of not... I don't want to say hopeless games, but probably feeling like that when you're playing the sort of slow control deck, and then you just die. Right, uh, and again, it's not like McBannerface did anything too out of this world. It's just that's what those two decks, the Mage and the Warrior, do. But it, it feels a little bit rough when you're not hitting, right? It didn't hit the Sif, didn't hit the uh, the Odin. But I guess that's the sort of game you play, right? If you bring a Control Priest and a lot of these sort of burst OTK matchups come down to Dirty Rats, when you hit, you hit. When you miss, you miss. We're going to go jump in to game number three, though, and I think that was Fortifications, the plus one health per turn um, on a minion. Correct me if I'm wrong if you're sorry. Uh, it, it was, and that is a pretty good one for the mech rogue, but we are actually going to mm. see uh, rogue v rogue. I think Balance needed a break there from <laughs> yeah, the control don't, priest, don't understandable. Don't Even though yeah. <laughs> I would say this is the matchup that you want with the control priest. There's definitely some merit to saying, okay, well, let's get my harder matchups out of the way. Yeah. And then I, hopefully it's a cruise if you get to play that control priest again. Yeah, I think a lot of it honestly is that there are certain players that go one way, certain players that go the other when it comes to this kind of situation. But I would guess that balance is just like, I just need a moment away from priest because those were two very, you know, drawn out kind of long, crazy games. Let's just jump over to somewhere else because he's going to have to play Priest versus Mechrogue if he wants to win this matchup anyway. He has to win with all three of his decks. So, um, you know, that's going to come when it comes. And I think that's why a lot of players have opted not to bring something like a Control Priest to an event like this because there is just added mental strain in terms of your games are longer. And, you know, should you continue to lose with Priest, your losses are longer. So, uh, yeah. I think I totally understand why you know so many players have opted for uh, other options like the you know Nature Shaman or Arcane Hunter, these faster decks, uh, just because even if you do say, oh, I feel okay about Control Priest, I mean, three priests did make it to the top eight, uh, one of them Shadow, but it's just not a deck that certainly I would want to be, you know, 
going all in on for an event like this, where it's just taking up so much time and, and mental strain throughout the event. Yeah, it's something that, look, I struggle. As Sotl well knows, once I get to the four and a half hours straight casting mark, I struggle to even remotely make sense. So in terms of playing, I respect the players who can bring these uh, slightly slower lineups. So far, though, Barnes has been able to put forward some level of defense here against McBannerface, uh, keeping things, uh, keeping the mech rogue in check, at least for now. But he's going to be able to answer with the gatekeeper magnetized. Gonna make this nice value trade. And this is where you start to get a little bit afraid, right? If you're uh, balanced in this situation, because you just sat yeah. there thinking, oh, don't, oh no, <laughs> like that's going to stick. And now I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. And oh. <laughs> <laughs> this health buff, again, you know, I said from the beginning, I, I think this favors the mech rogue. And yeah. uh, sure enough, we're, we're kind of running away with this one. That wind fury coming down, oh. all the extra coins. And I think the eyebrow raise there from balance is all we need to know, you yeah. Just a bit like, ah, so that's how it's going to go. Mabanta face, hands in the air, just saying, right? Do you have something? Do you not? Are there any kind of concoctions that are going to help? And just like that, balance has just said, no, thank you. That's enough for me. And Mabanta face is going to be going to the finals to face off against Pocket Train two very intense games earlier finished off by mech rogue being mech rogue <laughs> what a way to end this match yeah absolutely and i gotta say i'm i'm a little you know biased in terms of wanting uh banterface to get through there right is our, our our last holdout for america's region but uh, also in terms of you know i, I catch his streams every once in a while he's, he's a really fun guy and uh yeah, he's been, I mean, all of these players have been grinding massively, but Banterface has been a recurring name this year, uh, you know, not mm -hmm. necessarily in the, the top eight of every event the way the pocket has been, but certainly been present at each of these events this year. Yeah, and, and honestly, what a final it's going to be. Uh, there's going to be some uh, some stakes on the line extra, at least for the casters, since it's going to be pretty much UK versus <laughs> the Americas. So uh, that's going to be a pretty spicy one. And I am, uh, one, I would love to cast it, of course, but I am, I am off for this next match. But I will very much enjoy putting my feet up and watching this finals because it's going to be fantastic. Simply two of the best players we've had at, at least all year at the very least even saying that. So it's going to be absolutely fantastic. We're going to go to a quick break while we get this final set up, but don't go anywhere. It's going to be amazing. We'll be right back.
It's finals time, everybody, and what a final we have got. McBanterface, Pocket Train, Sottle, they're all here. All of your three favourite people. Um, two of them are streamers, one of them used to do so. Sottle, how's it going? Uh, it's going <laughs> great. It was a bit of a deranged intro, but I'm, I'm here for it. I am I genuinely really, really, really excited for this final. I think in terms of quality of players we very arguably have the best player in europe against the best player in americas um i think that's almost inarguable on pocket side for for europe on and you know a bit of an argument for banterface on the other side i think also you know sometimes you you have to put your personal biases aside and sometimes you just have to declare your personal biases and i think also in terms of just people that both of us like and actually have kind of like personal relationships with and talk to regularly. Two players that we're really delighted are doing really well in this tournament as well. So um, I am really, really excited to get my teeth sunk into this one. I think it should be a fantastic final for our... Uh, yeah, and I think from the viewers, right? I think people have watched these two players come through the whole 10 month grind to get here um, on stream a lot of the time. I know Pocket Train sort of slowed it down a bit, but People know these two players. They're two of the players who've streamed the most at this tournament throughout the whole year. And I think that people would be delighted to see these two here. Obviously, there's Rekram there, one of the other players who's done that. Meaty, we didn't get to see much this weekend, but another one. They've, they've really helped this tournament along by showing us the insights of how the ladder has unfolded. And yeah, they're and probably you just... two of the best players. They absolutely are. And uh, you see some of those final moments of Pocket Train getting over the line. I think it's very fitting that we are looking at the Nature Shaman here because I made this point uh, during Pocket Semi Final. Is I think part of the reason why he has been so successful is that he has had an easier time getting this Shaman out the series than a lot of other players have. Some of that has been good play, some of that has been good fortune, some of that has been bad play from the opponents, some of that has been a combination of you know, maybe a little from column A, B and C with that, that weird game against uh, in the semi-final with Sif being the last card but maybe there being different ways out of the game but certainly Nature Shaman um, you know, glass half empty, glass half full, you can kind of say yeah, you know, it's sub 50% win rate, it's not doing great and you can frame it that way or you can stack it up against the other decks that a lot of other people have put in that fourth deck slot and say well it's doing a lot better than any of those are um, yeah. so but i do think it's a real talking point for the tournament of uh, whether that was the bring in, in terms of the the out the box deck that at least every player has uh, at least one of it seems and something i don't think we've touched on necessarily this tournament which is unusual for this group of casters is it's very much a pocket trained sort of deck draw some cards do some stuff count your health total know how much you die to know your outs kill your opponent somehow like yep. it, it's it's his wheelhouse entirely he's very good at all of hearthstone but this deck is very much like how you define him or priest defines him this is remarkably similar in a lot of ways to that deck. Yeah, it was one of the fears I had coming into this tournament as a pocket train enjoyer. Is like, was there really, was this really a pocket train meta, right? Like you, you, know, you mentioned Boar Priest, of course, um, but we've also seen it with uh, Mindlock, where he was probably a top five Mindlock player, with you know, only Fury Hunter and a couple of others really uh, stepping above him. Um, he really does like those, you know, card draw heavy, bursty, damage heavy decks in general, and this feels like a very tempo focused board based aggro meta overall uh where you know it's boards and it's disruption and control on the other side um so finding that way to just sneak nature shaman in there i think just as a little comfort pick for pocket trainer has been very very interesting but speaking of uh board based decks and snowballing and aggro no deck in the game really does that better than mech rogue does and we've seen uh, both of these players now, Pocket Train and McBanterface, almost one-upping each other with how gross a start they could get rolling with Mech Rogue in their two sets. 
Yeah, and how good must Mech Rogue be if Bantaface has brought it instead of bringing Miracle? Like, Miracle Rogue is one of his go-to decks when he you know, wants a comfort pick. He's brought the Mechs. I think that's... Um, yeah, he can play anything, but it's just as a sign of how good this deck must be. And it's it's shown it, right? Every game we cast Mech Rogue, it looks like, oh, they got lucky. Yeah, 17 times in a row or something. I don't, it's not quite that many, but, you know, many times in a row, the <laughs> Mech Rogue has just won from nowhere now. But God, it's working out against the Shaman because they can turn your good card into a pudding. And that's the end of the game. Yeah, Primordial Pudding, that, that well-known Shaman card. Um, it's, yeah, I, I think... Mech Rogue was something that I did, I was very, very bullish on would be a good deck in this tournament because, um, you know, like I played a lot of Mech Rogue, I turned you on to Mech Rogue and you had a good mm -hmm. time with Mech Rogue as well. Um, and I really stopped having any success with it at all as soon as Yogg appeared, essentially, because then we fell into that Prison Breaker Yogg meta where if you were dumb enough to try and put things in the middle and play minions, um, well, Yogg just came along and just you know, stole your one giant magnetic minion. Oh, okay, I won't make one giant magnetic minion. I'll spread a little bit wider instead. Oh, okay, well, Yogg Mass Hysteria, now that's gone anyway, right? There, there felt like nothing that you could do with Necro to play around that. So with Yogg gone, this just felt like a natural extension back into the uh, to the meta game. What I'll be interested to see here as the game and final have started is how this feral spirits get used. Do you just jam it or do you wait for a moment when your opponent's got an 11-11 that's about to kill you and then just plop it on the board and say you can't get through this, it's too difficult. I think the only thing that makes that question is that there is also a turn the tides in hand and there is also a jazz base in hand, right? Like if um, I talk about this a lot but this deck really, really, really wants to play a tempo three on turn three a lot of the time. There you I go. Think Pocket Train doing the exact opposite of that and playing Flash of Lightning instead. But I think understanding already that because there is a 4-7 Divine Shield on the board, none of his threes are tempo threes anymore, right? Like Feral Spirit's kind of uh -huh. garbage, doesn't contest. Turn the Tide's kind of garbage, doesn't contest. So he has to go... Flash of Lightning, Lightning Reflexes instead. This has to be his way out of it to go digging with the Lightning Reflexes this time. Yeah, and I'm amused, obviously, because you are the main proponent in the entire world of playing <laughs> Flash as early as possible in this sort of situation. Mm -hmm. So, oh my goodness. Windfury. No, still. <laughs> what? Not, not even close. The one that looks like Windfury is Reborn. That's not what? Hang on. Hey, they all look the same. All the, all the blue ones. Right, so here's the pop. Well, the early pop off gets the hex. Which is a massive yeah, it, deal. It oh. is a really, really big deal, yeah. Back and this the allows him to use the Feral Spirits as you were de de describing. Like, okay, if more buffs and Wind Fury come down now, like, I, I might still take some damage depending on how good the hand is, but it's unlikely that, you know, they can make. Uh, this uh, a 10 attack minion and connect phase twice, right? And then I'm really in trouble, so. Yeah, I was looking through the win percentages of, you know, all the matchups, obviously. That's kind of my job coming into this. And this is one of the more lopsided ones in favor of the um, Shaman, which is not your first instinct, I don't think, but the more we've seen it played, the more we've seen Shaman have multiple ways with the taunts, with the hexes, with the evolve effects to deal with stuff. It's only 58%, like everything's 50-50 in this meta, give or take. Yeah. But, yeah, it's, it's one of the more lopsided ones. I think that was a surprise to me when I first saw it, thinking that the Rogue should just steamroll this. There's just, there's just enough little tricks that the Shaman has, if played correctly. Yeah, I think so too. So how are you going to use your Inny? We had this question, I think you raised it earlier with Raven, like, Inny's great, but they're killing every mech that they can kill, so what does Inny actually do a lot of the time? Yes. Um, obviously, the dream is um, any with some sort of magnetic squirrel. Uh, it is continues to astound me how nonsense some of the sentences this job makes you say are, but um, <laughs> that is kind of the dream. But sometimes if you keep that dream, if you clutch onto that dream too tight, you end up just having a dead any in your hand the entire game. Like I think generally... Any, if you can point it at a mech, is probably the best play in your hand. Obviously, you can't do that this turn, but I think a lesson that you have to learn very quickly is, like, just just use it. It's really good. Um, if you don't use it, you're probably going to end up gear shifting it away at some point. And facing that horrible situation going into this turn six, where you know 
what can happen to you. So yeah, make a board that doesn't involve getting blown up everything. There's some words I just said. Get, it doesn't involve getting blown up everything. Yeah. yeah. Those... Rearrange these words into a popular <laughs> sentence. <laughs> <laughs> into a popular sentence. Yeah. It's probably uh -huh. more popular than any in a magnetic squirrel, right? I imagine whatever yeah. the correct version of your sentence was has been said more often than my previous sentence. True. Or at least at the time that I said it. Yours may have caught up. Okay. <laughs> so... Pocket Train still on 26, still with a Feral in hand, has an active Titan. It's got card draw in hand and a crash. This looks really good for Shaman right now. It does look very good, yeah. There's a choice here though. Ooh, that was not one of the choices I was about to lay down. Okay, yeah, there was actually three ways to go about that, right? One was this, uh, spend the spell discount and then you shoot for 20. There was also draw three, and then use turn the tides and send face and the minion into the 6-6. Six, six. Uh, and then there was um, deal three, heal six, and then use just the minion and not your face from turn the tides to clear the entire board, right? Like all three of yeah. those have relative merits. Uh, kind of weird actually to play a Titan and actually have all three a serious consideration for the ability on the turn. Yeah, oh, cool. really cool. I mean, it is one of the best Titans, if not the best, just in terms of raw power level. Um, but something that Pocket Train does, and I think you also highlighted this earlier, is whenever you see his play, it's like, oh, that's obvious. You can't kill my Titan now. I can use the deal three ability next turn. They, they very rarely actually get rid of it here. Obviously, you do the this. The, yeah, the, so the reverbed Mimiron, where he reborned his Mimiron, traded the two reverbed Mimirons into each other to get an unreverbed Mimiron on the board, and then put the second reborn on that new unreverbed Mimiron. I was like, yeah, that's obviously the right play, but I promise you, I would not have done it. Right. Like, I, I, it's, I just can't explain why that play is so good, but it really, I'd, I'll be yeah. telling my grandkids about that. Lucky them. Yeah. Can't they just watch the vod? Right, so now, because of his previous play, he has another use of his ability, which means he can just draw the rest of his important cards and win some Hearthstone. Yeah, and, like, serious point, I think that's why this play wins the battle, because it put taunts up, and the one thing that Mechrogue really has to deal with minions from hand is Krabatoa. So by having the Feral Spirits in play, it kind of shut down really any option for Banter to be able yeah. to remove the Golgoneth. Um, which I think just made this really, really, really smart overall. And, yeah, uh, yeah like, pocket trade, like, Vantaface has just, just got, got Tempo Kong this game. Like, this is why Pocket Train is arguably the best player with this deck in the world. Like, he wins an inordinate amount of games by just winning board, which isn't really a thing well, that should seem possible with this deck. Winning board, but like this, this is the thing that I think he does incredibly well. Again, other top players will also do it incredibly well. Um, he's still lightning bolts face as well with a plus five. It's not just the tech. He manages to mix the direct damage and the tempo to oh, yeah. a very early lethal. I know it's not particularly amazing, but yeah, I'm sitting there going, do I tempo or do I hit them in the face with the spells? No, you just do both. You've got two things to win the game with. This is a lot. Oh. Yeah. Forced to take down the spell damage minions to have any sort of remote chance. Unlock a whole bunch of free mana again. Uh, turn the tides and overdraft. One off. Six, nine, three, six. Probably. Six on boards. Oh, no, sorry. I was counting the turn the tides as doing six damage, which it doesn't. You're further off than that. It's only 11 total. Something that's come up throughout this tournament time and again is the Rogue's lack of ability to actually hurt you when it gets going. So you can just tank six or seven there just mm -hmm. so comfortably if it keeps you the board. 
Yeah, this is about the scariest situation for Rogue that exists, or Mech Rogue, that is. Like, they haven't played their Krabatoa yet, so that's some amount of damage you can take from the weapon. And they have a couple of uh, Mimiron's gadgets in hand, right, which can also be damage. But mm -hmm. even in that scenario, you're super chilling at 19 with an empty board. Yeah, Mantis having to use his weapon to just hurt himself over and over again. Oh. Go on, little buddy. You got this. <laughs> well, there's my hand. Good luck, everyone. I like these nice slow-paced finals where the players take their time and rope every turn. Yeah, 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 for sure. Everything on the line. Taking their time to make sure they get it right. Fish. 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 Batterface hasn't got any cards! Stop! It's not fair! Fish. 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 There we go! <laughs> <laughs> just just fish them till they leave. That's the old, that's the way. Why was the fifth fish the one that broke the bat when he knows this? <laughs> so I've seen enough fish now. I want to see what colours they were. Well, mm, okay, one schooling. Okay, one fish, two fish, three fish. Ooh, mm. I think I can beat that. Oh, red fish, blue fish on top of that as well. Oh, okay, I'm out. You got me. Just the wrong colour fish. And Antiface gives it up. And Pocket Train, who played at lightning speed there, 1-0 ahead. Yeah, clean game. Um, like I said, Pocket Train is, is kind of unparalleled at being able to do that kind of stuff with, uh, with Nature Shaman. Just turning the handful of tempo cards that the deck has, which are incredibly good, right? Like... Schooling, buff Feral Spirits is only one overload, turn the tides. Those cards are really good at winning boards between turn one and turn four, right? Like, they're so, so good at it. But if you can do it consistently and then keep that board for a couple of extra turns through to your Golganeth, you win a lot of games of Hearthstone just by being ahead on board through the early turns. And I think it's a lot a thing that, even with the version that ended up getting nerfed, a lot of people struggled to understand for quite a long time is that it's a much better tempo deck than it seems apparent immediately uh, but pocket train has always been ahead of the curve with that kind of thing right like even with mind lock right like there was probably fury hunter who's better at playing for tempo with mind lock and then pocket train was probably the closest one behind that as understanding how a deck somehow with like zero minions in it can actually still sometimes play for tempo which is incredibly bizarre um, and I think that is the mark of mastery for a combo player. It's that they actually still manage to play for tempo with combo decks. Because at the end of the day, I said this earlier, this is Hearthstone. It is an incredibly tempo-focused card game. And just before we get into this mage mill where nobody has a keyboard, um, did you catch how many cut? There's one. Did you catch how many cards Pocket Train had left in his deck at the end there when we saw the replays? I did not. No, did you? He had eight cards left in his deck. Nice. Yeah. So not only did he generate all that tempo, but in eight turns he had drawn 22 cards in some way or other. Nice. So he's doing all the things. That, it's not like it's luck that he happened to have those cards. He's drawn his deck, so he's going to have those cards. Small thing here, but keyboard not being played on to. Uh, just playing the spell, playing the minions. A, sw again, swings the tempo. You're now ever so slightly ahead on tempo instead of ever so slightly behind. Secondly... You didn't really have anything to do on turn three anyway. So if you'd have done it the other way around, you play Cosmic Keyboard on two, you take a little bit of chip damage from the minion that you leave up from Banter, which is important, and then you end up burning one of your charges on that one mana spell on turn three when you end up doing the same thing anyway. Whereas the way Pocket did it, he ends up in a scenario where now he gets to spend all three of these charges on nice, juicy four mana plus spells. Yeah. And yeah, you see Banterface sort of shrugging a bit. This matchup, I don't know what the stats are. It's massively favoured for the first keyboard, but it's definitely not over. Like, there's so much generation, so much can go on. That yeah, if, if you get through this somehow and you have your own keyboard later, yours generates seven seven. So you do have a chance to come back into this. I did wonder where that was going. I did for a moment think you might be having a stroke when you started. Well, I haven't really looked at the matchup data for this mirror match. Yeah, I was, I was kind of wondering where you were going. No, the matchup fine. data for people getting keyboard first. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's massive, gross. right? Like, it's gross. It's, it's gross. Yeah. so ridiculous. But you can win by coming through the other side and generating your own bigger stuff later on. But it's the same. It's the same thing I was just talking about, right? Like it, it's it's two decks that are resilient enough that they aren't going to lose to the other one on board a lot of the time. So it does make it 
an OTK deck versus an OTK deck. But the tempo is still phenomenally important because if you're ahead and you're chip that you're pushing chip damage to your opponent, you might only have to do 20 with your Sif at the end of the game, right? Whereas the other person who's been scrambling to clear boards the entire time is going to have to do 30, 35, 40, depending on how much armor you've stacked. So Banter is actually doing a phenomenal job right now, even though Pocket Train has had all the tempo cards to be able to stay ahead. Banter is just going, okay, no, 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 small minion, small minion, small minion, clear your stuff, push a little bit of chip damage every turn. Yeah, and it, it came to play there with, um, like, one of the turns was Artificer into Worm into Bolt your two health thing, just so I've got some little things on the board. Now, he, they're still there, one, three, one, two, one, two, chipping three a turn, defending yep. a little bit, something massive comes down. Um, making this Morgan, you know, still very powerful, but at least they could do something to it. You got six attack on the board. Poetry's yeah. taken his time. It's it's rare that the first Norman isn't plus cards uh, or plus one to cards. But again, with the six damage on the board, that that plus one to cards is supposed to defend you. But six damage already there. That plus one to cards isn't defending you much. Yeah. I think the question you have to ask, though, is like if your opponent like wind furies all their minions into your Norganon and then throws a spell at it, sure. costs too much. Is that not still not a good cut a turn? Yeah, I, th I think this is right. All right. I guess my point is, imagine this turn if he hadn't got six attack on the board. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Now then. A now they all live, or most of them live. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, two of them live, but you know, that's most. 50% rounded up. Three of them Thank live, because only two have to attack in. Yeah, okay. I was right. All along, I knew it. <laughs> You're a secret genius! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty sure that's true. It's a very well kept secret. <laughs> and again, just ripping two, four, five, and a seven, seven. You know. What's in his hand? Banter is so much more juiced on the uh, on the spell school front as well. Yeah, Actually just gets to counter swing this. And he survived the, the weapon. And he's yep. come out of it kind of ahead. And he's got rid of the Titan as well. He's he's in an okay spot in the long term here. I think he's in a very good spot. Pocket is going to need some sort of answer from Discovery of Magic, probably, to be able to deal with this board state. Yeah. Or uh, Wisdom of Norganon into creation, but again, the, the spell schools just aren't juiced enough. Like, Norganon costs uh, three, so we're only two spell schools deep right now. And those are not it. If, if he doesn't deal with this, does Banter just rip the other one, knowing that these can't be dealt with, so okay, off we go. If he doesn't deal with this, he might be dead. Also true. Deathborn, yeah, sure. But Banter knows that was a scramble, right? Or yep. there's a good idea that was a scramble. Just a little bit scary in terms of what happens to the seven one. Not scary, but awkward. You don't you don't want to trade you don't want to trade either of your four threes into it, right. You don't want to necessarily throw one of your one mana spells at it because you have a Sif in your hand. You also don't really want to coin ping because king point yeah uh, coin is an incredibly yep. good card in this scenario as well. Yeah. It it does help a lot when you get three rush from your thing though. That's pretty good. <laughs> oh, option 4. Who cares about it? I think you can trade the other skeleton. Yeah, so if you oh, that's very frustrating. Yeah, you see the little slight curl of the mouth from banter face. So with the first rush going into the skeleton, if that skeleton had hit either of the other two rush minions, I think you can just toss that rush minion that's already damaged yes. into the seven one, right? And not feel too bad about it. Because you do want to protect this coin. But yeah, I think at this point, the minions that you have left that can attack are all more valuable than that coin. Reverb just to get the thing. yeah, just casting reverb to get the shadow cast. 
Oh, oh. Nice, 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 nice. Okay. Yeah, seems good. I agree, Banter. Is he just counting next turn lethal, though, before he just plops this down? Like he could forge? Oh, I mean, that's that's what I'm referring to, is just forging sure, okay, the, yeah. the Molten Room, potentially. Yeah. Because the, the primary disruption that your opponent has is the Norganon of their own, which is already gone, right? So it is largely uninterruptible, apart from discovered things on the other side. And you're very unlikely to be dead. If you just work out, do you need to kill off this 4-4? Four -four? Four, I mean, that's whatever. trivial, right? Like, Ooh. killing the 4-4. Four -four. It's, uh, it's reverb, like you could have just pinged it if you were really that desperate to do it. No, I realise, it's, it's, it's mana, but yeah, he's got zero mana spells as well. This is just a million next turn. He's decided he's yeah. not taking 20, whatever it is, three. Mm -hmm. Seems a good thing to realise. <laughs> yeah, I mean, your opponent played Shadow Spell Wisdom for two mana last turn, right? So they're not, yeah. you, know, you know quite comfortably that they're not, they're not like seven, eight spell schools deep at this point. Why don't good players die? They just find things. Of course, they know what they're looking for, obviously, but you know. But he's gonna die now. <laughs> and it's one all. In one of the fastest pace finals I've ever seen. Oh, and Banterface has 16 corpses. Incredible. Oh, that's what we really needed to know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Banter squares up the series. And honestly, like, big big pat on the back. It's, you know, you talked about it, keyboard versus no keyboard. But really, really impressive the way that Banter responded to it. Like, as soon as he saw that keyboard come down, he was like, okay, fine. Here are all my small minions, and then I will throw my entire hand at clearing your keyboard stuff every single turn just so I can chip away with these minions. In the end, not a huge factor because he had a million damage in hand because of the way things that drew out in the end. But it, there were lots of worlds where that was incredibly relevant, right? Where he didn't just naturally draw into the Naga and the Reverb and everything else at the end of the game. And he just had to put together a little scrappy-do lethal instead. Um, then that the way that early game was played uh, gave him way more outs in terms of, uh, you know, how quickly he could get through his deck and find that burn damage. I mean, it made the anti-magic shell perfect. Like, there's True. times where I get offered anti-magic shell and I haven't got a minion on the board, but he's got four of them, even though they were small. Yes, it's a good good thing to rip, but also, if you've got the four minions there and half, I don't know if it's half, a large number of the spells in Hearthstone affect your minions, and you're going to get random cards, let's have some minions that we can affect. And he did that as well, so... Just trying to highlight what Hosotl is also saying about the the importance of having stuff on the board, especially in that Mage Mirror, but in all of Hearthstone. I think Sotl's rammed that home this weekend. I'll find some other point to ram home. I've got plenty of them. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I've been doing it for years. Um, yeah, Mage, Mage picking up a win, I think, was largely expected. I think it's been largely expected for the tournament. Um, it's outside of Warrior, it's been the most successful class, and the only reason I'm calling Warrior more successful is that you have to do relative percentage taking bans into account as well, right? Which I think makes Warrior a more successful deck overall than Mages. Uh, so, uh, that Mage picking up a win, I think, what I'm, I guess what I'm saying is the Shaman win for Pocket Train, I think, is a more important win. Conquest is a weird format where sometimes the score doesn't reflect... Uh, the, who is actually favoured in a series, right? Just because a series is 1-1 one, one does not mean it's evenly poised. And I do think the Shaman was a bigger win for Pocket Train than the Mage was for Banterface overall. Um, but we will see how things go because this is a mirrored series overall. I'm not sure if we have uh, made that point yet. Mech Rogue, Rainbow Mage, and Nature Shaman being the three decks left up for both players with Odin Mage. Uh, Odin Mage? No, please, stop. Um, Odin Warrior being the deck that was banned out by both people. That 
That would actually be gross, by the way. Imagine with the 1-3 elemental and you just start casting infinite spells and just gaining a bunch of armor and smacking your opponent in the face. That sounds Yeah, just only make cold case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. makes, makes a 4-4, four, four, two, 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 and hits your opponent in the head for four, gives you four armor. Yeah, this sounds all right. I like that yeah. card. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you largely. I think that the mage stats... It's interesting, right? You look at the top 1,000 stats and then nothing like the stats when the top 16 play. And that's something I don't think we've talked about as much this time as in the previous two Masters Tours where there's 25 players in the world who are substantially better than all the others. Yeah, yeah. I, I made the point earlier, um, it might have been yesterday, that I think, you know, looking at publicly available stat tracking websites and trying to draw conclusions about high-level competitive Hearthstone is as futile now as it has ever been. And it's a combination of a few factors. Um, there's more competition in the market for that kind of stuff right now, so the user base is split several ways in terms of what data is being reported where. Um, and also the difference between a 1,000 legend and a top 50 legend is bigger now than it ever has been um, because there's only a small portion of players that are taking it seriously to the point of being able to qualify for these tournaments. Yes. Um, so those conclusions are very hard to reach sometimes. But it's interesting that you say, you know, you look at Mage as a general uh, sample on, on stat tracking websites and it has kind of lower stats overall than when the very, very good players play it because... I think you'd agree the only conclusion that you can draw from that, Neil, is that Mage is a very skillful deck that the best players can get a lot out of. No, the conclusion I draw is that everyone was scared of Mage and brought decks that beat it. So why is Mage doing well? Hang on, what, what are we saying? Why is it doing well? Um, because the other decks are getting unlucky. <laughs> okay, alright, good. <laughs> Do you want to, like, you know, make your stance on Mage clear so I have to stop trying to needle it out of you, or are we... we just no, you can watch stop? me on stream and I'll make it clear there later <laughs> in the week. Just, just check it out. Uh, yeah, I mean, Pocket Train and Banterface, both regulars in uh, the stream Ooh. that Lorinda appears on camera on, which, you know... <laughs> calls Lorinda's stream, but I think everyone really knows it's Sotil's stream deep down. I think, yeah. I think we all know what everyone's there for. It's everybody's stream. Yeah, uh, this okay. was another option of not playing a keyboard on two, by the way, which is was a less obvious one this time around. Last time the curve kind of worked because it was the, the three into the four. There was no three drops, but this time, just still favouring moving the mech, which again kill mechs. They they kill you. Yes. Uh, but forfeiting the turn two tempo of oh, lack of tempo of the keyboard to even with a reverb in hand, just make sure that mechs were dying. Kill mechs or they kill you. I think the Terminator series would have way worse synopsis if written by Lorinda. Just throwing it out there. Uh, it's, it's very understandable. I think between True. me and Raven, we could come up with some good synopsis for all sorts of things. <laughs> uh, this is interesting. We, the speaker guys have been pretty lethargic this entire weekend, but this is a situation where Banta can try and leverage them pretty strongly. Yeah, they've yeah. been fine. I can't really remember any like blowout moments where it's like, well, I guess I just have to make this play, and if the, if they have Speaker Stomper, I lose the game automatically. Mm. Like We've definitely seen those games in previous tournaments, and there haven't been too many of them so far that I can remember in this one. But I do still think they are a fine addition in most decks of this kind of style with Mech Rogue. You know, I think if you were playing like, I don't know, Plague DK or some sort of Unholy DK, you'd want them in there as well. Like what, so any deck that's like super all in and having board all the time, uh, I do think you need them in there to defend from the, the likes of Mage and Nature yeah. Shaman and all that kind of stuff. I think the reason they've been a bit below par this weekend is because there's so much aggro and so many minions in this particular tournament. Yeah, like, sure. Yeah. There's very few decks that it targets apart from the mage. There's been no Plague DK at all, which I think is something we thought we'd see. I saw one or two priests, two priests in the whole tournament, you know. Yeah, I don't thought we'd see, like, feared we'd see would be more accurate from my yeah. perspective. I, 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 yeah, it's less Bomb Warrior, less Plague DK, please. Things where you just shuffle things into your opponent's deck. Nah, not my vibe. Shuffle. <laughs> okay. I'm excited when I see stealth and the then Titan in the same hand. Yeah. Titan, much more 
Feels like damage waiting to happen. There is an immolation aura in Pocket's hand that's kind of the most useful uh, random effect that he's been able to get his hands on so far, but not really going to have any kind of impact on this board. That's a lot lined up with the Prime. Okay. This is now a very awkward board against the Prime, right? Like, there's what's what's the good option to take from Voltron Prime against this? Yeah. Well... <laughs> like I think plus damage is still the strongest but then you would expect that board to get dealt with you haven't drawn cards from the prime your board gets cleared how do you rebuild from that point you kind of don't shoot damage out there and hope they don't have another turn but you know they've got another turn because they've got a weapon and seven mana next turn yep Right, like best case scenario, you, you 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 Voltron Prime, you do double damage, it kills the two five ones, and you be push face with the minion that you have. You're still probably losing that entire board next turn, right? So what what good does uh, that actually do you? So did he look for stealth into Wind Fury here just to just end it as an yeah. out? He's still looking for stealth. That's why this ended up being the pick. Yeah. Now, how do you win? That's the fun oh, part. pretend stealth. If I should. Don't. Pretend stealth. <laughs> oh. Oh, the creation comes into hand as well. Yeah, I was going to say it's a pretty good immolation aura, but it was an even better inquisitive creation yeah. as that came off the top. I mean, the one way you end up losing there is getting baited into playing Elemental Inspiration on Curve, even though it was fantastic. If you get zero rush from it, there are worlds where you just randomly die out of nowhere. Pocket Train too smart to get baited into that world. Creation coming off the top, making it basically a formality to sweep that board. So Banterface needs to set up lethal for next turn. And that might not be enough, because there's so many ways around it. Yeah. So many options. It's might... like Sparkbot draw two, or you can go Sparkbot for damage, try and get some of the damage to go face, and then like you draw exactly Crab off the top. Yeah. yeah. I think it's card draw. No, he's going to go for the full damage, okay. Yeah, I mean, like, whatever. I'm, not, I'm sure there's a better option and a worse option there, but they were both like, sure, I'm not going to argue whatever you choose there. Partly because you're better than me, but partly because they're all desperate measures. Don't you whatever me, Lorinda. I was whatever me banter face. This, is, fi this is finals. The winner of this uh -huh. goes to Worlds. I'm not accepting uh -huh. whatever as an answer. Okay. Explain in great detail why Pit Stop wasn't better. Look for stealth. <laughs> so... I actually, as I reflect on this, I actually think this was better because it creates a one in nine. How many minions are in play? I can't actually remember. It creates a niche out where both shots for four go face. And then with your mm -hmm. one dagger swing, you can put your opponent to four exactly. And then you draw a crab off the top and you win the game. That okay. is a better out than I can think of than by drawing two cards and not dealing any damage that turn. So in lieu of me being able to give you a better out with two extra cards, I think Banterface's decision there is correct. I wanted to draw a buffed stealth minion, stick it on the board, my opponent doesn't roll taunt, and I kill them with it with the cards next turn. Where are you getting a buffed stealth minion I'm from? I'm discovering confused. it. Oh, so you want to draw the other pit stop and then play the other pit stop and yeah. get the thing. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. That's still two turns away though, right? Because you're spending all your mana
Oh that, yeah, okay. That sure. that turn on one drop and Titan, right? So you then have to spend the next turn playing the pit stop. Uh, so it's still a couple of turns away, which I think makes life pretty, pretty awkward overall. But as predicted, hey, the mage picked up a win. Who who saw that coming, right, Lorinda? So it's just Mech Rogue uh, left for Pocket Train on the other side, which it's only Mech Rogue left between Pocket Train and what has been a 10-month journey, which genuinely, without exaggeration, has destroyed this man's soul. <laughs> yeah. Part of me is wondering if, if we get to talk to him later, if he does win, if his answer is going to be, why didn't I do that sooner? <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, yeah, are you, yeah, are, you, are you happy you won this tournament? No, I should have won a different one. I'm, I'm half expecting that to be the reply if that's a question that gets asked. Yeah, it's been... <laughs> It's been incredibly arduous. This the, the, the system this year has asked a lot from our players, and these players who are here deserve incredible commendation for accepting that challenge and stepping up to this plate to be here. Um, but certainly, like Pocket Train looked, I'm um, about 12 years old in January 2023. I'm pretty sure, and now look, he's got facial hair. He's frowning you can see the, the the fear behind his eyes like th this man has... we hope that's water <laughs> <laughs> he's gone through a journey whereas uh, there's banterface same as banterface has looked since the beginning of time i'm pretty sure there he is look. yeah what if he looks sort of this this mid-20s look when he was at school as well because i don't remember him ever looking any different mm. i wonder if it's just a loop on his webcam that he's been playing for like the last five years now it explains so much it would explain Raven's problems if identifying whether he'd won or not earlier. <laughs> Alright, fish. We've seen how that can go down. Schooling's absolutely the draw that you want, though. I think, I, I again, you want to talk about keyboard stats. I don't specifically know the stats in this matchup for Mulligan win rate of schooling, but I would imagine it is pretty massive. Sounds good, doesn't it? Like, mm. like to the point that he's considering. He's shaking his head because he has to lose two fish, but yeah, you gotta try and get better value out of them by waiting for the the full six attack rather than the the three. Oh, hello. Ooh. Unfortunately, three fish do six damage, so you can't just safely land a Mimmer on here. That's not a thing. Is that Reborn? That is Reborn. That's huge! <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the boy. So do you play the weapon? Like weapon and swing and just delay fish again. Hope that they don't get stealthed up. So what are the bad things that can happen to you here? Um, outside of everything. So Squirrel comes down on curve, right? Like, that's the mm -hmm. big one that you have to think about. So you need one bump to beat the Divine Shield, and then you need uh, four damage to at least be able to reset it back to the second Click Clocker that will come off the Reborn. That's fine. Actually, you probably need five damage because they'll use the coin to play another Spark Bot, presumably. So assuming it's they're all bad Spark Bots that don't do anything that ruins your plan. You can do all that with three fish, right? One, The 1-1 one, one fish to take off the shield, then you have yep. the two attack fish and the three attack fish. Does this uh, allow you to knowledge, though? Knowledge as well as clear with the fish. Not if anything relevant comes down to magnetize okay. onto it. No. Because you can only do three to it, right? So this is the same as just having a squirrel magnetized onto it, right? It would have full health either way, and you can only deal three to it if you play Ancestral Knowledge at the same time. I think I've known you too long, and I'm getting way too ambitious now. I want to flash an Ancestral here and close my eyes. I... Rather than put up this fight that doesn't last for it, that just doesn't work. I kind of love it. I've got loads of mana. Next turn, I've got reduced cards. I've got two 
two reductions in my my base. Okay, he's gonna play sensible. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he could do this, and oh, he could have also flashed. He could still flash. No, 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 he can't. Oh, using the weapon, you mean? Yeah, yeah, my yeah. Back, you yeah. are absolutely correct. Yeah, he could have done. But I think at that point. Use weapon and ancestral knowledge is just better, right? Because the re yeah. the reason to flash there is to say, okay, I'll just put a bit of paper over this scary board for now, and then I'll reveal it again next turn and use all my discounted mana to deal with it next turn. Once you've actually dealt with that board, I think the the relevance yeah. of playing flash on that board actually goes away quite a lot. And now, the reflexes was there, by the way, which he will have noticed. Was the next card you mean? Like it one of the next drawn... two with the yeah, ancestral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He would yeah, have had sure. the reflexes in the flash turn. Hey, you remember when we didn't said we'd never really seen a game where the Speaker Stomper just yeah. locked someone out? Yeah. Yeah, kind of this one, huh? Very much so. It's not going to lock out just the game slot. I think it's going to lock out the tournament. He's looking for anything to do. Can you see anything? see things it's just a question of whether those things are actually any good I think the answer to that is probably no there's another stomper in the hand even if there's not a lethal right off the top but you could have gone lightning reflexes for altered cord which would have cost three less one more less but then two more because of the speaker stomper. So it costs three yeah. as long as you are overloaded, which would have been pliable and just shot the Mimiron if you hit exactly altered cord off first option. That's probably not good enough to go for. Yeah, just making annoying shapes now as well. Me being me there would just jam the second stomper because, hey, they didn't have it last time, but yeah. Technically, that keeps you alive, right? The Golganeth. Uh, You'd have to use the discount to throw a lightning bolt at something as well. Just leave sure. up the 5-5. The five five. Uh, but is it is it more winning to open the lightning reflexes for Primordial Wave instead? Because the base of the minion on the right is a click clocker, right? So it turns into a penguin? Yes. I believe. Yeah, the, the Golgoneth play feels like it, yeah, I survive, but it's still horrible. Mm -hmm. I like your play, I want to open the box. There's also Radiance, Reflexes, and Shoot for the Crash of Lightning as well, because you have zero mana Lightning Bolts at that point, but if you were going to go for that line, you needed to have started 30 seconds ago. Okay. Oh, it's it's all it's Yog. It's prison of Yog to go to worlds. I mean, that, come on, we come on. I mean, we can talk about <laughs> what the right play is all the, as much as we want. Like, <laughs> di Pocket, did you come this far to be a coward? Like you're getting there anyway, Pocket. Come on, you're you're the points leader. You can do it. Honestly, pathetic. Kind of cringe to be honest. Mhm. Mm what? Just two six sixes? Yeah. Yeah. Imagine not being at the World Championships already. Could have just gone. Yeah. Could have just pointed Prison of Yogg at your opponent's face and you'd be fist pumping already. This is how much he doesn't want to play in November. <laughs> Alter Cord. Uh, Cord is there, but I think really banter wanted this to be a cheap rebuy spell which you might just have to end up taking conductivity to do that i mean feral is there but... yeah i was just looking feral spirit's just taunting him as it were yeah mm. it's 
what he hasn't had all game is he you know, this is how pocket train won the reverse of this which is in a mirror match is what you want like he had the double feral like 30 seconds banter you gotta go yeah i think this is the choice now altered cord is incredible but isn't there primordial wave, wave is now, though. That is two snow flipper penguins and a playable crash. Oh no! Wow. Oh, the spells cost one more! That is an absolute disaster! <sighs> Both train. players head in hands in the end, pocket trade. Barely even looking satisfied. Yes, that is correct. You are looking at the player that won. And I think you are just seeing the emotion of everything dawn on this player of what they have gone through this year to get to this point. Yeah, second Masters Tour win, of course, first one of this year, but also beating someone who I suspect is a pretty close friend at this point, because all of the people have been streaming this and all of the people have been hanging out who have been in the top 16 as well, been hanging out together, sort of in it together all year. So, yeah, um, you know, there is a little bit of sadness in putting your friend potentially out of the tournament and Banterface now is going to have to perform miracles on the points to be honest to get into Worlds now um, on the system because Wii Q is just going so well in the America system so tinged with sadness for pocket trade but also the emotion of finally winning one after a final earlier in the year and yeah 10 months of grinding out a ladder to get here. Yeah it's been a long whole journey for, uh, for everyone involved but I think pocket train after everything is is a wonderful player you know I, I called it out during his semi-final just in comparison to um everyone else in this tournament who have accolades and things that you can praise them for and then you compare that next to what pocket has done and start to realize just you know how much better pocket is than some of even the best players that we have in the world so mm -hmm. I personally am delighted to have him guaranteed at the World Championships um, and it does really now open up that extra spot in the race as well for uh, players to try and make it there. Yeah, let's have a look at how it went down after this because it has been a week. Just going to have a look at the top four though, so Pocket Train beating Hemlock, which um, you know I was hyping up this one because this is the people we know of stream, but Hemlock was sort of Pocket Train's not his pick, but the person he wants to make sure we talked about a lot because he says that Hemlock is, wasn't getting the plaudits he deserved and and then he beat him. So it's the perfect setup, really. Well done, Pocket. And Banterface beating out Balance. Balance struggled a little bit with the pressure. So one of the first times we've really seen him deep in the tournament, made one or two mistakes, I think, in that semi-final, um, but also a fantastic performance just to get here and then to get all the way to that semi-final uh, with Priest as well, which was not a popular bring this weekend. So. Well done to Balance as well. Yeah, I think very, very impressive. You're right again to call out Hemlock. You know, when I was saying you can take a player that has an incredibly good record this year, um, Hemlock was kind of the example I was going for there, where Hemlock has three top eights now overall, two top eights and a top four in the three tournaments that are available. He's stood fifth overall globally in the point standings again prior to this event. Um, but then you stack that up against Pocket, who's had a third, fourth, a second, and now a first, and is joint first in the standings globally overall. Like, yes, there is a smaller sample of tournaments that are available to be competed in at the top level this year than there have been before, but in terms of just complete domination of the field and consistency throughout the whole year, it's ladder finish after ladder finish after ladder finish, into there being three major tournaments available and he's been top four in all of them in a card game in a game where there will be people watching this stream right now saying oh well what are we watching this for it's all random anyway like no shut up it isn't some people are just better than others and pocket train is one of those people yeah and not to mention that he won an open masters tour in 2022 as well which you know give or take 350, 400 players, whatever it is. And he had other strong results in those tournaments as well. A player that's really come into his own. We saw him coming. He was one of the players we did sort of know was on the way from a long way out. It's like, this guy's going to be good. He just needs to get a bit of confidence. I think he struggled a little bit on camera, like everybody does the first few times out. I remember talking to all sorts of players who have said they've struggled on camera. You know, after they've won three or four big events, like, yeah, I used to be really scared. Didn't want people thinking I was stupid. Well, win then. And then they don't think we're stupid. 
um, people are over getting nervous. But he's done all that now, and yeah, the emotion there at the end, fantastic to see. Hopefully, yeah, we get a we chance are... to have a little chat with him as well. Yeah, exactly. If you're wondering why we are uh, quite clearly just vamping for time right now, we are hopefully going to get Pocket Train on the line to have a few words with him. But I guess now would be a good moment as well to shift the focus to Banterface for a second because, um, you know, he had, has come on leaps and bounds. I think this is not the time to be you know throwing out the meme again, but he's a player that I, I undervalued and underappreciated for quite some time um, during his time in America's Grandmasters. And I think, you know, he really since then has been able to separate himself from the pack and make the point that he, make the argument that he could just be the best player in Americas. Um, and coming as close as he did, you know, we've talked about it from the perspective of Pocket Train, where it's like, okay, he's put all this time in and imagine that outpouring of emotion of like, oh my God, I actually did it. Like, this has all been worth it. The goal is there. You then have to flip that and think, what does it feel to a player that's now thinking, oh, hang on, I invested all this time and I got, you know, one card, one discover, one decision here away from making that a reality and now it's all been snatched away. And again, like you said, the uh, the, the standings for the Americas qualification, uh, WeQ has a pretty substantial lead overall over Banter altogether. So going to be a really, really rough, rough one from Banter from here, but he has made an incredible accounting of himself this year overall to, to, to play as well as consistently as he has. Yeah, and I think of all the people who I've talked about who've been streaming the event, he's been the one who has constantly put in infinite hours. Uh, I know Meaty's put in a lot of time as well, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but Banterface, he managed to mix doing the infinite hours but still playing a wide variety of things. You know, the end of some months, yeah, obviously he goes down and knuckles down and plays the best deck. But he didn't just play the same thing to qualify every time. He, he showed his versatility on stream all year. And hopefully he continues to do that even... I, I presume he will take some break of this. This has to be draining for him, but presumably we'll see him back and streaming and probably playing a little bit more meme like he enjoys doing as well. Um, another point I just want to make while we're waiting for Pocket Train to be set up is I think one of the reasons you may have underrated him is something we always struggled with casting him was... Because of the decks he brought, he liked to play Hunter, he liked to play the more aggressive stuff. The selling point was he didn't make mistakes. He wasn't one of these players like Pocket Train, playing Boar Priest, playing 27 cards in a turn, drawing his deck and killing you. He just didn't mess up. He just did the right thing over and over. And it was very hard to identify the really good plays. It was, yeah. And again, like... No, but like, you were, you, you were casting America's Grandmasters, right? And so... True. The, the the standard of like, oh, okay, well, this player just isn't making mistakes. When you cast Europe Grandmasters, you're unimpressed right. by a player that just doesn't make mistakes, right? Because you're used to seeing people who always have the right lineups, are always playing at the top of their game, are actually like innovating the way that matchups are being played at a top level. Um, and I think that's well, where Banter has arguably made that extra step forward as well. Yeah, yeah just to word it slightly better, he was not... He wasn't playing decks that allowed him to show off his flair. Because, yeah, so the, the, the reduction was he's not making mistakes. Yeah, but fair 100%. enough as well. Yeah, yeah. The Mercs yeah. didn't also allow him to need to make flashy plays. Yeah. I think I we think... are ready, though, to have a word with our champion. You can see some of the moments he went through to get to that point. The, uh, the variation of emotions uh, through the earlier games in the tournament and that final moment as he was able to... Uh, step past a good friend of his uh, in McBanterface in the final. He's been through a long road, not just today, but over the entire year to uh, to get to this point. Indeed he has. To face. Oh, crushing yeah. moment at the end. Like, yeah, Primordial Wave was great, but obviously you're devolving away your own... Uh, your own discount at that point, which means then you're just that one mana short of being able to play anything relevant to clear up the board. So an absolute heartbreaker for Banterface in the end. But we do get to find out the emotions of the winner now. You hear me? Hello, Hello. You pocket Hello? train. You did it. You're going to Worlds. I mean, I think you knew you were probably going to Worlds, but uh, we saw it in the realization. How does it feel to actually be going to Worlds? I gotta be honest, man. That's the worst way to do it. I really like. I've, I'm very confident. I was, 
gonna have enough points to make worlds anyway. I really don't want to have to grind ladder for the last month, but uh, <laughs> I felt really bad beating Banter of all people. Um, like I was hoping he would make it, obviously, so that I'd have just a stress-free yeah. finals, and I was I was super happy the entire time. Last last Masters tour, the finals, like it, it showed, I was stressed. Uh, I knew like there and then when this gets to worlds, and I botched it as a result. But now, like one month ago, it's like I, I haven't even skipped the year. I've done the hard part, and then uh, <laughs> won at the worst possible Called moment it. and denied a friend a world spot. So it's it's a bit bittersweet, but I am happy that uh, it's finally over. Um, so that's that's nice. But uh, yeah, uh, the, the whole banter thing is 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 a little bit bittersweet for sure. So Absolutely. first off, gotcha. uh, nice, nice to once again have a proper accent on the stream. Pocket, welcome. Um, secondly, uh, I think you know you just. I was going to ask you about you know we saw the emotions on your face, which were best described as mixed at the end of that game. Um, but I think you've described that accurately already. So I guess we'll just talk Hearthstone stuff instead. Um, you tweeted your lineup talking about like least bad decks. Um, mm -hmm. I think the decision in there was like. Mech Rogue, when a lot of other people were bringing Secret, and as well, like Nature Shaman being the fourth deck out of the, the, the field of fourth decks that were available. What was the reasoning behind those two, like a little bit more in depth? So, I mean, I, I prepped mostly with Casey and Meaty for this one. I, I would have prepped with mm. Rekbam, but he said he didn't want the distraction from Ladder and Studies or something, and then he prepped like a Maniac anyway, um, just on sort of slightly on his own. Um, a bit of a tangent. And... Uh, just in testing, every deck felt bad, pretty much. And then I played Metrog, and it went like 70% plus in testing, just stomped everything. And then I thought, okay, well, since every deck feels bad, there's no way I'm not bringing this one, because it actually feels good. And then I've got one more deck to deal with. And I was actually on Relic Demon Hunter, like Casey, until like the last 10 minutes. Ooh. Um, and then I think I spoke to Banter, actually with like 10 minutes to go and we like exchanged lineups even though we didn't really prep properly together and then he had the same lineup as me but with i think no mech rogue and he had drum druid and i had um the relic dh instead of the shaman uh you said a proper accent i was kind of hoping Ra raven would he be here so we could unfiltered speak the truth of how to pronounce shaman but uh um all right cut interview yeah, so over like... kick him out like he's at his time <laughs> We, we we like swapped a deck each and then it just turned out to be the best lineup because we met in the finals, uh, which was which was quite nice. Because, uh, yeah, the last deck just felt bad, uh, no, no matter what it was. Relic DH felt okay, but it just couldn't beat Mech Rogue. The idea was get stuff that's decent into Mage. And Relic DH did a better job of that, but it felt like it did a worse job against everything else than the Nature Shaman. Mm -hmm. Which is yeah, uh, I felt validated when everyone else started bring when when everyone else was bringing it because I thought okay at least uh, if I'm in the bin I'm I'm in the bin with everyone else so there's, <laughs> there's a chance that I just hire all a mirror. At least we're all just scrapping in the same dumpster. Yeah. Um. How do you how do you feel you played overall? Because I know you were kind of critical of your performance in the last Masters tour a little bit. Like, do you feel you reached the standards you set for yourself in this one? Not in the final. Um. But up until then, I'm very happy with it because I was playing stress-free for the most part, but not so stress-free that I got a bit sloppy, which I think I did in the final, for sure. Um, but up until then, I was very, very happy with my play, I think. Um, yeah, especially, like, I felt like I had no right to win any game against Hemlock and then and then 3-0, which... Uh, that, that had me buzzing for a very, very long time. Um, uh, the earlier rounds, I yeah, I remember the first match on stream against Tansoku specifically. That one made me feel great because I went into this not feeling the most confident because my prep wasn't as in depth as it has been in the past. And then I came away from that series going, "There's a there's a chance I played every turn perfectly," and then just built confidence from then. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it felt felt kind of good, stress free since because I've. I've I've always had this feeling that I kind of needed to prove myself. And then I feel like with what I've done previously this year, that was kind of gone. So whatever happened, happened this time. I, I could lose. I'd be at Worlds, then then do the business there. Uh, so yeah, it's been a little bit stress-free. So I think my plays have been more more clear. Because last time, the stress kind of, it makes your brain all muddy and stuff, stuff just right. gets a bit, a bit overwhelming. But this time, yeah, thoughts have been mostly clear. 
I don't think I've ever seen a clearer example of the pocket train plot armor than that series against Hemlock. Like that, that was absurd. How you were still in your tournament, this tournament after that, I have absolutely no idea. But uh, we've been told that we do have to let you go, so we'll give you one last final opportunity. Any thank yous, commiserations, shout outs, anything that you want to give? The floor is yours. Well, the the biggest thank yous for sure for well banter. He gave me he gave me a deck that I won the Masters tour with. Um, and obviously commiserations to him. I really wanted to see him at Worlds, so I do feel a bit rough for, for, for doing that to him. Um, uh, Meaty Casey, who I'm very happy to have helped out because he, he needed one of the ladder spots. So hopefully he can get the ladder finishes to qualify for Worlds because um, I felt I let a few people down last time. Uh, yeah, Casey <laughs> prepped with me, hopefully. Yeah, um, Meaty, Recfam, those are the main people I practice with. Um, yeah, Fury Hunters in and around it still. He didn't really help this time, but he gave me the, I think, the best lineup for the last Masters Tour, just like five minutes into joining our prep group. He said, bring this. It's the best. And then like a week later, I was in a Masters Tour final. But yeah, those are those are the big names. Um, and that's mostly it. Cool. It's been great talking to you, Pocket Train, as it always is anyway. But I'm going to have to let you go now to go and celebrate or chill or go to sleep or whatever it is that Pocket Train does when he's just won a tournament. Everything. Bit of everything. And, yeah, enjoy your next month of chilling and try and bring that relaxed oh, to attitude to the World Championships, I guess. Uh, but great to yeah, see you. Stream again. We'll see you at Worlds. Oh, you heard it. You heard it. It was there. It may have been underneath Lorinda, <laughs> but you heard it. He said he was going to stream. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, we will see you in your stream then, most likely. But yeah, that's the end of another Masters Tour, the final Masters Tour of 2023, Sottle. Um, other than the champion, any, any interesting takeaways? Anything you want to say before we go? No, I just... I think it just shows the, the resiliency of our talent pool in Hearthstone, by which I don't mean us, the, the broadcast talent. I mean the talent of the players, right, is that... Um, this the, the system that we had this year presented a very unique set of challenges and we still had an incredibly high level of, of cream rising to the top of when we get to these events. The, the standard that is set is still so incredibly high. Like, yes, you know, people have their various criticisms of the Grandmasters era of Hearthstone or whatever, but I think it's indisputable that after we went through a few iterations of relegation with that system, we had an absurdly high level of Hearthstone being played um, in the competitive scene at that point. And I think uh, the greatest testament to the players that we have in these tournaments are they are continuing to hold that standard set by the likes of Gabby and Blyz and Yala and all the players that came out of that Grandmasters system. So we are putting together an incredibly stacked field of players to compete at World Championships. And they have a very illustrious group of names to live up to, whoever is going to pick up that mantle of being the next world champion. But I am already very confident that we are going to have someone who fits right in with the likes of Firebat and Lion and Bunny Hopper and all of these incredible players that we've had before that have been world champions. So, yeah, um, GG, I love Hearthstone. That's basically the way that you sign off every tournament at this point. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's been great. Yeah, always emotional for the cast as well. It's two great days of action that we get to see a little bit too rarely. But there's so much more still to come because December the 16th, December the 17th, the World Championships uh, will be played. We will be here with that here as always. And you know who three of the players are going to be, but there's five more still to be found. Keep an eye on Twitter and Twitch, I guess, to see who those are going to be. We'll let you know as soon as we can as well. But that's it. That's the end of another Masters Tour. So thanks to all the production, to the players, to Adelweiss, TJ, Raven, and everybody for watching. We'll see you next time. Out.